Prostate Cancer Research Institute is an educational organization for prostate cancer patients, their caregivers, and their families. We put patients first and are an unbiased source of information and support. For over 20 years, our goal has been to meet the educational needs of prostate cancer patients at every stage of their journey. Medical technology is advancing rapidly and new treatments are becoming available. Patients have to make complex choices which have lasting implications. They face unexpected industry biases and doctors who may not be up to date on the latest research. Your donation helps men receive the latest, most up-to-date information, which empowers them to make informed decisions. Our website, PCRI.org, is a wealth of information and resources. Our conferences and webinars are a way to get patients' questions answered by leading physicians and researchers. And we have a helpline for men to call with questions about their diagnosis, treatment choices, and side effects associated with these treatments. Each week we produce multiple videos covering concepts and every patient question that we can think of about the disease in a straightforward and easy to understand format. This was a brief overview of what we do at PCRI, and to learn more you can visit our website. Your donation directly funds our educational programs, which give life-changing information to men during a very vulnerable time in their life, and we thank you for your consideration. You can visit PCRI.org to learn more.
this meeting has singularly been able to propel forward many of the concepts that are changing the field throughout the world. So even though you guys think that you're just sitting there as participants or audience, just through your social networking, just by sharing ideas, just by changing referral patterns, other institutions are going, well, crap, you know, we better set up a PET scanner. Or gee whiz, we better get into a more aggressive mindset about therapy. I like this meeting. I like talking to patients. I think patients get it much better than doctors. So for me, that's why I come and speak to you. And for me, for me, the privilege is simply that some of you are doing better. All right? That's all I need. Hey everybody, it's Alex of the PCRI and welcome to our 2023 Men's Health Virtual Conference. This is the second time we've ever done a conference like this and it's really to bring to light issues in BPH, prostatitis, and general men's health. You may have joined our channel and watched our videos to learn more about prostate cancer and treatments and side effects, but we wanna make sure that we're presenting other information such as this so that you can talk to your medical team and make sure you're getting your heart checked, you're learning about diet, lifestyle, any BPH or prostatitis issues you may have. Again, this is to help educate you so you can have better conversations with your medical team. Now, if you would like to learn more about men's health and infographics and different resources that we have, you can visit our website, pcri.org, for the full conference experience. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsors, Janssen, Pfizer, and My Event. It's because of their generosity that we're able to present this conference for free. You can go ahead and visit our website, pcri.org, and see our exhibit hall and learn more there. But also on our exhibit hall is the organization that our next speaker founded, the Canadian Men's Health Foundation. They have immense resources in the exhibit hall, so please go ahead and check it out. They have checklists and all sorts of things that I think you'll find very helpful. Now, the person who founded it, Dr. Larry Goldenberg, he's knighted in Canada. He's an incredible person for multiple reasons, but one of the reasons is he spent his entire lifetime in men's health. He has been educating men all over the world on things that they can do, even small incremental changes that they can make over time that have a lasting impact. He is the professor of the Department of Urologic Sciences for the University of British Columbia, and that's just one of his many titles, but we're so honored to have him today. Moderating his talk and doing the Q&A session is our beloved moderator, Dr. Mark Moyad. He's with the University of Michigan, and I'm gonna talk more about him later, but it's gonna be an incredible session. I know you'll find it very informative, so thank you so much, Dr. Goldenberg, and welcome to the PCRI. Hello, my name is Larry Goldenberg. I'm a urologist in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I chair the Canadian Men's Health Foundation, professor at the UBC Department of Urologic Sciences, and direct the supportive care program for prostate cancer at our large Vancouver Prostate Center. It's my pleasure to present to you on men's health, which I believe is addressing a matter of family well-being. So what exactly is men's health? A lot of people think about men's health as shown in these uh, magazine covers as you know the the exercise the six pack the abs and that's really one way to look at men's health when we look at men's health through a urology lens we think about prostate cancer primarily 
or benign growth or non-cancerous growth of the prostate, infections, sexual problems, infertility problems. That's looking at through a urology lens. So we would call it men's urology health. But men's health is really more than a prostate and a penis. And so we need to look at it through an overall lens. And that involves mental health issues, hormonal issues, heart issues, skin issues, bone issues, and so on is listed here, and urology as well. But it's a much more holistic view of what men's health really is. And the impact of men's bad health or poor health is actually shown in global life expectancy statistics. And this is from a few years ago. You can see I've highlighted in Canada and the United States that there's a gap between the life expectancy of men and women anywhere from three to five or six years. In some countries, like in Russia, it's 10 years, and in others, it's only 0.6 years. But generally, overall, if you look at these global life expectancies, the gap as shown in this graph between men in blue and women in red has been about five years for many decades. You can see in the 80s, it's spread apart a little bit, and now it's coming back together. And if we extend this graph out to the current 2023, they are coming a little bit closer together, but there's still a gap. There are other health indicators that we need to consider as well, just not how long you live, but what kind of health you have when you're living to age 80. And that's called health expectancy. How long are you really healthy? Now, the ideal for all of us would be being perfectly healthy until the day you die. Clearly, that's not the issue, or it's not reality. So how long are you free from disability? And depending on your, on your family and other members of your society to look after you while you're alive. And if we look at health expectancy, then across the Western nations, it's about a 10-year loss of healthy years between the, the, your life expectancy and your health expectancy. That's a significant gap of 10 years. So how do we explain this? And how do we explain this discrepancy between men and women? You know, there's, there's really two mysteries here. Why do men have a shorter life expectancy? Granted, it's only on average three to five years, but it's still consistent and has been for many, many years. And can we decrease the gap between life expectancy and health expectancy? How do we add 10 healthy years to the middle of a man's life? So what about life expectancy? So there's a number of factors that contribute to this life expectancy gap. There are biological factors related to hormone differences, brain structure differences, other physical differences clearly between men and women, environmental factors and behavioral factors. And if we just explore these a little bit more, the male brain, no question, there are big differences between men and women as illustrated here. But environmental factors are probably most important to explain a lot of the differences between particularly early deaths and earlier years of men's life. For example, men tend to have more physically laborious and dangerous jobs. But again, you know, in today's society, those gaps are narrowing a little bit. Women are taking on more of these more dangerous jobs than they did a couple of decades ago. Social support, men have fewer intimate friends. Men are less likely to have a confidant in times of stress. And there's been studies that have been published showing that those with low levels of social support are two to three times more likely to die at a younger age. And then there are the behavioral factors. For example, health promoting behaviors or preventative measures, men do less of them. Sleep less, rush recovery times, use seat belts less, take fewer medications and supplements, use less sun protection have more unhealthy diets. And men use healthcare services less often than women. At all ages, shown here, women see the doctor or visit uh, healthcare professionals way more often than men do. Now, it's interesting, up until age 15, it's about equal. That's because mom is looking after you. And as men enter into their adolescent, teenage, and then young adult years, the gap starts to widen. Probably because women need to see the doctor for reproductive issues, whereas men are getting busy and just ignoring their health. That gap exists 
right through until older ages. So some of the reasons men don't attend to a doctor, and we're mostly talking about men between the ages of 20 and 40, they feel vulnerable, they don't want to give up control of their health or of their bodies, they don't want to share their private issues with, with a stranger, and there's systemic barriers, the wait times to be seen, the hours that offices are open don't always correspond well to work hours, where the offices are, lack of male health care providers, and taking time from work to care for themselves. It's interesting that health consciousness and behavior really has two peaks with a big dip in between in that age group between 30 and 40. When men are in their 20s, their health is driven by vanity. They want to look good. They want to look strong. They need to attract a mate. And then later on in life, 50, 60, they have children, they have grandchildren, and they're starting to think, hmm, you know, the, the, uh, the end is not far off now. I'm entering the, the final third of my life. I want to see my grandchildren graduate from high school. I want to see my granddaughter get married and so on. So they start to pay more attention to their health. But risk-taking behaviors, men do more of them. They engage in more high-risk leisure activities, sports, more sexual partners at a younger age, violent behaviors, drive drunk more frequently, more alcohol and tobacco use. And you can see in the picture here, they do some very strange things. So there is definitely room for be behavioral improvement in men. And if you're still not convinced, have a look at this. And having a Y chromosome is not an excuse for self-destruction. So we can, we can overcome this, the fact that we have a Y chromosome and testosterone levels. So as it says, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. So what's causing loss of healthy years, that discrepancy between life expectancy and health expectancy? Men carry out suicide successfully three to four times more than women, especially in the middle age. So blue on this graph here, you can see as this is the age group going along the bottom here, as in the in middle ages, there's a huge gap between men and women. And men, when they decide they're going to commit suicide, they use more lethal methods. Motor vehicle accidents, again, big difference, particularly in the, in the 20s and 30s here between men and women, and again, over age 80 between men and women. Alcohol abuse is six times higher for men than women, again, particularly in the younger age groups. And I'm coming to this, I keep emphasizing this 18, 20, 30 year. This is really our target audience. This is where we make the biggest difference, as I'll come to later on in the talk. Cancers are more likely to be diagnosed in men, and when they're diagnosed, they're more likely to die. Men are more likely to die as a result of cancer. It may be because of delays in uh, diagnosis. Diabetes, not big differences between men and women in the actual incidence, but males are 39% more likely to die of complications of diabetes. And again, it may have to do with uh, you know, whether they're taking their medications whether they're following the diets and the doctor's recommendations. Homicides, again, more men than women. Substance abuse, much more common in men than in women. And it's hard to believe that people are still smoking. And a lot of deaths are attributed to smoking. Men and mental health, more common than in, in, in women. This illnesses like schizophrenia are more common in men and as and so forth. Obesity, men are on average two to four times more likely to be overweight or obese than women. Now, again, these statistics are a little bit uh, aged. And uh, in today's world, I think that the gaps are narrowing a little bit, but men are still um, more likely to be overweight. So what about general awareness of the problem? You know, I think this is the, this is the crux of the matter and has been for decades. That, you know, we stick our heads in the sand. We just ignore the problems. But I'm a urologist. So I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you why a urologist is talking to you about men's health, which should really should be a social movement. And it's because urology 
is a portal into men's health. We see a lot of men and we see a lot of boys because they have, you know, children, you know, kids with voiding abnormalities, urinary infections. We see middle-aged, young to middle-aged men with uh, reproductive issues, infertility issues, infections, prostatitis, and then as men are getting older, urinary tract symptoms, like urination problems, kidney stones, blood in the urine, testosterone issues. We see a lot of things that are related to other diseases. And there are a lot of risk factors for many of these illnesses that we see as urologists that underlie other important diseases, smoking, diet, exercise, drugs, blood pressure, diabetes, and so on. And if we look at this chart, you can see down the left side, these are very common illnesses that we see regularly as urologists. And look across the top, you can see the risk factors that are underlying heart disease, for example. And you can see that there's a commonality between all of these risk factors, urinary, urological diseases, and other illnesses. So we have this opportunity to engage with men who are coming to see us and with their partners, of course. But we see men, for example, a 35 year old having a vasectomy. You can ask them, you know, you're, you've got a few minutes uh, while you're doing the procedure. Ask the, the young man, does he know his family history? About 20% of men do not know their family history. Did their father or their grandfather have a heart attack or a stroke or diabetes or colon cancer? Or a 50 year old with declining erections. You know, that might be the canary in, in the mine shaft of he's got underlying arterial problems that are, could lead to a, to a heart attack or a stroke in the very near future, but it's presenting firstly as erectile problems. 63 year olds with urinary troubles, a 58 year old with bladder cancer. The cancer may be related to smoking. 44 year old with kidney stones. They can have all kinds of metabolic problems. And I'm just gonna take you through an example of a 55 year old man who presents with prostate cancer. That gives us the opportunity to address four risk factors. Smoking, obesity, metabolic syndrome, alcohol intake and physical inactivity. So I'm seeing this man with prostate cancer, but I have an opportunity to talk to him about other risk factors that may relate to him or perhaps to his father or his brother or his son or someone, one of his friends, that he can talk to them. So we don't necessarily or very often think about smoking related to prostate cancer, but it's been established that smokers have an 80% higher risk of a recurrence from their prostate cancer after they've been treated, and a 61% higher risk of dying from prostate cancer than men who have never smoked. And related to the smoking, they have a 200 plus percent higher risk of a heart attack or a stroke. So pretty good reason to stop smoking. And it's been shown that men who quit smoking for 10 or more years, or who have quit for less than 10 years, but had never smoked more than 20 pack years, that their risks are similar to non-smokers. Obesity is known to increase the risks of prostate, prostate cancer, and we're all aware of all the other risks of obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, and so on. But Norway, Finland, Portugal, Korea, Austria, studies from all of these countries over the last decade have shown that overweight and obese status are associated with a higher incidence of prostate cancer, more unfavorable pathology, more aggressive cancers and biochemical recurrences or relapses. It's something that men can control. It's amazing when you realize it takes an oak tree 200 years to attain that girth. Dietary fat, and Mark is an expert in the field, of, but saturated fats are bad for you. They're bad for every part of you. They're bad for your brain, they're bad for your heart, they're bad for your colon, and they're bad for your prostate. And that's pretty well known that a dietary, a dietary modifications, a Mediterranean diet is a good thing. It decreases mortality from prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease, other cancers. And bottom line, a heart healthy diet is a prostate healthy diet. And I tell all of my patients that. And finally, alcohol. It's causally related. The WHO has reported on this to a number of cancers. So 
And though it's not wine and beer, good news, not causally related to prostate cancer, hard liquor is, increases the risk by 60%. And the evidence for the harmful effects of alcohol in men is stronger than beneficial effects. And it, this sh just shows you a review of 27 studies from 16 countries showed the increased risk of diagnosing and men dying related to alcohol intake. In Canada, just recently, the um, public health agency suggested that less than or equal to two drinks per day is the, which should be your standard. And finally, exercise. Well established that exercise is the best medicine for so many parts of your body. And so if a man comes to me with prostate cancer, before treatment, during treatment, after treatment, we're encouraging them to exercise vigorously, more than three hours a week. And that decreases death rates and the risks of developing fatal disease. What fits your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? Hard message, but reality. And I, I think that uh, Mark will say this and agree that give me 30 minutes a day and I'll give you a decrease in premature death, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, breast cancer, and on and on. Unfortunately, as I showed earlier, we have our men have their heads buried deeply in the sand and would rather take pills, surgery, and so on, rather than a simple lifestyle change. And that's where the Canadian Men's Health Foundation came in. In 2014, we rolled out a non-governmental agency called the CMHF, which we identified as a social movement. And the mission of this organization is to inspire men to live healthier lives, to pay attention to these risk factors, to pay attention to preventative measures. So how many men really are sick? Like, what's our target audience? Well, this fellow says 50 fat diabetic ahead of you, but how many men really are and we did a survey in Canada recently that shows that 72% of Canadian men are unhealthy. Now, Canada is just a mini United States. And I would project that the exact same numbers if we were to do this in US or UK or other Western nations would be about the same. 6% of men are identified as being very healthy. So 6% of men can ignore everything I've just said, continue to do what they do. They've got good genetics. They're exercising, they've got a good diet, they're not drinking too much, they don't smoke, and on and on. 22% would consider themselves healthy, so they're going to live long lives, and they follow most of those things. 31% are borderline, and 41% are really unhealthy. And so you put those last two to number, 72% of Canadian men would, are borderline unhealth, or unhealthy. And we know that of the chronic diseases that we identify in later, in later age groups, 70% of them are preventable through lifestyle changes upstream or earlier in life. So we can, present up to, we can prevent up to 70% of men's chronic diseases through lifestyle changes in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Give your head a shake, guys. Okay. Also, we are very strong examples to our children and really interesting research in the last few years on the impact of fathers on their children have shown, for example, obese fathers are 10 times more likely to have obese children. It doesn't apply to obese women, just to the men. The impact of poor health in unhealthy men, we negatively impact family, communities, healthcare system, the general economy, especially apparent in indigenous and hard to reach populations. The pandemic didn't help us much. It drastically increased the demand for men's mental and physical health care services and for women. So. There are consequences to our family and to our community. Sorry for the misspelled spelling there. Intrafamily caregiving patterns change. Close to 50% of women are widowed by age 65. Over 50% of elderly widows are living in poverty, and they were not poor before the deaths of their husbands. And at age 95, women outnumber men eight to one. The economic cost of society, 
This was a study that the Canadian Men's Health Foundation did a few years ago, looking at the direct and indirect costs of chronic health diseases in men. And the total due to bad lifestyle behaviors was almost $37 billion per year. And it costs our family. If you just think of the economic cost, you're paying for, you know, your alcohol, you're paying for cigarettes, you're paying for the food and all that extra weight you're carrying around. Plus you're, you're paying your insurance premiums. So anywhere from 1.7 to $8.6 million lifetime could be saved with upstream or earlier in life modifications in lifestyle. That's a lot of money. So how do we do it? How can we add 10 healthy years to the middle of a man's life? Well, we have to talk to them. We've got to educate men. We've got to advocate. We got to get guys to think. We got to get guys to appreciate that this can be done. Is it possible? Can we talk to men about their health? It's tough because men are generally tuned out. But we feel that men's health should be and can be a habit, just like seatbelts, just like helmets, just like recycling. These are habits that have taken time. And but now, after years, they're instinctive, they're accepted, they're expected. When my kids were small, they wouldn't let me turn on the car until I, I put on my seatbelt. It's a habit that's become natural. But talking to men can be like banging your head against the wall. It's, it is not easy. But if we don't start, and we don't pay attention and really give it an effort, we're not going to get there. So with the Canadian Men's Health Foundation, we identify, we know what the problem is. Poor men's health, 72% of men have some degree of unhealthiness. Okay, What we want to do is develop, we decided to develop programs and which will lead to results. We don't have a clinic. This is not a urology clinic. It's not a net men's health hospital. It's a, it, more, more than anything else, it's a social media based advocacy and education. So it's an awareness to action. We got to get men, men's attention. Then we got to get them thinking. Then we got to get them talking and knowing and finally acting. And this is a cycle that is very, very possible. Just takes a little bit of effort. Our Canadian Men's Health Foundation resources uh, have grown over the last uh, decade. We have programs. Uh, our two main brands are Don't Change Much and the Men's Health Check. And I'll just touch on those very briefly. The Don't Change Much campaign uses champions, and I'll give, show you our champions later, uses humor, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples, to speak to guys in ways that they'll hear, absorb, and act on. Now, I'm going to inter interject here and say that not every man hears the message in the same way. Okay? And we've done study on the morphological differences between men's ability to hear and understand. That's a whole other lecture. But as you can appreciate, some men are way more open to hearing the message, absorbing it, and acting on it than other men. But we do the best we can. And we want men to just make small incremental changes. If you tell a guy, you know, you got to do A, B, C, D, and E, he's very unlikely to do even A. But if you say, let's start with a small incremental change, that'll make a big difference. Perhaps, you know, half salad, half fries. Instead of two beers, have one beer. You know, tell your friends to have one beer as well, and so on. Or, you know, walk a little bit further, take the stairs at work. Little things like that, they can make a big difference in how you eventually feel and your overall health. And these little changes become habits, and multiple small habits will coalesce to become more permanent behavioral changes with really huge potential for downstream impact. And we'll give you this uh, web address again, but don't change much.ca is well worth a look. And if you're a woman looking at this video, tell your husband, tell your brother, tell your father. I would I would have liked to have called this uh, Canadian Men's Health Foundation the Canadian Dad's Health Foundation, or the Canadian Son's Health Foundation, or the Canadian Brother's Health Foundation, because it implies to them all. Lately, I've been thinking about making some changes in my life, taking a new approach, changing my ways. Little stuff, you know, like taking the stairs once in a while. Drinking more water. Or swapping fries for salad sometimes. A few small steps like that will make me feel better now and down the road. 
I mean, I wouldn't want to be a burden on my wife. Is that right? Honey? Change, but don't change much. Get simple tips at don'tchangemuch.ca. So this was one of our videos. I'm going to show you another one. We had controversy over videos and showing videos uh, on social networks, and um, not everybody thought it was funny. But those people aren't necessarily our targets. Our targets are the 20-year-old, the 25, the 30-year-old, just like the man, you know, slightly overweight guy in that in in this in this video. And I went here's down. another one. To watch the fish swim by, but I got to the river so long as I wanted to die. And alone, and when I jumped in the river, the doggone river was dry. She's long gone, and now I'm alone. So we have many, many videos like that. We had one video, which I could show later on, but about prostate cancer screening that the news networks didn't want to show because it was provocative and um, they just said no, they didn't want to show it. But the news item was the fact that the news networks didn't want to show the video, which got us more attention than the actual video would have gotten us. So we work in that social uh, uh, media sphere that's very very important in that same sphere we've had podcasts every june is men's health month and we provide um these podcasts with which given an outlet for for men um really who are hard to reach otherwise for them to listen to very positive information messages about mental health physical health and they're usually um, podcasts in Canada by um, our champions who are well-known uh, celebrities across the country and are are able to get the attention of a young 25-year-old or 30-year-old who wouldn't necessarily listen to a almost 70-year-old urologist. Uh, we have a men's health check. This is a, an interesting tool that we introduced eight years ago and um, just revised. We brought it up to up to date. And what it does is it identifies men, it takes just a few minutes really. Uh, you log in and you answer some questions of having related to diet and family history and, and it will identify the eight most common health diseases in men. And it gives you a, basically a, a risk. It says you're at high risk for heart disease or you're high risk for sexual dysfunction or you're high risk for prostate cancer. You might want to go and see a doctor or talk to a doctor. We have a men's health checklist. This is an interactive checklist that covers 21 different health tests, examinations, and screens that men should have at different ages. And it basically says this is how often we, you know experts recommend that you have these tests done. And it's a great checklist. Um, so again have a look at it or get your partner to have a look at that. Uh, more recently, we began a MindFit toolkit, especially after the pandemic with the high levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. And this is an opportunity for men to go online. There's There are questionnaires, there are validated uh, screens for depression, anxiety, stress, and, and so on. And we actually offer an opportunity for men free of charge to engage with a healthcare worker to talk about these things. And lastly, we have a campaign on diet. Um, we provide appointments with um, dietitians, and we're monitoring this to see how effective this can be. These are our champions. If you're a Canadian uh, viewing this, you will recognize many of these individuals, these men and women um, who are celebrities in our country, and they are well respected, and they take a stand for men's health, and they want to inspire men to make these small changes in our Don't Change Much campaign. So it's great, we've got all this campaign, but is it effective? It's very important for us to show that it is making an impact on men's health and lessen the impact on our healthcare system. And our data, we, we have um, extensive 
outcome metrics, but just showing some of the data here, 75% of men who have participated in the Don't Change Much campaign have improved their eating habits. 45% have decreased their alcohol intake. 70% are exercising more. 46% have lost weight and 35% have reduced their stress levels. So we are pleased with these numbers. I think we still have a ways to go. If you think about 72% of men not being totally healthy, that's a lot of men. So we got a long ways to go. But again, I come back to this issue that it's the last piece of the puzzle of family health, women's health. We don't want to ignore women's health. Great progress in women's health over the decades. Let's keep it going. Same with children's health, minority health. But let's plug in men's health because it's part of the family. It's a critical part of the family. And I would emphasize that it's not a competitive victim's discourse. This is not about men versus women. Men need their partners to steer them. They need their daughters. They need their, they need their husbands, if that's the situation. Whatever it is, it is not a single person. It is a dyadic approach, okay? And I think that that is where the success is going to be, where we consider it family health and not just men's health. And I thank you for your attention. And I listed here are the uh, websites, the menshealthfoundation.ca and don'tchangemuch.ca. I strongly encourage you to go to them and view some of the programs that we've developed and have your loved ones do the same. Thank you. Okay, that was outstanding. And not that I thought it would be a uh, not an exciting talk, but you know, I've, I've been used to, how long have I known you? About 30 years, 25 years? Would you say that's about right? Yeah, yeah, long time. And you always deliver. In fact, I decided to, I knew you would hit a home run, but I decided to make you a sign. It says, Dr. Larry, the golden boy, the golden man, golden Burke. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a big honor in my world that when I wow. use that vernacular. And then wow. I put, this is where I found you before I was doing my homework, right? You know, I, I wanted to look what you did with the Men's Health Foundation, yeah. uh, .ca. I just typed that in right away and everything came up. So I could click on everything on the site. And so what I first want to do before we start with a couple of questions, and I've just thrown the book out on where we're going to go for questions because I've known you a long time and there, we could talk about literally anything, but I will tell you that I go to everyone's website. I do my homework. This is one of the best websites I have ever seen that covers men's health. And I'll tell you why, in my opinion, you can click on so many different places. You can click on a podcast. You can get the idea of what you want to cook tonight for dinner you understand what you do really well is talk about mental health also on the site. And so there's such diversity. It's not just the checklist. It's There's also a survey that you can get a better understanding of your own health. I mean, you guys have thought about everything that I could think of. And so can you just give us a quick overview as to when this started and where you're going to go with this? So I started... The um, it started in British Columbia, the province that I, I live in here in Vancouver, um, in the um, late 1990s. I got together with a, a colleague of mine, he's a family practitioner, and we said, you know what, we, we need to address men's health issues. There was an attempt to develop to create a men's health foundation once before in the early 90s, but it failed, just didn't have any support, didn't have financial support. All of these found you need money because you have to hire the best people, you need to hire IT people, and so on. So we got together in the late 90s and we decided to create the Men's Health Initiative of British Columbia. And that was the early part of our men's health. And we started to develop these programs. Um, and very early on, we had we did an environmental scan. What's out there? Who's out there addressing men's health? What's the importance of men's health? What's the best way to approach this? I tried to actually create a men's health clinic. That would be a multidisciplinary clinic. In our healthcare system, it didn't work. It might work in other healthcare systems where it's sort of like a, uh, a one-stop shop where you, a man walks in the front door and he gets triaged by a family doctor or by a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. 
and then is directed to a dietitian or to a hormone expert for testosterone or to a diabetic expert or to a sexual health expert or whatever, and walks out the back door having been fully examined and advised and treated and a new man. That's, that didn't work, didn't work in our system. Um, our, so then the next approach was let's educate family practitioners to become those triage people. And we had a lot of that and a lot of family practitioners came on board and they they enjoyed it and they do that sort of stuff. But then we started to veer away from that. And that's when we got into this Canadian men's health approach, make it a national approach. We went to Ottawa, our capital of the country, and met with our members of parliament and managed to get some funding. And we rolled out in 2014, the Canadian Men's Health Foundation as a national organization that was more based on social media, on this platform, on the on the communication platforms that we have to get the messages out there, as I explained in my talk. The key is to get guys to understand, to think about it, and to actually do something. And, you know, it's it's just grown from there. I think the U.S. is the exact same in the sense that I think you remember the days where everybody talked about starting men's health clinics in the U.S. and we were and, and urology was going to take this over and it was going to yeah. be a wonderful endeavor. And then you run into all sorts of problems that I could name forever, including conflict of interests and then people going down certain paths where it just becomes about this a little bit. And so um, what you're saying to me and I haven't really ever thought about is maybe our only our major solution here is just self-advocacy. So in other words, going to your site, right? Going to PCRI, going to these other sites, because I remember 25 years ago, you can still see in my bio, it says Moyet is co-director of the men's health program. And I thought, wait, I haven't been appointed yet. And I don't even know how this would work. And then what I learned, and that's still in my bio, some places on the internet, what I learned is this is really hard to bring all these specialties and different people together to provide this one-stop shopping, because there's so many different conflicts. But maybe what I think is that you've solved it and, this, and the solution is advocacy. It's the person taking responsibility. It, th does that sound a little hokey or do you agree? No, I, absolutely. I think that's where we're at. I mean, it, listen, there's there are roles for these urology men's health clinics, right? Infertility yeah. clinics, sexual health clinics, testosterone clinics. Some of them go overboard, maybe overprescribed testosterone. That's for another talk, that's, right? That's you know, for that, another five talks. Yeah, but, you know, there's a role for those kinds of clinics. There's also a role for, you know, diabetic clinics. And there's a role, but men have to understand everything. And the best way to do it is in, you know, the privacy of their own house with their computer or their iPhone or their iPad or whatever, you know, where they, they don't have other people in the waiting room seeing that they're there to see the doctor for men's health issue, right? Yeah. They, they can deal with that. And they use our, you know, our, our, uh, we used to call it the you check tool because you know you can check yourself. Are yeah. I at risk given my diet, given my weight, given my family history? Am I at risk for erectile dysfunction? And yes. if I am, you know, am I at risk for cardiac disease and so on? So you can do that in the privacy of your own home. And so we started doing that. And and the, the I tell you the the number of people who, who log in, we're in the millions. That's incredible. Yeah, and because there really is something there for everybody to look at, and it's it's a global website to me, right? Yeah. I mean, it re it really applies. But well, we had a, we we had our prime minister on there once um, on a Men's Health Month, giving you know sort of giving a, a a short little clip about the importance of men's health, and we yeah. got we got we got responders emailing us from India who watched it and really liked it. So you know. We know we're we're global. Yeah, no, I think it's fabulous, and I think it's a fabulous legacy for you. And I just think it's wonderful. And people, what people don't realize is I've known you long enough that not only are you passionate about it, you practice what you preach, and you do a lot of things that. I mean, you do a lot of things in my mind that don't get a checkbox for being healthy, but I think that it's healthy. Like we were talking the other day, and you've been married almost fifty years, correct? I mean, forty some, right? Yeah, it'll be. Uh... It'll be 47 years in December. Yeah. There was an old joke we used to make about, about prostate cancer in marriage. We, there was, I remember those of the meetings, I would, I would say that it looks like there's a lower risk of getting prostate cancer 
Um, if you're single. single and the better chance of surviving if you're married. So stay single. And then when you get prostate cancer, get married. We got yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> but what, but the truth was, and you've seen the data that married men, I'm not putting down the single guys out there, but married men in what's called um, respectful relationships, bi-directional, they live longer and do better. So do you ever talk to people about Absolutely. just marriage and the importance of partnership? Well, I, 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 I emphasized early in the talk how important it is for men to have somebody to talk to, right? To confide right. in. And, and men who are isolated and don't, and don't have a confidant death rates are two to three mortalities, two to three times higher than the rest of the population. And so having a strong marriage, a strong partner, someone you can confide in is important to your health. No question about it. It decreases so many, I mean, the stress levels, anxiety levels. I mean, there's so many things that that um, are better in a, in, a, in a marriage than, you know, being alone. It's not necessarily you know, man and, and woman. It can be any form of partnership. It's not that you've got a you know, any partner, someone you can confide in and rely on. And uh, that's the key. Yeah. The data on owning a dog. I mean, as much as people want to laugh at it is pretty yeah. remarkable. Owning Absolutely. a pet, that, having companionship. Uh, it's It still strikes me how important that is. So before we move on from companionship talk, is it 47 years you've been married? I forgot. Yeah, it'll be 47 in December. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to, before we move on to the next subject within... 10 seconds, give the secret to being married almost 50 years, happily married. Would you like to share that with the global audience? <laughs> well, my wife is a is an academic radiologist and she's a world expert in breast cancer imaging. And so a lot of it has to do with mutual respect. And we're both very busy. Interesting. And when we're together, times are special. And I don't know, you know, we, mutual love, mutual respect. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Uh, I I want to still digress a little bit. I I'm too cheap that we're we're tight on budget, so I have to put this in black and white. Do you want to explain what this is to the audience and why this is of significance? So that is the most important logo in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. That's the logo for the uh, Vancouver Canucks hockey team. And what's a Canuck? A Canuck is a Canadian. Okay, if a Canuck's a Canadian, then why is that the Vancouver symbol have a? Is it like a whale, a shark? What it's is a it? Whale. It's it's a killer whale. Killer so whale. We, okay. Yeah. So we have the killer whales offshore here, in the Pacific Ocean off the shore, and our Canucks are killers. Okay. Except, uh, they haven't been for about twelve years, but that's another story. Okay, but for the sake of transparency, the last time I have spent time with with Dr. Goldenberg was at a Red Wings game. We I took him to a Red Wings game. We had a great time. I don't know if they won or lost. We just talked about, I think we talked shop the whole time, which is probably yeah. not the right thing to do. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun at the game, and I really enjoyed that moment. And I tried to convert you to a Detroit Red Wing fan, but it didn't work. Well, you gave, you gave me a Detroit Red Wings scarf, which... I don't see hanging up here. Like, I would take you like with the, that every like the day, Dr. Goldenberg. <laughs> I should have had it hanging up. Here. I know, I know. In my home office. <laughs> I I hold that up every day, and I think of you. Well, and what you've accomplished, because you've and because you've accomplished so much in your career. So, and I love the transition, but I I don't want to transition into men's health fully right now unless people. You've been working in prostate cancer most of your career. So I just want to talk. I want to talk briefly about prostate yeah, cancer. For sure. Briefly. Absolutely. But it works into men's health. Yeah. First of all, where are we with PSA screening? And where are you with PSA screening? Because my head's spinning as I'm trying to keep up with all the other screenings. And let me just give you some quick background. So we found out in the States in the past few months that we're reducing colorectal cancer screening to 45 great. I think that's fine. And in the past two weeks, there's a big discussion on the changing uh, guidelines in the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force for breast cancer screening. So they're going to bring that back down to 40 and say biennial screening at 40. So people, so in a number of screening areas, those are moving younger. Um, and I think, you know, that's they, they have appropriate data there. So with that as background, where are the HE double toothpicks is PSA screening? So, you know, the controversy 
started in 1991. Okay, so we're we're talking about a 32 year controversy with no resolution yet, despite the fact that there have been major studies done in Europe and in the United States, which suggests that screening, early screening of men can lead to a decrease in death. But on the flip side of that, and this was part of the controversy in breast cancer as well, is that early age screening can un, can detect cancers that really aren't important, if you will. They're not going to develop into anything significant, at least not for a long time. And that what we're seeing is a lot of lead time bias. We're seeing cancers that are detected at an early stage. So in the early 90s, I started to give lectures, and I still got my slides from those lectures, <laughs> that say, we are barking up the wrong tree. This is not a controversy about screening versus non-screening, because what is screening? Right. Yeah. We're not talking about opening, um, you know, PSA labs in the in the shopping malls and grabbing every guy who walks by and doing a PSA. We're talking about case detection more than anything else. But what we really need men to understand is that yes, there is an overdetection rate, but the argument isn't whether or not we want to look for prostate cancer. The question really is: Do we want to treat that cancer? We have to understand the cancer that we uncover better. And, you know, there are people who have been saying for years that these very low grade or almost non-malignant cancers that are detected, and there's quite a few of them detected yeah. early on in the old, in the old days, if you, you know, a couple of decades ago, they would all have treatment, radiation or surgery and all the complications of treatment. And if we can go back in time, a lot of those men should not have been treated and they, their lifestyle, their quality of life would be much different today than it is now. So, that was a mistake because we weren't addressing the real problem of treatment or over-treatment. And that is where we, I think we've made great grounds in the last 20 years or so with active surveillance, where we've recognized that some cancers just don't behave like cancers, the old C word. And in fact, we talk a lot about changing the, the nomenclature. Why are we calling one of these cancers that the pathologist looks at the biopsy under the microscope and says, these are cancerous changes, but they're very low grade, they're very low risk. So why even call them cancers? Call them, you know, prostate cells with uh, malignant potential or something that, because as soon as a man and or his partner hears the word cancer, the C word, it's, it's instant anxiety and stress. Yeah. Whereas if we were to say, you know, this, you, we found some cells in your prostate that probably can be monitored. You don't need any treatment right now. They may or may not turn into anything significant. It's a lot easier to take. So I think the problem with the screening controversy is that it was the wrong controversy. And the journey is going to continue, uh, you know, and, and but right now, my recommendation is when a man turns 40, if he has a strong family history of prostate cancer, or if he's black, Afro-American, and, and obese and has other risk factors, maybe even earlier. But you need a baseline blood test. Yeah. You need a baseline rectal exam. That's another controversy. Is a, is a rectal examination important? Because there are a lot of false pauses and false negatives with rectal exams. I think there's nothing, there's no reason not to do it. Okay, yeah, it may be uncomfortable for 10 seconds, but you know, big deal. We've, you know, men have done worse things like trying to put together a barbecue from scratch. That's a lot harder than getting a, a rectal. Don't, don't bring that up. That's trauma for me. Yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of tough things that we can do. So having a blood test, testing, your, checking your testosterone at age 40, getting a PSA, having a rectal exam. These are baseline studies. Probably at age 40, you're not going to pick up a lot of, of abnormalities. But now you've got a baseline, something to compare to in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, in 20 years. Um, and so, you know, it's it, the, the PSA screening controversy. You can quote all kinds of studies. You can quote, you know, all kinds of data. Bottom line is, I think it's the wrong argument. We wasted a lot of time on it. I think yeah. we have to focus more on because I've always felt well, if it's like telling a cardiologist, they're not allowed to use their stethoscope because every time they put their, their stethoscope on a man or a woman's chest, they might hear a murmur that's going to lead to an echo, that's going to lead to an invasive test, that's going to lead to God knows what. Right. So, so cardiologists, throw away your stethoscopes because you're going to find all kinds of, you know, sounds that are not 
going to lead to disease? Well, PSA is our stethoscope, right? And yeah, it can be it can be false positives, but we figure that out. That's why we're experts. We can figure that out. That's interesting. That's very well put. So if I had to summarize your current philosophy at 40, the average risk man should have a PSA baseline. Absolutely. And there's been a lot of there's a lot of data that shows without other risk factors, a man who has a PSA less than 0.5 in their 40s has extremely low risk of developing cancer later on and doesn't need to be screened every year. You yeah. can check their PSA every three years. Right. And that's what we've termed smart screening. And you're you're a fan of the digital rectal exam. Just getting an idea of what's going on there. Well, you're looking for other things too. I mean, I have found I, over my career, I have found a few rectal cancers, not a lot, but you know, early on, I found you know men have there are other illnesses that men and women have down in their pelvis. It's part of the general examination. I had a colonoscopy the other day. When I say the other day, it was really a couple months ago, but it feels like the other day, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I'll be here all week. Don't forget to tip your weight staff. <laughs> and so the 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 doctor said, "Look, uh, I'm going to do a before we get started. I'm going to do a rectal exam. But that's okay. You know, I'm worried about things that can go on there. There's redundant hemorrhoidal tissue. Blah blah." I said, "Go go ahead." And you know, it probably took what three seconds. I don't know. And I yeah. thought, so it's it's interesting. So that's that's a that's a fascinating philosophy, and I. You know, and, and it makes sense in the sense that everybody talks about prostate cancer as these indolent cancers and active surveillance. But let me tell you, all these other cancers are going through some of the same issues. Look at thyroid cancer. Look at breast cancer. Which ones are aggressive? Which ones are not? I don't know why we, prostate's always singled out as the cancer where, you know, that old saying, more men die with it from from it. Well, you could start saying that about a lot of cancers in, in general. Yeah. It's all about finding which ones you should be concerned about and which ones you shouldn't. But for all of those cancers... Yes, a lot of people, men, women, have these cancers that are somewhat, they're latent or they're, they're insignificant or whatever the term is you want to use, and they yeah. may not die of that cancer. But there are plenty of people dying of cancers. And there's nothing worse than dying of a metastatic breast cancer or a metastatic prostate cancer with the pain, the bone pain, the medication, the chemotherapy, the immunotherapy. The quality of life is awful, but if you were to detect those cancers early on, when they're still localized to the org organ of origin, there's a chance that you can prevent all of these the complications of treatment, the complications of the disease later on. We they don't pay attention to that. The screening controversy is screen death. Well, there's a hell of a lot of things between screen and death yeah. that are pretty awful that you yeah. can avoid. Right? No, that's well put. I didn't want to go down that path, but I had to because it, you know, it's just people are trying to figure this stuff out, you know, and they and, yeah. and they keep saying the rules are changing and the rules are changing, but it seems like they're being more responsible. That's we have that's to focus. We have to focus on research that can predict the behavior of a of an abnormality that's found on an image or on a biopsy or whatever. Can we predict? by looking, and we're using AI. I mean, the whole world's talking about AI right now, but we've been looking at AI for uh, about seven or eight years now, using AI to study biopsies that are scanned. So yeah. And because we believe that the computer will learn and be able to predict by seeing things in that biopsy that the human eye, you know, the occipital lobe cannot see or appreciate and be able to predict whether a man needs treatment or doesn't need treatment or whether a woman needs treatment or doesn't need treatment on their biopsies the very initial if we can go upstream from that it could be on a blood test it could be on a just on an x-ray or whatever yeah so that's where we have to emphasize our research efforts to you know yeah that's a good point you you also brought something in your talk i didn't expect and i i've seen your talk maybe more times than you've seen my talk which is kind of scary <laughs> i've seen your talk a lot of times <laughs> <I know. laughs> I think we give each other our own slides. Yeah. But you brought up something I haven't thought about in a while. You brought up something that really is misconstrued and I wish would be its own lecture. And it's so true. It's family history. I am convinced few people, including people in the, in the healthcare world, 
truly understand what family history means, like the significance of it. Because if you talk to someone that says, I have a family history of prostate cancer, you, as you, you know, you can often find out that, well, what kind of prostate cancer? Well, my dad was diagnosed at 89. My grandfather had it at 82. Well, what did they die of? They died of a heart attack. Well, anyone in your family young get prostate cancer, die from it, or had metastatic disease? No. In other words, can you talk a little bit about family history? I think it has, I think it has completely made a mess. It's very messy. And so how do I need to look at family history from your standpoint? Uh, family history is critically important, particularly if you have a, a member, a family member who had a prostate cancer or breast cancer or pancreatic cancer at a young age, because now there's a lot of push towards genetic testing. We know of there are a lot of genes that we are aware of that are associated with the development of cancers like BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, and, and so on. There's a lot, and there are, there are, you know, if if a woman has breast cancer or ovarian cancer and is BRCA positive, yeah. you know, the kids need to know if they are BRCA positive, or at least they have to talk to an expert to get advice whether or not they want to test the kids. You know, yeah. but it's the same up for a man. If a man is PR, BRCA positive, then that increases the risks of their kids having not necessarily prostate cancer, it could be their daughter having breast cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So, no. so, so I know. think I think family history is critically important. And we did a survey a number of years ago, and I, I mentioned it that about 20, 21 percent of men that we question did not know their family history. And so one of the messages is, hey, while your grandfather's still alive, talk to him. While your father is still alive and your mother is still alive, you know, talk to them. Just sit yeah. down one day, have a family gathering, and let's talk about what did you know granddad die of? What did grandma? Do we have heart disease in our family? Heart disease. I mean, strong risk factor for a cardiac disease. How can you go through life and not know your family history? I know. So we, when I was thirty, and I, uh, when I was thirty, we did a thing called a family disease tree, um, and I went around lecturing. <laughs> To kids, great, that great they should idea. know their not only their family tree but their family disease tree and i remember traveling in the united states and little kids were getting up and go grandpa died at 88 and he had lung cancer and he smoked for 40 years which could have been the reason but i know i should probably shouldn't smoke and you know i thought man this is this is really could be interesting if everyone did their family disease tree you know family health disease tree yeah. and because you're you you are you're quizzing the family members over what they were diagnosed with or what did grandpa have what did grandma have and it's incredibly educational and the idea came from when i lost a cousin at 38 from breast cancer i thought where else could this nasty gene have occurred and caused problems so i I think it was, I just think it was brilliant that you brought up family history because you say about a quarter of men don't know it, but I would argue that about another quarter to half know it, but I'm not sure of the significance of it. Yeah, yeah. And we have all those uh, websites, Ancestry and stuff. You can find out what your great grandfather did in the World War, but yeah. you know, do you know what he, you know, what diseases or illnesses he had or his, you know? You know, I should start a website. We said, I mean, we said, I, I've, I've been so focused on my, my uh, mom's father who died in his early fifties and he was a physician in Austria and he was a really, he was very healthy, except he, he did smoke. He went through a war and I found out how hypertensive he was. And my mom was hypertensive. My brothers aren't. And my blood pressure started creeping up at 35, 40. It didn't matter how well I ate or how much I worked out. You know, I realized I'm dealing with some kind of genetic variable here. Absolutely. And so, I mean, even if all people get when they go to your site is embrace your family history, that is huge. So I, I hate to, I, I hate to divert the conversation, but I was shocked to see that. I was so happy. Yeah. Not that I didn't know you would do it, but I just thought I just thought, <laughs> no, it's important. And that's one of the triggers of why I went to went into this field. You know, I was like I mentioned, one of the you know, you're doing a vasectomy on a 35 year old man and you ask him, you know, there's a family history of colon cancer and they have no clue. So yeah. like, why do you not know your family history? That was one of the things that came up, you know, that yeah. dawned on me that we got to get the message out. Yeah. Men. Learn your family history. I made this great sign, you know, I make these signs for my talks and sometimes I press print and I, I, for some reason I can't find it now. 
And so I made it, I handmade it. Sorry, again, it's a budgetary issue. <laughs> See how Canada and cannabis kind of flow together, Canada, oh. Canada. <laughs> and this helps us. And even though this is kind of tongue in cheek, this helps you and I talk about a subject in men's health. I know it's for overall health that is just not getting enough attention. And I'm sorry, but substance abuse or the abuse of substances that are legally available also concern me. Can you talk about your experience in Canada? Because it was legalized a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. So I'm yeah. not just, I'm not asking you just to pick on cannabis. I know it has some medicinal value, but can we just talk about cannabis and alcohol and substance abuse for a little bit? Well, I'm not a I'm not an expert on cannabis. You, know, you don't but, have to be. But you know, I mean, there's med there's medical cannabis, and then there's uh, social cannabis, and you know, it's uh, there there were issues, as I recall, about you know brownies and edible cannabis businesses, and you know, all that's been legalized. A lot of people have cashed in on it over the years. Yeah, but I, I don't, I, you know, I, I I probably shouldn't talk about it because I'm not really an expert on you know, drug infused, pot infused food, um, yeah. um, and, and the use of pot, but, uh, but, about the, but there's no question of, there's no question about alcohol being a problem. It's a social problem. A yeah. Problem. I mean, I, so yeah. the, the, the cannabis movement in the States just, you know, it's interesting. That's great. But the, all I know is the concentration of the active component is, you know, five times what it was when I snuck it in college. And so the the question of addiction has come up and I'm just, I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm not saying I'm for it. I'm saying that this is the story with medication and this is the story with drugs sometimes. Alcohol, whether it's beer in Canada, beer in the United States, the concentration of the drug itself has become, has gone higher and higher. And I think one of the quiet epidemics in men's health is alcohol abuse. And you touched on that. Yes. And I don't know what more you want to say about it, but I think I, I'm to the point where if someone is just willing to address alcohol intake, that is a great day. And so it seemed to me from your talk that you've been overwhelmed by it too, that you you really want to go after this thing. And is well, what's going on there? You know, the... Um... The new guidelines for alcohol in Canada came out just this year in 2023, and they highly recommend that people consider reducing their alcohol because there's really overwhelming evidence yeah. that less is better. Okay. And, you know, what's a safe amount of alcohol? It probably varies between people, but in general, no more than, you know, um, two drinks um, a week is what the guidelines are. And certainly, make sure not to exceed two drinks in a day. I think it's for a little different for men and women. I think it's for men, the absolute limit recommendation is no more than three or four drinks a day and no more than 14 drinks per week. And I had someone tell me the other day that they're following the guidelines because they have 14 drinks on a weekend and that's part of the week. <laughs> they don't drink from Monday to Friday, but they have 14 drinks on Everybody Saturday. Everybody wants to Sunday. get around the system. So, yeah, so, you know, you can do that. And alcohol can damage you. I mean, alcohol can damage you physically, it can damage you mentally, and it can damage other people, the people around you, you know, in your family. If you drink and drive, just, you know, you can damage, you can ruin other people's lives. It's not unreasonable that uh, the recommendations have come out the way they have. Yeah. And I think, you know, if we get that message, it's like seatbelts again. You know, the message is there. You got to start somewhere. And so if the message is no more than two drinks a day, no more than 10 drinks in a full week or whatever the number is, I can't, I'd have to go look it up. I can't remember the exact number, but you know, it's risky. It's risky. Yeah. Don't take the risk because it's not safe for you and it's not safe for everybody around you. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, I just always found it interesting that every major dietary program that people say works for them, one of the first rules is reduce alcohol consumption. <laughs> and then they lose weight and go, wow, where did, how did this magic happen? Yeah. And part of it's the caloric contribution yeah. that is alcohol. But it's, um, uh, you know, two, drink, two drinks per week, two drinks per week. That's 
pretty strict for a lot of people. It's going to be hard to get compliance on two drinks per week, but that's what the recommendations, that's what Canada's you know, quite drastic al- alcohol recommendations are. Do you have any problem talking to patients or family members about substance use or alcohol over intake? I mean, does this, is this, do you find this to be an uncomfortable subject? Do you think that people it's, go? It's not uncomfortable for me. No, I can talk to people about it. You remember the days when, uh, you know, certain professions used to drink a fair bit. Yeah. I would have I would have guys come into the office and I ask them if they if they drank, you know, if they consider themselves alcoholic or if they drank a lot. And they, oh no, no, not at all. And so and then you delve into it a little bit more and they say, Well, you know, I have a half a bottle of wine at lunch and I come home, I have a bottle of wine with dinner with my wife, and you know, proceed maybe with a couple of scotches and, and you start to add all that up. That's a heck of a lot of alcohol. It's a lot. It's a lot. And they are. And that is alcoholism. They are alcoholic. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, I just find it to be so ubiquitous in the States. And the portions have increased, the concentrations have increased. And I'm not saying that I'm Mr. Goody Two Shoes. I have to watch myself. You know, if I'm out with friends and I'm out at a conference, you know, it's you can easily go from one to two to three if you're hanging out with buddies for four or five uh, so, hours. So that makes me think of another point here. And whether it's alcohol or cannabis, there really are different kinds of drinkers and different situations. Mm-hmm. You know, you may just be drinking socially, right, with your friends. You might be drinking as, as a youngster in particular, an adolescent or a young adult. You might be drinking to conform with your friends, right, to be part of the group. You got to drink. My buddies are having a six pack of beer. I'm going to have a six pack too. Yeah. Some people, some people need the drinking to enhance, you know, their their anxiety. You know, to deal with their their situation, whether it's to cope with their their situation, whether it's anxiety or to enhance. They think maybe it enhances them physically or whatever. And unfortunately, a lot of people drink to cope. You know. Yeah. So, so when you're talking to patients or talking to your family members or friends or whatever, it's important to try to figure out what kind of drinker they are, which one are they, and why are they drinking like that? Because, you know, if you're just drinking for social drinking, then that's easy to change. But if you're drinking to cope, yeah. you know, with an underlying problem, you can't just poo-poo that and say, oh, you got to stop drinking. You know, the guidelines are two drinks a week. Yeah. You got you to send that person to a professional. You got to encourage them to see someone, to talk to someone who... Who can delve deep into their problems, their psychologist or psychiatrist or the family doctor or whoever. So it's important to understand why people use cannabis or why people use alcohol, I think. That's, you know. Yeah. I mean, clearly what's happening, from my public health standpoint, a lot of people are using it for self-medication. And um I'm not saying it's an easy habit to break. I'm not saying it's, but it I'm I'm glad. I'm glad people like you and websites are recognize it for what it is. Yeah. Whereas I think more of the old days, 10, 20 years ago, people tried to find reasons why it was healthy. And the reality is we were kind of pushing it aside and talking about everything. But but I, I like this, I like the coverage on your website. I think that's pretty critical. So yeah, I love the other thing. I'm sorry, if you want to say something. No, I was just gonna say it's also important that for parents to emphasize to their children. Yeah. You know that drink in moder- moderation because excess excess alcohol can damage not just the body but the developing brain as well. Yeah. So you know it's important for for parents to uh, you know guide their children appropriately. If I'm dealing with stress, anxiety, or depression, or any of these mental health issues, besides talking to my healthcare provider, are there places on the website? It looked like there were places on the website that could at least be. I don't want to say the word is ranked, but I think the idea of you could get it, you could get a better handle on being educated about those different topics and get a little of a type of assistance. Am I right there or wrong? No, there's there's and there's you can get a lot of direction on the website. That's there. But you know, you just have to Google alcohol drinking or whatever, and you know, Canada, Canada's alcohol guidelines. There's yeah. a lot of information that the Canadian government has come up with about low-risk alcohol drinking guidelines. There's a lot of stuff on the web there, you know, and uh, yeah. Do you find that, though, in men's health, 
are you finding, I know prostate cancer is an issue, but are you also finding that, I'm going to be kind about this, the BPH is a, a less appreciated issue or more, pre, it seems like prostate enlargement and lower urinary tract symptoms and guys getting up, you know, a couple times a night. I don't know. I see plenty of commercials on TV with women and dealing with incontinence and other issues. I can you can we just comment a second on BPH and just urinary function as you get older? Is it do you feel like that's getting enough attention? For some reason, I feel like it's not. I, am I wrong? Well, I mean, when I watch um, American television stations, I see ads for supplements for BPH. Urologists recommend this or that, and it's all soft palmetto, a lot of naturopathic stuff, much of which is placebo effects. Some of it might have some sort of physiological effect. And then there's the ads for all the minimally invasive procedures for BPH. But in general, I think you're right. I don't think there is enough attention. It's again, one of those head in the sand situations for men. Oh, I get up at night once. That's okay. I can live with that. You know, or, you know, or I get urgencies or I'm peeing all the time. Um, it gets to the point where they do seek it seek help though I mean, yeah you know, yeah but guys, I just, I'll, I'll i'll see a lot of men who'll say oh i'm just getting older i'm getting up at night so it's nothing it's not a problem i say well you know we should check are you emptying your bladder properly because if you're retaining a lot of urine it could be a problem you could be prone to infections retentions needing to be catheterized and so on there's a lot of problems that can arise so you want to be aware that it's yes it's an aging issue every man who lives long enough is going to run into it you know but yeah don't ignore it. No, that's a really good point. I think I think people think prostate enlargement, getting up to pee. I don't think they realize the collateral damage that you discussed. Yeah, you know, a hundred years ago, one of the most common causes of death in aging men was benign enlargement of the prostate and urinary exactly. retention leading to kidney failure. Right? That well, I didn't know that. I mean, I it makes sense though. I mean. Yeah. Because if they couldn't diagnose it, they couldn't treat it. Yeah. And, but there are men walking around with big prostates, small prostates that have problems. And, you know, it's still going to damage the kidneys if you let it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, lo I love the fact that there's this discussion of the collateral issues that you run into. And I wish, you know, another collateral issue that just doesn't get enough attention to me is that it can screw with your PSA. Yep. Right. It can make your PSA jump. It can make it go down. It can create, it can make your situation very cloudy. And you think you're, you don't even know, wait, what's coming from cancer? What's coming from BPH, right? Well, that's an issue with PSA. I mean, you know, yeah. and why you need, why you need an expert's opinion and you can't just rely on one PSA reading. You have to look at what happens to PSA over time because in the benign growth of the prostate, PSA is just prostate specific. It's, if it was prostate cancer specific, specific it would be called pcsa right? Yeah, right it's psa it's prostate specific it doesn't mean you have cancer so yeah. you know, if if you have it done once and it's a little bit elevated for your age if i can get a referred to patient with that situation the first thing i do because psa from an enlarged prostate is so much more common than from cancer first thing i do is i repeat it get another test see it what it does in two months or three months or six months or whatever if it's still going up, okay, now you need to investigate it. Where are you on the um, urologists and primary care folks around the world still with a rising PSA throwing antibiotics at it at first? Just, I mean, yeah, can, that's, you, can you talk, because I've reason, because you've been in the game a long time. There's been an evolution. The idea was to th throw antibiotics, but can you, do you want to comment on that? I mean, I know uh, sometimes they're needed, but or do you now do you if want to somebody if somebody has absolutely no symptoms and on rectal exam their prostate is normal feeling and non-tender i don't throw antibiotics at them i repeat the psa and see what, what what where we're at with that and then investigate but if they've got signs of inflammation in their prostate things like urinary urgency burning on urination frequency irritation in their rectal area or in the yeah. pelvis you know, anything, any symptom down there, then yeah, you know, maybe I will throw an antibiotic at them and see what happens. Yeah. Also, when they repeat, you know, again, there's not good evidence that riding a bicycle for long periods of time with all the pressure on the perineum, you know, or having sexual 
you know, activity immediately before the night before having your blood tested could raise the PSA. I think most studies have suggested that it doesn't have much impact, but I have seen patients, you know, especially long distance cyclists who have an elevated PSA and you get them off their bike for a few days and it comes down. Mm -hmm. So it does happen though. It's when you're talking in generalities, in the general population, no, it won't. Doesn't usually cause much of a change in the PSA. Repeat the test, man. I'm going to put your picture on my wall. It says "repeat the test" underneath your picture because that's another that's another golden nugget. That's another golden golden burn. Yeah, that's... Because everybody does that in every other field. There's a there's a there's a wacky potassium level, a wacky cholesterol, a wacky fasting blood sugar. Uh, you name it, they'll repeat it. Right. What, what, why isn't that standard in PSA? Repeat an abnormal it's, test. Especially in somebody who, you, you know, say in, prim in primary care where you've been monitoring somebody annually or every couple of yeah. years, all of a sudden it goes up once. Repeat it. Exactly. It's so exactly. often it comes right back down to the baseline. Oh, that's another golden. Are you tired of me saying it's another golden Goldenberg? I can't oh, help no. it. Though. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, I think, I think <laughs> the ultimate, it's the ultimate compliment. Thank you. Yeah, especially coming from a Moyad. I, I, you know, I'm an <laughs> FOM. How can I say? That's right. I mean, there's no golden in my name. Otherwise, I would use it to my advantage. Uh, let's talk about anything else that's near and dear to your heart because we're running out of time. Only about 15 minutes. But um, testosterone. How about testosterone? Oh, oh, How can we do men's health without can testosterone? Can I show you a sign at a meeting? I showed you a sign. <laughs> This is a classic Golden Goldenberg and Moya. You'll understand. I did this for a speaker that was just talking about testosterone replacement and you know, all the great. I know it's great, but we, I'll let you talk about it. I just said, hey, can we just accept the fact that when you lose some weight, your testosterone might go up? Can we just accept that fact? Can we quit playing this game like men suddenly woke up one day and their testosterones were low and it's it's a generational scourge that we live with? I'm going, no, but there are explanations for it. That's so, right. Yeah. So go ahead. Testosterone, the floor is yours. Well, I think the main issue is what is a normal testosterone? Okay. If testosterone is really low, it's down to your ankles. Okay. I mean, you got really low testosterone. You got really, you got a problem. But, you know, now we use different, different numbers in, in Canada, but, you know, say 300 plus or minus 100 in, in the States, we use different numbers up here. Eight to 12 would be normal. But, you know, what's, uh, what was your PSA, Mark, when you were 35 years old? Um, I you have no idea. No, no, I couldn't. I, yeah. I, I, all, I, all I knew is when I was 35, PSA stood for public service announcement. <laughs> I had and, no idea. What and you, and you never, yeah, and testosterone was uh, uh, something that what weight, weight lifters dealt with. So, you know, here, if I get a 65-year-old man who... You know, he's a little bit tired, so his GP tests the testosterone and it comes back at 250, say, 270. Do I treat him? Does he have low testosterone? Well, first thing you do is you repeat it, right? Always. Go to Goldenberg, repeat Always it. repeat it. Get a second yeah. reading on it. Make sure it's a morning reading. Because so often it's back to normal when Good it's point. Morning reading. But what is the... What is your baseline? That's why I said earlier on that, you know, if, if when you're in your 40s, get your GP to draw a testosterone, stick it in your file, know what it is. Because maybe it was 250 when you were 30 years old and you were perfectly fine. And now you're 65 and it's 250 and all of a sudden you're low. No, that's your testosterone. There may be other guys whose testosterone was 500 when they were 30 and now it's 250. Well, okay. His, this, this guy's body is used to 500 and he's now running at 250. Let's look into it. But we don't do that. And we don't know what normal is for any given man, that unless is. it's way out of whack, unless it's really low. In which case, you know, obviously you got to look into it. And if it's borderline low, lose weight. Take, do, go on a diet for six months and see me in six months. We'll repeat Thank your testosterone. What what in the H-E double toothpicks are you talking about, Dr. Goldenberg? Why don't I just go on a bunch of drug? I'll just take a bunch of testosterone. You're telling me to lose weight. And of course, yeah. I'm saying thank you to the person upstairs that he just said that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that doesn't weight. mean your testosterone is going to go up. At least you're going to find out, though, if it is intimately tied to your weight. 
before exactly. you start getting put on right. all of these meds. Yeah. yeah. Listen, you've lived with it for two years or three years. So most of these people have been symptomatic for a long time. It's not like you wake up one morning low testosterone unless yeah. somebody's unless somebody's cut off your you know what's right it doesn't happen suddenly you've been like this for a while well, why don't you take another little while and try to lose some weight exercise improve your diet increase improve your general health yeah you know, do this yeah. and then we'll see what you're rather than just throwing i showed you that there was that one joke slide that showed the lineup behind in front of pills that's and true. nobody in front of you know preventative care that's true you know, people wake up every day in the U.S. and they have low testosterone because a commercial told them they have it. So they go run out and they're, you know, and, you know, there's good and bad things about awareness. But yeah, I, uh, I, I, it's so true. And I'll tell you where also I think there's a, a huge problem in men not knowing their, te you know, you've made me so happy today. I'm going to take off my jacket. I'm, I do. I do this for no one. I do this for no but one, Dr. Goldenberg. And I'm going to put on the other gift I got from one of my Canadian brothers and sisters, which was a jacket that says Canada on it with a hockey player. That's weird, hockey in Canada. So I'm just, in the last 10 minutes of our talk, this is pure deference to you. I love that jacket. I have the I same love it one. Too. <laughs> I do love it too. I'm not a fan. I mean, I like the Canucks. I don't love the Canucks like you do, but I'm a big fan. So testosterone, repeat it. So what I was going to say was, I'm just always amazed how there's not more discussion in prostate cancer of men knowing their testosterone before they're put on hormone therapy. Like, okay, we want to, you want to make sure it goes to zero on hormone therapy, but what was it before it went to zero? Because maybe it's, it only has to go a small way and that's significant, but maybe it's yeah. got a long way to go and the recovery will make sense. Because you, I, I looked at all your papers that you've done, 6 billion papers on PubMed. And in your early days, you used to talk about intermittent therapy a lot. Yeah. So. yeah. Still, I still treat a lot of men. I have a big population of men on intermittent therapy. It's very important for quality of life and it doesn't shorten life at all. You know, so that's been proven without a doubt. And it's an wow. accepted standard of care around the world, intermittent therapy. But yeah, you're right. We don't know. And there were studies that came out of Baltimore years ago, uh, Walsh's work that showed that men who have lower testosterone levels may develop more aggressive prostate cancers as well. So it's, I think it is important. And also there were studies yeah. that showed that after taking out the prostate in a lot of men, the testosterone comes up for some reason. We don't understand all, I don't understand the biology there, but those are observations. Yeah, that, that, that it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Again, it comes back to, if I had to send one public health message out that I wish my one wish for public health would be to get every man in their forties to have a series of baseline tests that stick in their medical record so that when they come to see you, when you're they're 60 or 70, you got something to look at, to refer to. Yeah. Thank you. I think that is absolutely awesome. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, a couple more topics. If you got a second, can we talk about smoking or vaping in this? It's there's still a lot of men and women and every, there's still a lot of people using nicotine in all different sizes and shapes. Can you tell us why people working in urology are intimately tied to smoking when a lot of people just think it's all about lung cancer? Not that that's not significant, but it's, it's about other things too. I think I absolutely. I think that, you know, the, the relationship between smoking and a number of urologic diseases is very significant. Erectile dysfunction, you know? If I told a 25 year old man to stop smoking because he's going to develop bladder cancer when he's 60 or lung cancer, he'll just look at me funny and say, no, I want to, you know, I'm not going to quit for something that's going to happen 40 years from now. But if I say to him, you know, there's a strong link between smoking and sexual dysfunction, losing your erections, they look, they will consider very differently. So, I think the message is is very strong that smoking can do a lot of things to your body besides lung cancer. Yeah. And from a urologist's point of view, bladder cancer, high incidence in smoking, yeah. erectile dysfunction, yeah. prostate cancer. There's a link to worse prostate cancer. 
Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, I think it's important. And that's one of the things that when, when I was talking about the portal into men's health as a urologist, if I see, you know, you, we, obviously if you see a man with bladder cancer who comes to see you because he's, he's got blood in his urine and it turns out to be a bladder cancer and he's a smoker, you're going to tell him you got to quit smoking. Yeah. It's going to kill you. Yeah. You know, is that severe enough reason? I mean, you know, so that so that brings up a thought in my head that since you're saying everybody should get these baseline tests and if they're a little bit wacky, you should repeat it. And this should happen at say 40. We picked a number. Do you include in that testing also a UA, a urinalysis? Do you think they should have their urine examined? Or are we just talking mostly blood tests? I don't see why you wouldn't do a urine test. That that's about it costs about one cent to do a dipstick and just to make sure there's no red blood cells in there or protein, or, you know, because you can have undiagnosed protein in your urine as well. And that yeah. can reflect kidney disease at an early age. That can be asymptomatic. And again, if it's picked up earlier, the one thing you don't want to, we have to be careful with this concept is, you know, getting the, the um, false positives, right? The yes. you know, finding tests that are going to lead to all kinds of other, other tests. So there's a bit of a balance there. Yeah. You have to be careful. If, if there's another topic you want to, if you're, you really want to bring up, let me know. Otherwise I'm going to take you into my home stretch. Okay. Let's do home stretch. Okay. Here's my home stretch. By the way, this, I didn't show the statistic. You talk about smoking. I think it's somewhere around 15% of Canadians. I don't know about the States, but 15% of the population still smoke. That's a lot of people. Yeah, we dipped under 20%. Now it's working 15 to 20. It's, and even though people are running around going, it's the lowest ever. Now we're not really taking into account the smokeless tobacco and the vaping. And then the secondhand smoke issues. I can go into a whole other lecture about that. And so it's still a big problem. It's yeah, a about, about 10 years ago, we put out a brochure about uh, being a dad who smokes. Yeah. And, and, you know, how to get the dad to stop and uh, to commit to to, you know, being a good dad by not showing bad habits to your kids. You know, I can't remember the exact wording that we did, but being a dad who smokes, you know, it's not a good thing. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, what's been interesting, though, at, at all ages in the spectrum, a couple of my uh, my plastics friends, plastic surgeons, they won't. They won't do some cosmetic speech. Uh, they won't do cosmetic procedures on patients now, many of them, unless they quit smoking an X amount of time before the procedure, because it interrupts with the success of the procedure, right? So if you're talking about cosmetics here, other places, and I think that's a fascinating move because it's like you said, a smoker who's 25, yeah. you know, what it's it's addressing these other collateral damages that take place that people don't realize, which is accelerated aging, yeah. right? So I, yeah, a lot of the issues with smoking may seem sort of obvious to you and me. Yeah, for some reason to a lot of people, it's just not obvious, and they have to be educated. Yeah, the other thing we agreed on, which I'll leave with the audience, is we always we always agreed on that heart healthy was head to toe healthy. That we always should be if you can do whatever you can to take care of your heart, that takes care of your body from head to toe. Yeah. I love that you're passing that that message, and we're sharing that message. So here's my finish line. Just random, pick your brain. If you had to classify one of the biggest mistakes you see men make, if you had to just think about in your clinic, in your experience, one of the biggest, it could be educational. It could be just, it doesn't, there's no right answer. It's just w one of the bigger mistakes that men seem to make or perceptions versus realities or something that has to be cleared up. Do you know what that is? Does something strike you when it comes to men's health? Like if there was something you could just get across in a 30 second, 60 second to any man in your clinic because of your past experience of dealing with thousands of patients, is there one or is there just too many? Well, there are a lot of them, but again, it comes down to this. The, I think the most important statistic in my talk was that 70% of chronic illness can be prevented by upstream preventative health measures mm. and lifestyle changes. Mm. Don't change much. That's my message. Yeah. Ch but change, develop new habits, 
that will turn into new behaviors. Quit smoking, drink less, exercise more, watch your diet. You know, and we're not, we're talking about moderation, everything in moderation, especially moderation. I mean, you know, you want to, you know, you don't have to stop drinking, right? Be moderate. You don't have to exercise every single day, but exercise a few hours a week. You know, you don't, we're not talking about drastic changes that are going to make you miserable. Yeah. We're talking about changes, small changes that are going to make you happy and healthy. So we talk about one of the bigger mistakes that men make. And how about one of the bigger mistakes that, that docs make in dealing with this issue? Do, you, do Is there something that, is there something that docs should hear from you that when dealing with men's health that that we're missing, other people are missing out there. Not I, wish, I wish that urology, you know, I can speak as a urologist, but even as primary care, but I wish that when I, you know, that urologists, when they see men with bladder cancer, they take the time to talk to them about smoking mm. or give them a pamphlet, or if mm. they see a man with a testosterone issue to, or with an ED issue to talk to them about the risks of cardiovascular disease, take the time to address these risk factors that can that can cause other health issues. But specialists are just so busy. Yeah. You no, know, maybe build into your clinics, into your if you have in the States like a physician assistant, you know, maybe build into your time some education programs for your patients. Yeah. We have that opportunity. We have, you know, and I think if we don't take advantage of that opportunity that presents our to us, then and I think I won't use the word negligent, but I would use the word lazy. Maybe. Yeah. I, well, I don't think there's a, that's why I put up men's health foundation. I, I typed that in and it gave me everything I needed to know. And so people could just send people there just to take a look. Uh, there's endless amount of material. Um, okay. Well, how about mistakes or something you could tell partners? I just thought that would be interesting because you must deal with a lot of partners who come in with the patient. And is it always bringing a partner? Is it, I is think it so. partners yeah. are a big, I mean, what, what's, what's the Goldenberg moment on that? Uh, I think the part, I mean, we have a prostate cancer supportive care program that is dyadic in nature. It was created to be dyadic, meaning it's a mm -hmm. two person event. Interesting. Okay, it's not just you as the man with prostate cancer, or it could be your, the man with bladder cancer, or the man with sexual dysfunction. It takes two to tango, okay? And we address the partner. It's critically important for the partner to be involved. And you know, everybody's a little bit different. Some men don't want their partner there. Yeah. Some men don't want their partner there for a variety of reasons. Maybe they don't want their partner to know, or they're embarrassed, or or whatever. I mean, there's different reasons, but as a physician, you got to delve into that and find that out because it could impact on what you eventually do for that individual, especially when we're dealing with sensitive things like sexual health. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, if you, I'm, if I'm going to write you a check for a hundred million dollars that you can use any way you want, occupationally or for the greater good, and I'm not saying you can use it to help increase the performance of the Vancouver Canucks team by getting better free agents. But if you could use this in science, is there an area that you're looking at? I mean, I know you're still a young man, but you've been doing this a long time. So now you're thinking of, you're thinking of items like me, like what are other items? I can only do so much. If you were suddenly given such a large check, where would you, where's your heart at? Where would you put, where would you put it into? Well, I, I think that, is that U.S. dollars or Canadian dollars? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the day. Because <laughs> I'll yeah. never get it right. Yeah. Either way, I, it's a way of saying it's a lot more money than we'll ever see. I mean, but, I would in, I would invest it in in men's health advocacy. I a lot of it would yeah. you know I think we need to develop better programming for men's health. It costs money. You know, the Canadian Men's Health Foundation. We go year to year on a on a tight budget. I'm always asking for government funding or philanthropic dollars because it's a non-revenue generating business. I'm not charging men, you know, to help them with their health, right? Uh, there's no income. Yeah. There. It's all non-revenue generating. So I would invest a lot in that. And the other area I would invest in as a urologist, is I think, and this has nothing to do with men's health 
it has more to do with general health and that is we have an issue with children who are born with um, you know have congenital anomalies in the urinary tract or in the spine that lead to urinary issues and they have mm. all kinds of problems with urinary diversions sexual health issues as they get older and fertility fertility issues as they get older but they in Canada at least they graduate from the children's hospital world and it's like stepping off of a cliff there's the adult world does not address their problems you know decades ago most of these kids didn't survive to become adults now wow. because of great medical care in the adolescent and the pediatric and adolescent world they're living and they're living to become young adults who are infertile have sexual health issues have bags with urine coming out of it and the poop coming out of other bags mm. and they need help and we don't address that issue well enough so I would put some money into developing programs to help those young people I think that's a another area so nothing to do with our talks today about men's health but I mean, that's okay you know, you know and uh, that's that's an area that we're working on here in Vancouver we're trying to develop a center for that yeah you know, and there's so many other areas that need. No, but that's a brilliant answer because I, I was always tell the audience, I never, I, you have no idea what's coming at you, and so, I, it's kind of not fair. A lot you got to think off the cuff, and, um, yeah. that's an answer I haven't heard. But there is a continuity problem, and everyone, yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Is there a question I should have asked you today that I didn't ask you? Who's going to win the Stanley Cup? <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately it's not going to be a canadian team but it's going to be a team of canadians <laughs> well, i'm still reeling from looking on your website and your slides that uh i don't know who it was like brendan shanahan is on your list on your yeah. website i'm thinking wait he played for detroit didn't he he played for yeah. the red wings what yeah. in the what's he doing working with goldenberg he's one of our champions trevor linden's one of our champions we've got a lot of hockey players but we've got others too. We've got a lot of very well-known Canadians. Yeah, they're good people. They're great people. And all I know is that the most college championships ever won in hockey is by the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Now, little known fact. And when you get to Ann Arbor next time, which I'm hoping you do to give a lecture, I will take you to a Michigan hockey game, which is an experience you'll never forget because football gets all the attention, but hockey is where the rabid fans are and there's just nonstop verve, you know, it's, uh, you would love it. If you thought the Red Wings game was okay, this takes it to another level. So I look forward to it. Yeah, I look forward to it too. Let me just bring this up again. Men's health, where I found it, menshealthfoundation.ca. Just type that in, just go browse around. You'll find something you and your partner will find very interesting. Maybe it's, I saw a podcast that was really interesting on a couple of subjects. And look, I don't want to sound too hokey here. You were, you were my top choice this year uh, to have someone to come in and talk about men's health. And, you know, I mean, you and I have been friends a long time. I just want to thank you for all you do and for just being you. And this sounds a little bit huggy, kissy right here, virtual hug. But I mean it because what you have done is realized that there is a bigger movement out there that needs to be tackled. And not many people are able to tackle it. And you're the first one to come up with this major movement in Canada, which is spread globally. And so you, so now everybody recognizes you globally as this men's health guru. Um, but th this had to start from a place. This had to start from a place where you realized these other things had to be addressed besides prostate cancer. So I, I want to thank you for your friendship. I want to thank you for doing this talk. And I want to thank you for the website. And I will make sure that, that the PCRI, that we, we make sure we can send as many individuals to that site as possible. And then... You can, when we're together next time, again, you can walk me through this. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. It's been, a, it's been my pleasure, Mark. And you're a good friend, and I'll do this anytime for you. Thank you. Thanks. I look forward to seeing you soon, and I hope we, I hope we do a part two here in the near future. I really do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Goldenberg, and thank you, Dr. Moya. That was awesome.
I just wanted to remind you that we are a nonprofit organization. And if you would like to join our cause, that is great. You can go ahead and do that at pcri.org forward slash donate. We're trying to reach men all over the world who are having prostate cancer issues, prostate related issues, and even men's health issues. We want this information to go out to people for free. And through this YouTube channel, we can do so. But we do need funding. So if you would like to donate, again, you could do so at pcri.org or you can do the fundraiser here on this YouTube video. Now, I do want to remind you that we have an exhibit hall on our website. You can find a ton of information there. There's a men's health checklist. You can download it, take it to your doctor and go over the different scans and the different things that you need to look at with him and talk to your medical team. All of this information is so that you have a more informed conversation with your medical team and you're able to have really great outcomes over time. The more education you have, the better the outcomes. I also want to remind you that, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer videos every week. Like this video if you find it helpful, and please leave your comments and questions in the comment section below. It definitely helps us as we build further content. So in our next session, we're going to be talking about prostatitis, and we're going to be talking about supplements for the prostate. Now, as we all know, we've seen ads for supplements in prostate and prostate cancer. We've seen all sorts of issues in regards to this, but the person that's here today is going to be able to bring a lot of clarity for us. His name is Dr. J. Curtis Nickel, and he is an expert in this field. He is the Canadian Research Chair in Urologic Pain and Inflammation for Queen's University, Ontario, and he's also the Professor Emeritus there. Now, he not only has taken the time to teach us and describe all of the issues in regards to prostatitis, but he's gonna be able to break down the cause and also different things that help us through this process. Now, he's also gonna be moderated by Dr. Mark Moyad, our moderator, and they're gonna do an extended Q&A in session afterwards. We're very honored to have him and that he's taken time to be with us today. So thank you so much, Dr. Nickel. Welcome to the PCRI. Thanks for that introduction. It's a great pleasure today to be able to present uh, two of uh, the things I enjoy most, the hobby, my hobby, which is uh, motorcycle adventures across North America, and in fact, around the world, and urology, particularly prostate disease, and in this case, alternative management uh, um, strategies for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Now, before I start, it's always important to let you know uh, relevant disclosures and that are, could, could potentially be conflicts of interest. I have been a uh, consultant and have done some research for Valenza International, Zaya Plus, and Red Leaf Medical. All of them have their hands in the field of uh, complementary alternative medicine and nutraceuticals. So, what is a topic? of the use of nutraceuticals. And I'm going to be specific in this presentation and look only at saw palmetto extract. What does saw palmetto have to do with a motorcycle adventure, in this case, in the Northern Florida wilderness? Well, my wife and I had planned a motorcycle uh, trip to the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway. And when the uh, uh, undisclosed company in Florida found out that I was in the sort of area, at least south of the Canadian border, because I am a Canadian urologist, they invited me to Northern Florida because they knew I would recently published on Saw Palmetto and was confused to some extent at the sort of the front end story, the supply chain of what happens uh, in the from the berry picking right to the production of Saw Palmetto extract. And something I did want to learn about and what better way to learn about it by combining a motorcycle ride with a, a bit of an adventure to learn about the Sa Palmetto um, berry supply chain. So headed down from uh, the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway to North uh, Florida, and these are the uh, some of the areas that we traversed in this uh, three-day adventure. The spoiler alert, as I already mentioned, was that this trip was uh, funded. In other words, my motorcycle gas and accommodation were paid for by a company in Florida, one of the main three that uh, produce uh, saw palmetto berry extracts. So what is the deal about saw palmetto? Well, this is a non-cultivated berry. In other words, it's not on farms, it's only found in the wild and only in the wilds of Florida from the Everglades up to the Georgian border and in South Georgia. 
I'd like to give you a little bit of a background history lesson because I think it's important to put this into context. Uh, salt palmetto has been known as, um, as a sort of a pharmaceutical by the Seminole Indians centuries ago. They knew that it improved sexual health and voiding and prostate, they didn't know about prostate, but urination. So they knew this for, for years and passed that on to the settlers. In, in fact, we were first introduced to saw palmetto uh, by the uh, memoirs of a fellow named Ponce de Leon, a European who was looking for the fountain of youth. Well, he didn't find the fountain of youth. He found a berry that he believed helped his sexual prowess and made him feel like he was voiding as a much younger man. The uh, uh, first Europeans to really look at it, the Westerners to really look at it, was a fellow that was stranded on the coast of Florida and would have died if the um, indigenous uh, Seminole in, um, natives did not teach him how to both uh, eat and use the saw palmetto berry. This fellow later wrote this uh, in his memoir, Survival, which became an American bestseller of how he survived in the Florida desert eating saw palmetto berries. He ended up being the uh, mayor of Baltimore. One other fact that's kind of interesting, I found interesting, is in the three brutal Seminole Wars, where it was the objective of the American army to either eradicate or forcibly remove all the Seminole Indians from Florida, the reason they were ineffective was because the, the indigenous uh, survivors of the first war were able to retreat into the wilderness and live on the uh, South Palmetto Berry when the army uh, tried to uh, starve them out. And the army could not do any major maneuvers because the leaves of the South Palmetto plant are like little steak knives and they tore the trousers and even the boots of the American army trying to maneuver after the Seminoles. And so the war ended up in a, a bit of a draw. So it was uh, known by the pharmaceutical companies to the turn of the last century that this was an important product. And in fact, all the major uh, companies were involved in the uh, picking, the drying, the extraction of saw palmetto, including uh, companies like Merck and Park Davis and uh, oh, Eli Lilly. They all had saw palmetto uh, extracts. It wasn't until uh, pharmaceuticals and the uh, terp came on that saw palmetto fell into dis, uh, more or less in disuse as far as the medical community was concerned in North America, but it actually took off in Europe. Now, is this really a natural herbal treatment for benign prostatic hyperplasia and LUTs? Well, in vitro, that's in the laboratory, we can determine that saw palmetto extract uh, affects intraprostatic uh, dehydrotestosterone levels by an intraprostatic 5-alpha reductase inhibition. This is similar to the generalized systemic effect of finasteride, um, the proscar, or dutesteride, avidart. It also is a very potent intraprostatic anti-inflammatory. And we know that inflammation is what um, creates some of the symptoms we see in the lower urinary tract symptoms we see with BPH. But there's significant controversy to its effectiveness in the international, particularly the North American medical and urology community. And I was one of those that helped add to this confusion. I was one of the uh, principal investigators of the CAMUS trial in which we saw compared saw palmetto to uh, placebo. And it's this very well done, well performed, well analyzed clinical trial. There was no difference in reduction of lower urinary tract symptoms with the saw palmetto extract than placebo. In fact, there's two more studies, the STEP study from California, which used a similar product, and a very small study in Europe that were negative. And this has driven the uh, idea, and particularly the guidelines in North America, this saw palmetto extract is not really uh, effective. But patients and men who have lower urinary tract symptoms continue to use it and worldwide, there's more saw palmetto sold than that of the medical products that we prescribe, such as alpha blockers, uh, such as Flomax, 
and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors such as finasteride or Proscar. So we convened a um, international panel, a consensus group to look at the real world data on this. And we reviewed the global literature and I didn't know that there were up to 58 saw palmetto BPH studies, which met a very rigid criteria that we set up. In fact, there were thousands of saw palmetto papers and studies, but 58 studies, 25 of them were based on a European product called permixin, which is a hexane extracted product done at pharmaceutical grade and prescribed in Europe. 33 were others, but was very interesting that 14 of these were randomized controlled trials. Now, we were able to look at all this combined world evidence, and it was very obvious to us that for the most part, saw palmetto is safe to use in men with mild to moderate BPH, lower urinary tract symptoms, low incidence of adverse events when used at the recommended dose. And we saw that across the board in all 58 studies. We also determine that there is a lot of inconsistency in research methodology over the last three decades. Many of the early studies didn't use some of the validated uh, questionnaires that we use nowadays. They didn't use uh, the flow rates that we use nowadays to see if there's improvement. Some were just based on patients uh, uh, saying, uh, you know, that they globally were voiding uh, better. So it made it very difficult to assess the various uh, old trials versus the new trials. But what also we noticed that many of the saw palmetto extracts were different compositions in, in the ones that they actually looked at the fatty acid prints, uh, fingerprints. And that's what we're looking for in these is the fatty acids in, uh, that are, are come out of the extraction process. Uh, and so we may have been comparing apples to oranges. But from these inconsistency, we have two guidelines arise. The one on the left is the AUA guidelines. And it's basically um, based on two studies. Well, it's completely based on two studies, the CAMUS and the STEP trials, which were really, really well done, randomized placebo-controlled trials that were negative. The EAU guidelines are primarily uh, based on permixin, which is a pharmaceutical grade uh, extraction of uh, 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 saw palmetto. And it's based on those 25 studies plus the other studies from Europe and elsewhere, which were positive. In fact, um, of the 58 studies, 55 of them were positive, And the three that I mentioned before were negative. So why can't we do the same as the Europeans? Why can't we use this permixin, which is a hexane extracted product? Well, in the United States and in Canada, uh, saw palmetto, like other nutraceuticals, is a food additive. And you cannot have residual hexane in a food additive because there's no restrictions on how much you can take. So theoretically, you could eat so much extracted saw palmetto oil that you could get hexane toxicity from the very small residual. In Europe, they're not concerned about that because it's a prescribed product and you would need uh, way above the prescription amount to even closely figure that there might be a toxicity. Uh, so in one case, it's a pharmaceutical product that's prescribed in North America. It's a food additive with not a lot of regulations, not pharmaceutical grade, and is not prescribed. And that may be some of the reasons for the difference in North American versus European guidelines. So what we found, and I sort of was alluding to that, is what we call the liposteroidal extraction process. And that can be either carbon dioxide extraction or an ethanol extraction. So one that has a fingerprint, like I'm, uh, uh, I'm not actually showing here, but on the left side is uh, the fingerprint of permixin. If you can get a fatty acid composition similar to permixin, that's likely the key to success. It turns out that the United States Pharmacopeia uh, has picked permixin as sort of the standard by which uh, North American saw palmetto should be um, looked at. So 
the final consensus, and we, we did a couple other things, is that we really think that um, a properly extracted Serona repens, which is the scientific name for shop palmetto, could be considered as a treatment option for men with mild to moderate BPH, lower urinary tract symptoms, as an alternative to doing nothing. Uh, but we do believe that we need a product with a standardized profile and a profile like Permixin, which is unavailable to us, would most likely be the one that's effective. So back to my story. Here I was in the Okla National Forest in Northern Florida, the largest national forest east of the uh, uh, Mississippi River. I didn't see any Florida panthers or, or any Florida bears while I was there, but I did see a lot of wonderful terrain. I finally uh, met up with uh, Bill. He runs the picking crew. I had a chance to talk to Bill and he explained to me that the difficulties picking this in the heat, the humidity with scorpions and spiders and mosquitoes and, and you know some things that could even eat you coming out of the swamp. Uh, he explained to me how these leaves were so sharp that, and I actually cut myself walking through because I didn't have long sleeves um, with these uh, steak knife razor blade uh, uh, leaves that saw palmetto has. So after spending a little time with the picking crew, I headed up to a drying facility in Jasper. Jasper is the northern part of Florida. It's known for its historic jail um, house and really nothing else. It's a, it's a town that time forgot uh, and left behind, but it did have uh, one of the uh, saw palmetto uh, sorting cleaning and drying facility. And Adrian, who was the manager of this, was able to show me the berries when they came in, the ripeness of the berries, how they were sorted, cleaned, how they were dried before shipping to the extraction facility. On the way to the extraction facility where I had an invite to visit, I stopped at the University of Florida at the Botanical Gardens. By the way, that's me riding past the swamp the swamp is where the, uh, the University of Florida Gators, I believe they have won uh, three, I'm not AFL, and some sort of uh, university titles are very, very proud of. Um, and so it looked like a sort of a wonderful stadium. So I met Professor Van Dam and his uh, Brazilian uh, postdoctoral student. He is the foremost uh, expert scientist in the world on Sao Palmetto. And he told me all the stories about it, that the, the plants that we were picking can be as old as 1,500 to 2,000 years. Uh, they're not ready for picking until about 20 or even 30 years uh, while they're out there. He explained to me that they live in communities spreading out under the trees and in the forests and the swamps of the wilds of Florida. They communicate through ribosomes network underground so there's something happens in the far corner of, of a saw palmetto area, like a forest fire, or not can as kilometers, but miles down the road, the other plants become immediately aware that a fire is coming their way and they can roll up, start to protect. This is actually a fire uh, retardant plant. And in fact, fires are probably good for the saw palmetto plant, but they communicate for miles underground sort of reminded me of the tree people of uh, that we saw in uh, Lord of the Rings or perhaps uh, Shades of Avatar, I believe. So as fascinating as it was, I had to leave them because I had an appointment to, to visit one of the extraction plants. But, but again, I want to reiterate that it's a very important that the berries are picked right. And the picking series is from August to and. Last year, it was about mid-September before the picking season was done in southern Georgia. And the picking crews moved from the south to the north with government permits, and they pay the private landowners or the government for the ability to pick on private land. It's much easier to pick the early berries that are, that are, are unripened. And these are the berries that are sort of picked um, and sent to Asia. These do not contain any significant uh, amount of saw palmetto um, extract. They're also picked um, by a number of companies, ground into powder, and uh, sent to various manufacturers to make into pills as saw palmetto. They'll have no benefit at all. So I went to the wonderful Lake District to uh, Mount Dora, where I stayed overnight. 
a mountain in this part of Florida is 120 feet high. Um, it's kind of a flat country. The extraction plant in Eustis and Lake Country was fascinating, fascinated as um, Andrew, the plant manager, showed me how they used high pressure carbon dioxide extraction methodology to take, uh, take out all the essential oils, ingredients, fatty acids, uh, phytoestrogen or phytosterols and everything that, they, they, that is felt to be important and leave no residual because the CO2 is dissipated. In fact, they're able to use the CO2, uh, recover 99% of it to use for the next extraction. Uh, after that, I had a chance to visit a, a laboratory that tests nutraceuticals and Margaret, the chief scientist there, was able to explain to me that that particular day that she was looking at five different saw palmetto extracts. The one on the right, the dark one, is true saw palmetto extract. The other uh, are uh, products that are sold on the market as saw palmetto. That particular day, she was able to show that most of the product in that was not saw palmetto oil, but palm oil. And that is a major problem I'll allude to in a second, is that many of the products we buy contain no saw palmetto, but they contain other oils that, 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 are, that are used. Uh, in fact, and I'll mention this again, there's uh, not enough saw palmetto uh, berries grown in Florida and South Georgia to even provide a third of the international worldwide market for saw palmetto extracts. So when we look at the various type of oils, there's different fingerprints. And she showed me that she was able to uh, look at saw palmetto products and see whether or not that particular company used saw palmetto or whether they use palm oil, coconut oil, rapeseed oil, other nut oil, sunflower oil, and they've all been used in various products that are available on the market and particularly on the internet. Buyer beware is the message I'm trying to present at this point. Because you see right now, as I explained to you, even in North America, there's more uh, nutraceuticals sold and, and saw palmetto is the main supplement used in men's health for uh, prostate disease, but primarily benign prostatic hyperplasia, than all the medicines that we prescribe, such as alpha blockers and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. There's, in the United States alone, in, in the pharmacies and the Walmarts and the health food stores, 250 million are sold over the counter with the primary ingredient being saw palmetto. We have no idea, but it's felt to be much larger than this is the amount of saw palmetto that is ordered uh, on the web and internet and comes from who knows where and made with who knows what. So, uh, you know, nearly a thousand saw palmetto based supplements are currently commercially available for consumer purchase in the United States, but there's more than several thousand products that are available on the internet. And like I said, many of them. In fact, the majority that you could buy, uh, particularly off the internet, contain no saw palmetto extract at all. Many contain green berry extract, which is not going to be any help, or it's just ground powder, which is going to be useless. Many supplements uh, contain the what we call the kitchen sink approach. They include uh, various things like African pigeonum, uh, peanuts, stinging nettle, anything that purported that rye grass extract, anything that purported to help the prostate is put in. However, they have to reduce the dose of everything to do it. There's no consideration for efficacy because these combination products have never been taste tested in combination. And there may be interactions. And in fact, we've shown interactions um, with other nutraceuticals that I do research in UTIs. Um, the one I use is saw palmetto, uh, no, not saw palmetto, but cranberry, and uh, d mannose both effective uh, for re preventing UTI in women, urinary tract infections, you put them both together and it negates the benefit uh, of the, uh, that. Now, here is the real problem. Many are spiked with pharmaceuticals. In fact, in the 10-year period uh, up to 2017, almost 800 nutraceuticals tested had traces of one or more pharmaceuticals for 
the ones we're talking about, the BPH, is tansulosin and finasteride. Now, about a third of those, the FDA sent out a cease and desist and stop selling order. For the most part, those were ignored or the companies just repackaged it under another name. Uh, there is, it's a wild west out there, although there, there is no real regulation, there is no enforcement. And so we have these products with potentially dangerous um, ingredients, pharmaceutical ingredients. And in fact, many men opt for nutraceuticals because they want to avoid pharmaceuticals. Again, buyer beware, and we'll talk about what we can do that in a minute. So this is a, was presented in Chicago at our major urology meeting uh, this April by uh, Dr. Shuktai in New York. And he looked at 28 different uh, saw palmetto extracts that were available in stores and, um, and uh, uh, health food uh, and pharmacies in the New York area. Some of them were berry blends, some of them were berry powder, berry extract. And what he calls multi-active is the one he put that uh, has a little bit of everything in it. He looked at the total uh, fatty acid content and um, what one met the USP standard for the total amount of fatty acid content, only seven of the 28. Now, where did the fatty acids come from? Only one could be demonstrated to come from sal palmetto and the rest of the fatty acids and the other products came from other oils or didn't come, um, weren't able to be identified as real sal palmetto. This is extremely, extremely worrisome to the point that when I gave this same talk at a, at a um, nutraceutical convention in Las Vegas recently, a number of major companies realized they don't know what they're selling like Costco and Walgreens, um, and, and Walmart, and they switched to products that are definitely proven to be saw palmetto. It's too bad everybody else couldn't do that. This is a Canadian analysis I did for a company that wanted to do due diligence for saw palmetto. So I recommended that they only go with somebody who had a, a good um, uh, supply chain, you know, that they were able to document, and then they used uh, carbon dioxide extraction not necessarily high pressure. One of the problems is they were all very different. And there's a possibility that in two of these, a low cost plant oil might be mixed in the product just to improve it. This helped the company that I was consulting for. So they were able to pick the product that we knew had was, was really came from uh, Northern Florida or South Georgia and contained saw palmetto with the proper extraction process. So did I ever learn a lot by following the stop palmetto supply chain on this motorcycle trip. From the field to the extraction and drying plant, all the way through the, the, the scientists, uh, you know, testing it the, um, and learning about stop palmetto to uh, a pharmaceutical grade extraction plant of which there are a number of companies in Florida and two European countries or two European companies that do it properly in my, uh, in my opinion. Now, what does a patient, or, and I give these type of lectures to physicians as well, what can you do if you believe in nutraceuticals and you want a supplemental metal extract that you know is going to be safe, but it also could potentially be effective? What you'd really like to know, as I'm finding out here, is that the berries are coming from the proper place, Florida or Georgia, South Georgia and that they have been picked ripe, that they've gone through proper drying and sorting, uh, and they've had the supplemental extract, uh, or supplemental oils and fatty acids, et cetera, uh, extracted proper way, and that it meets the criteria uh, of a sort of pharmaceutical grade product. So you can get general information from Health Canada or the FDA, but unfortunately when I tried to do that, it was unhelpful. So who do you call when you have a, a question about nutraceuticals? Well, it's not the Ghostbusters. For me, it's Dr. Mark Moyad. And he pointed me to a number of websites to help me decide whether this product that the patient's interested in is bona fide. So he, you know, he was the one that suggested that we have some sort of certificate of analysis. And there's various companies that do this. 
the USP or the United States Pharmacopeia. We'd like to see it analyzed independently and look like what it should be. Uh, there's a number that have been identified and, and more or less banned because they contain pharmaceuticals. We might be able to find that at the Banned Substances Control Group. Very uh, helpful because those products could still be on the market because there's no enforcement. Consumer Labs and NSF International do uh, uh, independent analyses for companies that want to know what's in the product. And you can find, you know, if you see one of these symbols on the product and it's bonafide that there should be there and you go to their websites and it's there, then you know that you are getting a real saw palmetto extract from Florida or South Georgia that meets the criteria that you are looking for in a nutraceutical. So what else can you do? Well, you understand the issue. And the best way to understand the issue is perhaps going to a lecture like the one I'm giving now or, or reading articles that uh, myself, Mark and others write. Now for physicians, I like them to keep up with the literature. That's not really necessary as a patient consumer, but it's important that you stay away from um, bottles of nutrients that contain lists of uh, food additives and supplements and nutraceuticals uh, because you know that there really has been no uh, idea of looking at the dosing of those, whether it's going to be effective, side effects, whether or not they're interacting with each other. Keep an eye out for adverse events. So in fact, if you're starting to have side effects, it's always the possibility that this was a spiked product. Less so if you do your due diligence, as I uh, explain, when you consider only using products that have undergone independent evaluation, product testing, and validation. It's also nice to use products, not only supplemental, but others that have undergone uh, clinical trials, best ones are randomized uh, controlled trials, showing that it's either as good as what's out there in the pharmaceutical industry, or as good or better than placebo. It would be great if we could all lobby Health Canada or the FDA. As I said, I'm Canadian, so for me, everything is Health Canada, but in the United States, it's the FDA, to be more proactive in testing, but not only in testing, which they do, but enforce the dietary supplement industry. I believe one of the best things that could happen, and it would not increase the price, um, would be for uh, nutraceuticals, the important nutraceuticals, such as saw palmetto, be enveloped under the envelope of a prescription uh, medication. In other words, it's prescribed by physicians uh, and it's been, we know it's been tested and has to only from laboratories that would undergo FDA approval certification and whatnot. So if any of you guys are interested in seeing some of the uh, motorcycle uh, rides that I have done, the uh, photographers and video videographers were the same ones that did the Anthony Bourdain US segments of his uh, cooking show. Uh, they produced a, a video and they gave me a little snapshot of some of the motorcycle trip that I had uh, with two drones, four GoPros, and two photographers in, in moving uh, camera vehicles. So the top one, you can see that. If you're interested in actually seeing the video uh, of this particular adventure through uh, following the supply line, it was available on late night TV for six months. I'm not sure how many people watched it on one of the uh, health channels but it's now available on YouTube. You can either do this or look up my name and saw Palmetto. If, if you only like print, you can wait until my uh, article comes out, uh, travelogue article comes out in that very important uh, magazine, Motorcycle Mojo uh, in several months. So thank you very much for letting me uh, tell you about this motorcycle adventure with a purpose. Thank you. You know what this? You know what this is, Doctor Nickel. I can call you Curtis because I've known you thirty years. You, this you can is, call me Curtis as long as I can call you Mark. You can call me Mark as long as you can call me whatever you call me for dinner, right? I mean, that, that old saying. But I, you know, how many Saul Palmetto gigs and BPH stuff have we done together? Q and A, and I like that one. I, I think that was one of the better ones because that identifies the problem. But before we before we talk about this, can I can I bring up a few quick things? One is I've changed while you were giving your lecture in deference of you. This is what I did for Dr. Goldenberg. I put on my one piece of material that I own that says Canada. 
Gee, what a well, shock. It has a hockey player on it. Well, I appreciate that. If, if I had known that, I have a little pin I could have put on my lapel, which has an American and Canadian flag on it. <laughs> do, you, do you remember when you went to the conference in person several years ago? We had Celine Dion there. I mean, it was uh, not the real Celine Dion, and she did not the everybody song. knew that. No. But uh, and and I I was uh, I was fooled for about uh, ten seconds. But uh, yeah, <laughs> she was a, she was a good uh, double. She was really good. So, in deference of Doctor Nickel and all of his work for so many decades, I'm going to during this entire program with him wear my Canadian zip up. Now that is deference. So. I want to ask you about something before we go into this whole salt palmetto BPH topic. First of all, what a lot of people are, may or may not know in the audience is that you're one of the world's leading experts in this category. So if you lived in Europe, if you lived anywhere in the world, South Africa, if you lived Kenya, we would try to get a hold of you because this is what you do. But since you're in Canada, I have a few Canadian questions for you, okay? You got the it. Canadian healthcare system, first of all, are you enjoying it? Do you do you like it? Because we always hear in the states that you know healthcare is free, and here's the ongoing joke we make in the states: we say, if you think healthcare is expensive now, just wait until it's free. That's what we say as a joke. But the truth is, you know, you're covered for catastrophic events, and it seems. Can you just give us, you've been with the system now decades. Can you give us a quick pros and cons of the system for those of us who live on the border and nearby? Right. Well, I wonder that state was a great statement that you put up there. I just wonder how true that statement is. If you took out all the middlemen between the hospitals, doctors, physicians, and nurses, the managers, the insurance companies, the CEOs of health care companies that are making hundreds of millions of dollars um, and, and the bonuses that they receive for cutting down costs, um, but increasing profits. Now, take all those out. And, and um, I, I know everybody's worried about government bureaucracy, and there are issues with it for a major point. But for physicians in Canada, we get paid less per procedure, but we get paid for everything. For patients, they pay less. Actually, they pay nothing for procedures and to see a doctor. Uh, and is the healthcare as good? Well, if you look at the, if you look at healthcare based on the number of MRIs, CAT scans or robots, we are way behind because we're way, way behind. If you look at waiting lists for things, critical things like cardiovascular surgery, heart surgery, we are behind. But if you look at a particular heart patient in the United States and Canada, and you look three months later, although my US friend will get in and have a surgery faster because he's so sick, more of them uh, die during or after surgery, where in Canada, more die or before surgery. So the three months is exactly the same. You have the same chance to be alive. Let's look at uh, uh, maternal mortality. That's a great way of looking at healthcare. Uh, so if you look at the mothers who survived childbirth, we, you know, the United States is one of the poorest indicators for that in the world, almost reaching third world proportions. In Canada, we're one of the best. Mm. Uh, and that's primarily because of the difference. If you're rich or have private insurance in the United States, you get the best health care in the world. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but if you're not, you're privately um, employed, not employed or poor, uh, an immigrant uh, or, or whatever, you're going to have a real problem accessing and getting really good health care. Canada, everybody gets the same. So what happens is overall in the population, the health care improves in this type of system. And actually, the costs go down. Mm. Our percentage of uh, GPD for healthcare is significantly less than the United States. So is that statement correct or, or not? So are patients happy? Well, if I was a patient, I would like to get my MRI tomorrow, and I'd like to have my heart surgery next week. That doesn't happen in Canada the same way it does in the United States. 
Um, and so, you know, patients can become unhappy. If I go to an emergency department, we now have not enough nurses and not enough physicians. I could wait several hours in the emergency department for help, sometimes many hours. And I might get sicker while I'm in the emergency department. If I'm a physician and I do a procedure to see a patient, I look with envy at my colleagues in the United States who make so much more money per procedure. So I have to work harder to get the same type of quality of, of life. But in reality, in the United States, my, uh, my friends who are in the medical profession are working harder than they ever have been. They're on a treadmill to try and keep up their lifestyle to where they are. Patients are in fact waiting for investigations. In inner cities, they're waiting in emergency departments and not getting the health they require. And I know that waiting lists now are expanding in the United States to, um, you know, to lengths that I never would have thought was possible several decades ago. Hmm. So is it better healthcare? If I was a um, rich or had a very good insurance policy, I would say the US medical system is the best for me personally. If I am an average uh, citizen, I think sort of a social medicine system is good for not only for society, uh, but for uh, me as a patient. Uh, even though there's going to be unhappiness both on patients and physicians in both systems. Okay, I like that. I you know, it's always funny when people say that we don't have a socialized system. I mean, you know, if you look at Medicare, if you look at the military, I mean, it is very much socialized, and we have this private component, and people are happy with that. I'm not saying which side of the fence I'm on, but I just wanted to get your perspective after all these decades. But you also are one of the world's authorities in prostatitis, which you're going to talk about after this discussion. And so people must be coming to see you from all parts of the world, including the United States. So I guess that people need to come see you or come to your clinic or come see your colleagues. They figure it out, right? The payments. <laughs> well, here, here's, here's the problem. Uh, okay. A number of years ago, when I started my prostatitis clinic, we had it running. It was really running well. We were doing very successfully. I made, was it a mistake or was it, uh, I don't know. I sent around a letter because in those days, I don't know if you remember, uh, it was faxes and letters we sent to each other. This was two decades ago. I sent around a letter to all the urologists in Ontario and said, I now have successfully run prostatitis clinic. I'd be willing to see your patients. Within one week, I had 350 new referrals I had to put a, a stop to that because uh, it took me three years to get through that backlog because my prostatitis clinic was only two half days a week. I had to have CBPH, prostate cancer, all the other things we see in urology because I had to operate to make a living. Prostatitis, you don't make a living. Now, as far as internationally is concerned, it was kind of fun when I was in my early part of career. Rich patients would fly in their private jets to Kingston and come and see me. Americans would uh, come up. I had uh, supplemental New York state uh, insurance so I could see American patients. I had special disposition from our Canadian insurance program, see international. Then what happened is the uh, Canadian insurance program stopped insuring us to see international patients. Mm. So all of a sudden, those that were coming from Asia and Saudi Arabia had to stop. Second thing is that... Uh, uh, Patients from the United States, uh, you know, I had to have insurance and that insurance just skyrocketed. So I was ended up seeing American patients only to pay for my insurance. Now, that's interesting. The more, the harder I worked, the less I made. So I had to stop that. And then I went to sort of a, a web-based uh, referral and I hated it. I hated mm. talking to patients uh, web-based and it didn't really work. So basically, I reverted back to my geographic area, 500,000 referral area, and I had a very comfortable time. I, you know, over the time, I saw 3,500 individual patients that entered my clinical trials. So I had enough patients to do the research, had enough patients to take care of, and didn't need everybody else. It was, it was kind of, it was um, scary. And there's a lot of stories in that, too, because the people who get prostatitis are sometimes the most uptight richest people in the world, politicians and businessmen, and they would give anything to have a magic pill or something to, to take it away. It, it, it is kind of interesting. And I've got some interesting stories that 
I, we don't have time to, no, to we, talk we, about uh, uh, at this at this type of. Juncture. No, but it's interesting, and we do have a prostatitis segment coming up. But the last thing I'm going to ask you is: you're the only person, you're the only teacher I know, and I say this as a compliment that has traveled more than I probably have giving lectures and teaching. And off the top of your head, is there a country that you have not taught in during your career? Because every time I would travel somewhere, Australia, New Zealand, uh, places in Africa, I, I don't know where, they would always tell me, Dr. Nichols been here already. Yeah, so I've been invited to give lectures in 57 countries. There's a lot more than that. I've been to 68 myself. Some of them were vacation or I took off many of them uh, for, for many times. I've given been invited lectures at meetings or um, state meetings or university as a visiting professor in, I think, 37 of the United States and every Canadian province. So let me just go through the history of this, because you were involved in this other one. This was a, the, one of the largest. Here's the STEP trial. It publishes the New England Journal of Medicine, and it shows that Saul Palmetto at a standard dosage, which I think the dosage you recommend is 320 milligrams, correct? Yep. Okay. It doesn't work any better than placebo. It's not worse than placebo. It's not better than placebo, but it's the same. Then this is a, a government-funded trial. Is that correct? This was the government. This is the, the CAMU. Yep. I call it the CAMU trial. I know it's CAMUS or Complementary Alternative Medicine for Urologic Symptoms. This was a great trial. You were an author. They went out 18 months. Correct me at any point where I'm wrong. And they used elevated dosage, 360, doubled that, and then went 360 more and didn't show any benefit over placebo. So if I'm looking at these two major US studies and I'm hearing Dr. Nickel, I'm going, wait, this is not shown any better than placebo, then why do you still favor it? Because of the European data or because of what you said that if you follow the quality control, you don't see the results they see in this trial? What's your summary again of, of why you still talk about it? Well, I can do two things. One is I can tell a, a story that may or may not be true, but I suspect maybe a case of why we we followed up the Camus trial, totally unsubstantiated, and I will get into trouble telling that story. Or I can tell you that there's a possibility that we may not have been using Trusa Palmetto in some of those trials or not properly extracted. Uh, or there's, there's, there's a number of other uh, possibilities, but one of the things is clear is that those two studies, which were really well done, I mean, I was involved in them, I'm a scientist, I made sure that they were well done. Uh, those two studies were negative. And that led to our American guidelines and Canadian guidelines not to use Sapometto. However, you know, when you actually review the, the world literature, you know, and there's 55 other clinical trials. Every single one of them were positive by the indices that they did. By the way, there's a lot more trials than that that were positive, but they were so poorly done that you couldn't really extract the data. Now, one of the reasons we didn't know about all these studies is about 30 of them were, in, were published in a non-English language. Mm. And so we were never, you know, in European countries and Eastern European countries and Asia, we did not know the, the you know, the potential benefits uh, of reading these papers because they were never translated into English. So we just usually say we reviewed the English literature, which is much less. But when you look at the, the uh, product, and I say permixin because I'm allowed to, because it's the only product, you know. Uh, now, there is another cell palmetto in Europe now that's being uh, authorized for use, but permixin is the one that I know, uh, and but it's hexane extracted in a pharmaceutical uh, grade way, the same way you do pharmaceutical hexane. Uh, uh, chemistry, and it's prescribed. So patients receive the right amount, followed for the right time. In those studies, using this particular product, they were all, all the studies were positive. When you look at a meta-analysis, there was a difference. Now, was it a big difference? It's not the same as surgery, not even the same as uh, an alpha blocker. But when they did one of the comparative studies, it was reasonably well done, blindly either took finasteride, which is Proscar, or saw palmetto in six months and 12 months, they had the same benefit. Now you can argue there should have been a placebo group there because maybe placebo would have had the same benefit, uh, but there's many out there who believe that proscar or finasteride is uh, placebo. And many are worried about the side effects of those particular drugs, you know, long-term uh, syndromes that, um, you know, have been associated with it. Yeah. So um, 
I, we wanted to, you know, the, the, the panel that we had was not official. It, it um, my, myself and, uh, oh, the fellow from uh, New York, who I just forget his name. We, we um, had the panel, some people who we asked to be on it, who were Camus investigators said, no, the, uh, the story is done, closed everything after Camus. And we really don't want to be involved with South Palmetto again. Yet why, why are men continuing to take truckloads of South Palmetto, Serrano Repens extracts? There has to be something for it. What about the history? You know, wh why did uh, Ponce de Leon think it was so good? Why did the Seminole, uh, um, Seminole tribe in uh, central Florida believe that it actually enhanced their urinating and their sexual function? Why did people survive on it? Why did all the pharmaceutical companies congregate in Florida uh, for supplemental extracts in the uh, 1900s to about 1913? And they all had products on the market. You know, there has to be a backstory to it. Yeah, I mean, the, the data in Europe, if you read, look at the data on permixin, I can't get it in the United States. It's a prescription in Europe. If you look at the data, there are a lot of urologists that absolutely believe in it. In fact, we had a, we had a mutual friend who did a one-year study up against Tamsulose and uh, Flomax, and they showed equivalency. There was no placebo, Correct. it was European urology. And so you're seeing all this positive data. You're going, well, how is this possible? How is all this positive data happening around the world, but not in the United States? Um, so let me let me just ask further. If I play, if I play devil's advocate, I say, well, you were a part of these that you did these great studies, and it didn't work any better than placebo. And okay, I understand why some people feel that way. However, if I want to play angel's advocate, let me ask you something I've never asked you before. If you're recruiting a person in the United States to be in a clinical trial of salt palmetto or a nutraceutical for BPH. Sometimes there's what's called a recruitment bias, right? Which means you're, you're, you're attracting a group of people that really are excited to try something naturally. Now, if they're also given a placebo, they don't know if they're given the placebo or salt palmetto. So what you sometimes see in trials is a large placebo response rate because people are so excited to be in the study. Did you see a fairly significant placebo response rate in the trials that you were involved in? Because it seemed like there was something there. A lot of people were getting a result and maybe part of that was a performance bias. Well, you know, that's that's one way of differentiating. I still do like uh, comparing products to placebo, but in these type of things, you're absolutely right uh, that we did see a big placebo response, which uh, was higher than that, that we worked out in our, what we call power statement to determine how many people we needed to show efficacy. Yeah, uh, I would have thought, and that's one of the things about the study is that the study did last 18 months. Usually what happens over time is a placebo response kind of wanes as people, you know, not as enthusiastic about it as they were because they're not noticing the symptoms improvement. But you're right, that bias is still there in three months, five years, whatever. Uh, now, is there anything wrong with the placebo response? Let's say saw palmetto gives you this much benefit. And you like nutraceuticals because you want to avoid pharmaceuticals. And um, the placebo gives you this much. So all of a sudden, you're this much better. You're up less at night by one time. You're usually up yeah. four times a night. Now you're up three times a night. Is that a lot? No, but it gets you sleep a little bit. It usually takes you a minute and a half to empty your bladder. Now it takes you a, a, a minute and five seconds. That's an improvement. And it feels better. The flow feels better. You're not... Maybe you're not dribbling a lot at the end. Your bladder feels empty. Is that a, a, a problem? Uh, I don't think so. I, I, I think sort of the, the, the uh, white coat placebo effect is real. It has physiological benefits. And if we add a nutraceutical or supplemental product that's safe on top of that, what do we got to lose? We save that patient the, uh, the potential harms of pharmaceuticals. Uh, that we're also they also miss the maybe improved benefits, but they also perhaps are not going to have the perceived and real uh, problems that we see with surgery, even minimally invasive surgery. There is some concept too that some men believe, and I don't know if it's true, and we've never really been able to prove it, that taking supplements like supplemental may slow down the prostate uh, enlargement 
aging natural process so that perhaps you can avoid or postpone surgery or pharmaceuticals in the future. And we've never proven that. And, you know, uh, we were hoping that Camus would show that in 18 months, but it didn't. But it, but it did show no safety signals. Correct. So I that's think pretty, that's pretty that's well, pretty, that's, to that's say a pretty big deal. That's a pretty yes. big deal. Yes. And so let's go through then in your checklist in your head. You're saying that this can be taken by itself for some of your patients. You're, are you also saying it can potentially be combined with other agents, the alpha blockers, finasteride? Do te- can you combine it with something else your doctor is giving you uh, for BPH? Or are you saying well, just take it by to, itself? Yeah, that's a good question because you have to really look at it theoretically. So if you're going, your, your um, physician uh, is prescribing... Uh, uh, dual therapy because your symptoms are quite severe and he prescribes alpha blockers and finasteride or dutesteride, one of the five ARIs. And you decide after looking it up, that you don't want any of those side effects of five ARIs. The side effects, you know, being uh, sexual, usually re- reduced ejaculation, uh, loss of libido and impotence. You don't even want to risk that being an issue. So you tell your um, physician, I don't want that but I'm willing to try this other 5-alpha reductase. It only works in the prostate, the sal palmetto extract. Now, is it is it going to work as well as finasteride or detesteride? No, it doesn't, except we have that permixin study that shows it, it, it does. So is a combination of tamsulosin and um, sal palmetto extract going to be effective? We have no idea. Uh, because the studies have only been done with alpha blockers and 5-ARIs. But in fact, they were done with dozotaxel and finasteride. No, 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 not dozotaxel, doxazazine, which is another alpha blocker that is not tamsulosin. Which used to be Cardura, right? Right. So how do we know tamsulosin is going to do the same effect as Cardura, which is a more general alpha blocker, and tamsulosin is a more specific one, to the prostate and lower urinary. So we don't know. So basically a, a lot of science, it comes down to, to an art. And the art is balancing probabilities. Probabilities of success versus the risks involved. And so a good physician with a patient with informed consent will balance those probabilities and come to some sort of decision because on some things we have no evidence. We infer the evidence like you and I just did based, you know, on the MTOP study. So you're saying 320 milligrams a day uh, is the standard dosage. You may or may not be able to combine it with the other medications. It depends on what you how, how things are going, working with but definitely doctor. not, but definitely not with finasteride or dutasteride. Okay. Definitely, definitely not with not. finasteride and dutasteride. Um, that was the five alpha reductase inhibitors, but with the alpha blockers, possibly like we mentioned some of them, right? Tamsulose. I, 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 don't see any harm in that. MTOPS would suggest that it, it might add benefit, but don't forget Sao Palmetto um, generally has a fraction of the 5-alpha reductase inhibition that the 5-ARIs do. And if it happens, it happens in the prostate. So you don't measure it. Your PSA doesn't change. Prostate size doesn't change. Uh, and your uh, circulating to hydrotestosterone doesn't change. Is there any reason? Oh, sorry. Is there any reason to go higher than 320 milligrams a day? If if it's not working at 320, after several months, you just go, okay, I'm going to give it up here. Do you want to work on something else with my doctor? Or do you see any reason to dose escalate? No. And the main reason is number one, is that in Camus, we did have the three doses, you know, escalating doses and didn't see any benefit as we escalated the dose. I, I, again, I, I don't think you, you know, like in many nutraceuticals and supplements, increasing the dose sometimes could have, uh, you know, unrecognized or unforeseen consequences. And that's yeah. the same for a lot of vitamins, minerals, supplements. So uh, I would suggest any patient that if they're going to try it, they, they stay at the recommended dose. And then the other recommendation, obviously, if you're going to recommend it, you would recommend a group or working with a product that has gone through some third-party certification certificate of analysis, as you mentioned, right? Because right. we don't, because I, what, I, what I can't emphasize enough to the audience watching here, 
is it's really, it's fairly easy in Canada and the United States to me to certify a product for authenticity when it comes to a vitamin and a mineral like vitamin D. That's easy. But what you notice when you look on the shelves is there's not as many herbal products. That's why when I teach, I always say herbals are a different animal. I want people, I always say to the students, repeat after me, herbals are a different animal because you don't see a lot of people with quality control seals because herbals are more complicated. So the other, so the, your last point is so important that you must be recommending that if someone uses salt palmetto, they go look for that third party USP seal or they just look for some place that has been tested by a third party, right? Correct. And, and, you know, I was at a loss when I started to, to look at all this, too. And I came back very confused. It was only, you know, when I asked for your advice and you steered me towards this type of uh, approach that I realized there was a way out. There was a way to actually rationalize uh, being able to suggest to a patient that it won't have be any harm and it might be a benefit. And yeah. that's using the approach that, you know, basically, uh, Mark, that you provided for me. No, I appreciate that. That's very kind. But then you did this, but then you showed me something else. I always learned from your lecture. You brought up the idea that they did this extraction and a number of them contained palm oil. And you said you were concerned. I, I know why I'm concerned about that. Tell the audience why you're concerned about palm oil uh, being in a lot of extracts, not really the Sol Palmetto Permixin type combination product. Well, as, as a clinician, uh, you know, who who wants my patient, who, who, who wants to take salt palmetto extract, and there is some benefit to it, I wanna make sure that they actually are taking the salt palmetto extract and not other oils. So the one day I was down there, I was flabbergasted in the particular lab that they were testing, um, that there was palm oil in the products they were testing. And that was, they were testing uh, products from uh, out to, bought on the internet outside the country. Uh, palm oil, as far as I know, isn't the oil that I want to ingest. You probably know as much or more than me about it, but I don't want my patients thinking they're getting salt palmetto and get palm oil with, you know, particularly uh, uh, known deleterious side effects or, or, uh, or reactions and, and consequences. But plus, plus it's not, from what I'm interpreting from you and doing all this analysis, whether it's whether it's mass spec, GC, whatever the analysis is, this is not the combination of fatty acids and sterols that's been showing the efficacy in Europe and you want to mimic that. Palm oil, you know, I understand people use it. When I was in Malaysia, it's very popular, but, you know, up to a half, almost 50% of it is saturated fat. So this leads me to a thought I'm going to ask you. If you ever, and you can just mention my name at the bottom, if you ever, so you're dealing with so many students now as a professor emeritus uh, at your school, and you teach and you interact with a lot of people excited about nutraceuticals, when are they gonna do a study of a number of herbal products like this, say four or five of them, and just show the impact on cardiovascular markers, bad cholesterol, good cholesterol, triglycerides? Because if you're throwing in, the theory is, if you're throwing in a lot of high fat, high saturated oils to mimic salt palmetto, ultimately that can't be heart healthy. So I'm just saying that if anyone watching out there, what I didn't see in my career was enough studies of, you know, when you're using some of these bogus products, you know, what changes are happening to your cardiovascular risk markers? And I just don't see enough of those papers. And I know I went off on a tangent and I apologize, but that's what happens when you and I end up talking. Well, have you ever played whack-a-mole? As soon as you <laughs> hit down one, another one pops up. You get yeah. down, you get down two pop up. And that's yeah. the problem in the herbal field is, number one, which one are you going to hit? Like, if, if you could do a trial that costs a million, you get a million dollars to do one trial, what product are you going to go after? Who's going to make the product? What's going yeah. to be the concentration? What's going to be the supply chain? And even yeah. when you do that, what? how do you know that other products that follow are not going to use your findings to uh, substantiate their claims? And they don't even have anything that looks like your product, whack-a-mole. I have two other types of questions for you and then we'll then we'll call it a day because we've gone over like we always do and then I'll let you yep. do your next lecture. Is there a problem here? Should we be, you, you recognize this, this is the International Prostate Symptom Score and there's also the AUA Symptom Index and you use this, you use this as a validated scoring system uh, in the CAMUS trial. People use either this or the AUA score, right? And patients fill this out. Why? Why doesn't everybody watching this 
who thinks they might be dealing with BPH just fill this out and take it to their doctor so that it's already filled out by the time they meet with their physician, as opposed to getting it in the physician's office, then filling it out. Am, am I wrong or should, should this should be on the website? Not necessarily. Uh, in, in our clinic, they fill it up. The nurse gives it to them the minute the referral comes in uh, with BPH. So when I see them, uh, that's already completed. Uh, now, there are issues. I have major issues with the IPSS and AUA symptom scores. They were developed for you know clinical trials. I, I think the questions uh, asking frequency of symptoms uh, are, are not always as important as severity of symptoms. Mm. So uh, frequency works well for uh, nocturia. How many times yeah. do you get up at night? But how, you know how many, uh, how much of the time do you have post void dribbling? Try and answer that. Is it all the time? Half the time? You know, um, you know, a little bit, a lot. You know, it, it's all timed. It should be. How much does post void uh, dribbling bother you? How much does urinary urgency bother you? Those are better clinical questions. It's just that they can't change the same way as um, uh, the frequency questions when you're doing a clinical trial. The, the, this differentiates patients' uh, improvement in a different way than clinical. I, I think sometimes the BPH impact index, where basically you ask the patient how much each of those symptoms bother them, is of more clinical relevance when I decide on treatment plans than this score. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. But, you know, I we, we talk to a lot of people in advocacy who don't, don't even know that this even exists. I understand it has its limitations, but I, I was just wondering if you thought there were any cons to just not making it available so people understood they could talk about these kind of things with their doctor. Yeah. Well, a lot of physicians, a lot of urologists don't even use it. They, yeah. They, you know, so. Yeah. I would be doing a disservice not to quickly go through in my head other over-the-counter products for prostate enlargement. Um, we have plenty of speakers. I'm going to talk about the interventions and the drugs, and we mentioned those briefly. But there are other products that like to say that, you know, they have the data of salt palmetto, things like Pygeum, uh, beta sitosterol. There's other products that people utilize. Are you suggesting that you use, if you're going to try these products, you don't use them in combination, you use them one at a time, or do you suggest in combination? Where do you put your head around all these other BPH products that have some limited data, but should they be combined, not combined? Where, help me, help me, oh, Yoda, okay. what I do with oh. this. So I, you know, when we were looking at the, the different products, the one that had the, the uh, next level of evidence was Pigeum Africanum. Yeah. And we were going to use that in the Camus or uh, Camu trial. But in fact, as I told you once before, and you didn't know, that the reason we couldn't use it was we found out that it was being unethically harvested. It comes from the uh, inner bark of the Africanum Pigeanum tree, uh, primarily in Madagascar and on the... Uh, and on the uh, mainland of Africa in that particular area. And instead of doing what they're supposed to do, harvest it like they do cork in Portugal, is take some bark out and then wait seven years and they can reharvest it and reharvest it. What they were doing was cutting down the trees. So yeah. we have a worldwide uh, shortage of Pigeum Africanum. And I really wonder if the product that says Pigeum Africanum really is coming from Madagascar from a tree that the, all the forests have basically been chopped down for this particular product. These days, we shouldn't be drop, drop, dropping trees for a product that could be harvested ethically, just a lot more costly. Stinging nettle, again, it's um, sort of a, a wild plant, very difficult to find and to, to do. How is that processed in the different companies? One company does it differently. Every company does it differently. So how do you know the one that was in the clinical trial that purported to show efficacy in 11 men was actually a benefit? Uh, different nuts like peanuts. Uh, you know, uh, there was a product that really was there based on peanuts. That was going to be the big product. And it was based on just anecdotal evidence. Multiple men saying that this product helped them. Um, yeah. Rye pollen extract. Right. If extracted pro properly, does appear to have anti-inflammatory benefit. An anti-inflammatory benefit will, it will improve prostatitis symptoms and it will improve uh, BPH symptoms. But again, there's only one product in the world that is uh, has a rye pollen extract 
that is in the European Union certification process and is being uh, made using uh, pharmaceutical principles in a properly accredited uh, factory. So, you know, all the other rye pollen extracts, how are they doing? They're just going out and getting some rye grass and grinding it up and, and, and doing what? You know, like yeah. you have no idea because the Wild West out there. So that's why I only recommend the one with the best evidence. So supplemental has 58 studies. Three of them were negative, 55 were positive. The ones that were negative were some of the best studies that were done. You have to, you have to look at it yourself and see whether you want to try it. But it has the, the most evidence, the best evidence. And it has a number of production facilities with ver uh, verifiable supply lines. So you can actually determine where the berry or, or the product came from, where it ended up, how it was extracted, and then it was validated. The only one that we have really in, the, in this uh, field is sa palmetto. So are we gonna use, uh, decrease the dose of that by dumping other stuff in the same pill? No. I, I don't think that's a good idea. Okay. So before we leave, then I'm picking up a bottle at CVS or another place. Cause by the way, CVS in the United States has a program called tested to be trusted. Their products are all tested now. Just they get third-party certification. I don't know why they don't advertise that more. It never made sense to me. So you're looking at the label. It says the ingredients. What am I reading? Okay. I'm looking for third-party certification, 320 milligrams a day. What specific words am I looking on the ingredients list before we leave today? You're primarily looking for sapa metal and that, that dose, yeah. 320. Some of them have 360, but uh -huh. you're going to look for a dose like that in the and it's you know verifiable. Uh, it would really nice to have some sort of um, independent, you know, like the, a reference or something that you can look up that's associated with it, package insert or on the package or one of those stamps from one of the uh, the uh, laboratories that uh, you provided me with. If you yeah. see that, I, I think it can be re pretty well reassured. And what you don't want to see, and they do it because uh, it turns out it sells more product by adding more stuff to it. It must work yeah. better because there's more stuff to it. You really want, and, and most companies that do that have two products. They have the pure saw palmetto, and then they have the saw palmetto uh, baited with all this other crap. But are you telling your patients, because you, I've seen you give this in a lecture, are you saying, okay, they're looking at 320, are they, they're looking for a certain percentage of fatty acids and sterols? Because yes, the number yeah, never are, but, but, but but they can get that with any of the other oils. Okay. So, and so one of the products that um, Margaret in the research laboratory showed me that she had done several weeks before was a really interesting product from a country I won't disclose that was bought on the internet. And it was using one of the oils, and I forget which one it was, but one of the, the plant oils, not saw palmetto, but to make it look exactly like a real saw palmetto with the fingerprint they were putting in the, the other fatty acids made in the laboratory. Uh, so they were lab produced to get the fingerprint. So okay. that's something you can only find uh, by doing really sophisticated testing that you know we don't have available. I didn't have available when we were doing ours. All we could do is look at it. We couldn't tell you know, whether it was plant-based or chemical-based. So you're we're more excited about the third party certification than you are about the the mention of fatty acids and sterols basically now, right? Well, the, the, well, the third party will uh, will validate that. Yeah, they'll validate. The U, U, USP and I forget what it is, but it has to be something like 80, 85 percent uh, fatty acids. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? That could just be palm oil has eighty five percent fatty acids. Yeah, well, hopefully they're hopefully they're submitting the individual fatty acids that were used in the permixin trials that everybody holds to a different standard in Europe. Yep. And anyway, so but but you've been happy. I mean, you've been using this for most of your career. I'm glad that you've been happy with it. I'm glad you're setting a new standard. Um, well, actually, Mark, I didn't. After Camus. After I, Camus, really. When patients came to me and they were on cell 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 palmetto. I suggested to him that it was not going to do any good. And maybe they should discontinue it. Not a chance, Dr. Nickel, this is working. If I miss a couple of days, it makes a big difference. So, and, and patients come in, well, Dr. Nickel, I know you prescribed finasteride and tamsulosin, but I instead went to my natural food store and got this. And I think it's working, Dr. Nickel, and I really don't want any of these pharmaceutical chemicals. So that's what got a lot of our physicians saying, okay, if, if we don't take, you know, if, if we can't beat them, let's join them. 
And if we're going to join them, let's make sure our patients who want to take them are actually taking something that's worthwhile and worth paying for. Interesting. I thought you were using salt palmetto for decades. I didn't realize it was after that. <laughs> well, then on that trial, but, so I was a senior author on the 2010 guidelines and yeah. 2016 updated guidelines. And I was pretty adamant that the guidelines would not recommend salt palmetto for the management of BPH lots of men. And that's in print. But my name is the, as the head. I think we covered all of this in terms of over-the-counter stuff for BPH. I, uh, Unless I missed something or there's something else you want to you want to talk about, we, I was going to move on to prostatitis when and let you give that lecture in the next few minutes. Does that sound good? I can do that. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you for covering okay. the subjects that I've been doing this meeting for over a decade that we have not ever really covered in detail, but yet so much of the population in America around the world is either using it or thinking about using it. So hopefully this gave them an objective overview of if they want to use it, work with their doctor. And these are some of the parameters to look for. And if they don't want to use it, well, that's their choice too. Maybe they think it doesn't work better than placebo. Other people think it does work better than placebo. Hopefully we spelled it all out. I'll see you in a minute for your next lecture. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Bye now. I really appreciate the chance to talk about salt palmetto extract and prostate disease. For decades now, I've been involved and interested in complementary approaches, uh, vitamins, minerals, supplements, nutraceuticals, herbals for the treatment of uh, functional diseases in urology, inflammation, pain, urinary tract infection, and prostate disease. Uh, one I've become very interested in is the palm, palm, saw palmetto extract or the extract from the Serona repens plant. This plant grows wild in Florida and South Georgia. It's picked in uh, August to September and the picking crews follow it from South Florida to North Florida to South Georgia. Uh, when the ripe berries are picked, they're sent immediately to the uh, sorting, cleaning and drying plant and then subsequently to an extraction plant. And the essential oils and fatty acids are extracted using a carbon dioxide type high pressure uh, system, which extracts the, uh, the product that we want and leaves behind all, all the rest, including any residual. There's no residual because the CO2 just dissipates. So um, we did talk about BPH. I have a presentation which uh, I just presented and might be available um, through this particular meeting. My personal search for the elusive wild, wild saw palmetto berry and the story behind saw palmetto and its management in BPH. I think it's a fascinating uh, story and it gave me a chance to combine my love of motorcycle adventures with my significant clinical research interest in the management of BPH using complementary therapy. So in this particular shorter lecture, we're gonna look at the prostatitis story and BPH or and prostate cancer story and any role saw palmetto might have to play. So let's look at um, uh, prostatitis. So prostatitis is really relates to pelvic pain presumed to be in the prostate. We know uh, from the prostate, we know now that in most cases, this is not an infectious disease. Only about 10% is it a bacterial infection that resolved with antibiotics. The other 90% of men who develop chronic prostatitis symptoms, that's pelvic and pelvic floor pain, dysuria or pain in voiding, pain on ejaculation, pain in the testicles, suprapubic area and penis. Men that present with uh, you know, the complex of these symptoms are quite common. In fact, one of the studies that were, were done uh, out of Harvard a number of years ago was in healthcare professionals, uh, doctors, dentists, veterinarians, uh, male nurses, and people that should know what prostatitis is. And it, they came to the conclusion that one in four men will develop symptoms of prostatitis sometime in their lifetime. We followed up with a study uh, locally several de decades ago on a county by county basis. And basically we looked at suburban uh, city and rural uh, areas. And we found that the prevalence of men with at least some prostatitis symptoms was around 9%. It's also that one in 10 patients in the course of a year will have prostatitis-like symptoms. For the most part, 
they're self-limited, they might last a day, they're nothing of consequence, but about a third of them uh, commented to the family doctor that their symptoms might be bothering them. Those are usually men that had the symptoms for more than three months. And a third of those ended up seeing a uro urologic uh, specialist. Now, we've learned from a number of studies, and this is just one that I've been involved with, is that um, prostate inflammation doesn't predict how severe the symptoms are, but predicts symptom progression in men with a diagnosis of chronic prostatitis and or chronic pelvic pain. This is important to remember when we're start, starting to look at nutraceuticals and herbals that are anti-inflammatory. An early study that we did using a, a medication called rofococcin, you may know it as Viox, showed that this anti-inflammatory COX-2 inhibitor significantly reduced compared to placebo, the impact of prostatitis-like symptoms. Shortly thereafter, this particular medication, Viox was taken off the market because of potential long-term side effects. So we never really got the benefit of that. Now we do know that the extract of Serona repens or saw palmetto uh, does have a mitigating or lessening of the uh, prostatic inflammation when we look at uh, biopsy studies. In other words, hist histological prostate inflammation is reduced with saw palmetto. A number of studies, particularly animal studies, have shown this. Now, if we look across the board at all the prostatitis uh, studies, when we did this particular uh, systematic review and network meta-analysis, we found that none of the medications worked well in the whole population, but some of the medications worked well in individual patients. There was really, when we did that, we looked at multiple, multiple studies, but there were no good studies on South Palmetto at the time. Uh, recently, and this was only a, a number of years ago, uh, it was the published during the COVID period, this uh, study from Asia showing the, uh, the Saranoropin's extract or saw palmetto actually was effective, safe, and clinically superior to placebo for the treatment of chronic prostatitis or chronic pelvic pain sim symptoms. This was very important because it did look like there might be some benefit. Now, what about prostate cancer? Um, saw palmetto extract, herbal therapy for prostate cancer. Do you know, uh, if you look at the science uh, for saw palmetto, this is the ideal candidate to manage prostate uh, cancer. It antagonizes 5-alpha reductase to inhibit intraprostatic dihydrotestosterone production. That should reduce the risk within the prostate of developing a prostate cancer or even treatment of prostate cancer. It inhibits dihydrotestosterone binding to androgen receptors. That should help early prostate cancer. It's anti-inflammatory. And we've come to the realization that inflammation in the prostate as in elsewhere in the body can lead to cancer. And in this case, prostate cancer. We know that patients who are on long-term anti-inflammatories seem to have a protective influence in prostate cancer. As saw palmetto inhibits the expression of COX-2, which is an inflammatory pathway. It inhibits prostate cell growth in the test tube on Petri dishes and in some animal models. It inhibits proliferation and induces apoptosis or death of prostate cells in the epithelium and the stroma, something like we like to see in prostate cancer. It significantly decreases pathological tumor grade and even tumor incidence in a certain high risk mouse prostate cancer, cancer model. And in uh, those mice in another type of model that, that are, are, are uh, stimulated to develop cancer, it inhibits the volume growth of prostate cancer. Well, this is a herbal therapy that if you're trying to design one to be effective in prostate cancer, one would think this would be the case. Well, it didn't turn out to be that way. The first study that came out, well, you know, there's a systemic review, of all the nutritional studies. It supported that a high phytosteroid uh, uh, diet was inversely related to the risk of prostate cancer. So saw palmetto was one of those phytosterols that were used in that particular study. However, in one of the largest study done 
Um, it was sort of like a real world uh, study. And this was done in Washington state in the United States. There was no association in 35,000 plus men who are at the age of over 50 who are at risk for prostate cancer between the use of those with saw palmetto and those without and the risk of prostate cancer development. So there was no correlation in prostate cancer development, no correlation with increasing frequency or duration of use of saw palmetto. In fact, it was a completely negative study and it did not seem that men on saw palmetto had a reduced risk of prostate cancer. Now, what about prevention? Uh, there's no prospective prevention trials using this herbal therapy. None of note, the ones that were, um, were, were done were poor and you can't interpret them. There are none, no trials looking at saw palmetto treatment of men with prostate cancer. There were two studies that looked at saw palmetto in patients who had radiation therapy for prostate cancer and it had no effect. So unfortunately this ideal herbal, when it goes to the real world clinical studies, it doesn't appear to have any significant benefit. So when we look at saw palmetto extract for prostate disease, we have these type of road signs. For lower urinary tract symptoms related to BPH, it appears that it might benefit some men with low to moderate symptoms who are using it instead of watchful waiting. In prostatitis patients, there appears to be uh, enough evidence out there that it possibly could have a role in patients with prostatitis. And because it's safe, it, there's probably no harm in trying. As far as prostate cancer is concerned, there is no good evidence except for theoretical that it has any benefit in the prevention, uh, treatment, or management of prostate cancer. So um, if Mark, you'd like to ask me any questions about saw palmetto for prostate diseases, we've already discussed uh, BPH. Do you have any, uh, um, want to discuss uh, its use in prostatitis or uh, supplements in, uh, for uh, prostate cancer? I'd be happy to answer your questions. Prostatitis, this thing is really unbelievable. Let me just go from the beginning because I want you to educate me and the audience, okay? I decided to do a quick search of prostatitis and I want you to tell me myth or reality as I walk as we walk through these. What people tend to show you on all the websites is there are generally four types of prostatitis. Is that, that, is that correct? No, I can't really read what you're showing me. Well, there's, there, there are. There are four types. Yeah, so basically we have acute prostatitis comes right. straight out of the blue, and it's almost always related to a bacterial infection. And in most cases, we can treat with antibiotics. Then we have the chronic prostatitis. Ab yes. Above 8% of them, these are patients with the symptoms grumble on, they go up and down. But 8% are related to, to a bacteria, and that the inflammation is, and antibiotics work. Then we get the other 90 to 92% of patients with these chronic prostatitis symptoms uh, who we can't grow bacteria and antibiotics don't seem to work. These are the problem cases. Now we can subdivide it in inflammatory, non-inflammatory, but really that's really not that helpful. Clinically, we found. What's, so it's chronic, non, chronic non-bacterial is also called type three, right? Yeah, category type three. We, we tend to call it now uh, chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, because what we further learn is that the majority of men with chronic prostatitis diagnosis may have nothing at all wrong with their prostate and the symptoms that they're experiencing might not be related to the prostate at all. Or it's an innocent bystander that uh, is, is um, the symptoms appear to be perceived to be in the prostate. So if the majority of prostatitis is not from a, a bacteria where you have a PSA increase and this all these traditional things that you memorize in school happen, the majority are chronic non-bacterial, the kind of stuff that you deal with. How in the heck am I supposed to know that's what I've got? For, but if before you want to answer that, why is that the majority of prostatitis? How are all these men walking around with chronic non-bacterial prostatitis? Where is this coming from? Is this the environment? Is this genetics? Is it diet? Why all this prostatitis? Well, it, it's interesting because we don't really understand that, but we believe that what happens is some form of insult happens. That can be an infection, it can be sexual trauma, it can be a sexually transmitted disease, it can be another disease altogether like bowel disease uh, or surgery. Uh, 
And what it does is it triggers an acute reaction. Most of us, we get better with time, medication, treatment uh, within days or weeks. But in susceptible individuals, that can be, like you said, genetic. It can be yeah. anatomic. It could be physiologic as well. Uh, uh, we, we have in that susceptible individual something that propagates not only the inflammation, but the pain and the symptoms. These are further um, influenced and impacted uh, by psychosocial and supertentorial uh, impact on the disease, going both ways. The pain makes you, you you're sort of a little bit crazy, but um, the way you handle the pain can actually make it worse or better. And then through neuroendocrine pathways, um, including immunologic pathways, we end up with this patient with chronic pelvic pain. But then it even becomes worse because through chronic or through spinal crosstalk, the nerves in the pelvis talk to each other, and we end up uh, developing other associated conditions in the pelvis, such as pelvic floor dysfunctional pain, irritable bowel syndrome type symptoms. Uh, orchidinia in the testicles. Then what happens over time through spinal up and down crosstalk through the central nervous system, we can end up more generalized uh, symptoms. And this is also propagated by the neuroendocrine immuno immunologic symptom. And we end up with uh, aggravated back pain. We get temporal mandibular joint pain, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's one of those enigmatic diseases or conditions or syndromes that may start with an isolated infection or trauma in the prostate or prostate area that can have long-term systemic ramifications for the patients. What's the average age of the patients that you were seeing with this condition and how long were they dealing with it on average before you realized that's what they had? I mean, they obviously, because that's the story we always hear, that they go through uh, a circus wheel, they just go through all these different doctors, someone finally picks that up, so what's the average age and how long have people been dealing with it before someone goes, ah, that's it? Okay. So in, in my clinic, the median age is in the low 40s, but it ranges from 18 to 90. Uh -huh. And you see all, all the range. But my clinic is not normal. I'm a tertiary referral center. So by the time the patients come to see me, they've been treated for bacterial prostatitis. They've had antibiotics, anti-inflammatories. They've seen... Um, other urologists, and then finally they come to a tertiary urology clinic, that path uh, can take several years or longer. That's just unbelievable. And then how am I supposed to realize that's what I'm dealing with? I, you know, you, you know about this, the NIH chronic prostatitis symptom index. So you can get this online. It's again, you can fill out this form of what you've been dealing with over the past week, for example, it's a questionnaire. Do you like this questionnaire and people to fill it out or what's your stance on this? Well, since my name is on the paper and the development of that was part of one of my grants, of course I love it. Uh, this, this, <laughs> is a, love this is a fantastic uh, index to use, the CPSI. And the reason why it is so good is because it, it what the patient wants to tell you. And we spent you know several million dollars to figure this out. What does the patient want to tell you? He wants to tell you about his pain. He wants to tell you where the pain is, the severity of the pain, and the frequency of the pain. He wants to tell you about his irritative and obstructive voiding symptoms. Um, so he wants to tell you about his stored symptoms and his voiding symptoms. He wants to tell you how it's impacting his quality of life and impact. And he wants to tell you, you know, how much he's suffering from it in terms of quality of life. Nine questions. We get all that information. The patient, that's what he wants to tell you. If you take that by history, it can take you 15 minutes. If he fills this out in five minutes or less, well, you're seeing another patient and you have a chance to look at it in the 30 seconds as you're walking down the hall. I have a long hall to, between uh, my office and where I see patients. If you're looking at that as you're walking down the hall, by the time I see the patient, I know exactly what his clinical picture looks like. Mm. I know where his pain is, how frequent it is, how severe it is, if he has voiding symptoms, what type of voiding symptoms, how it's really impacting his activities, how it's impacting, you know, what he wants to do, how it's uh, impacting his quality of life. I have everything. Now I just have to go in and look at the other form he's filled out, which is his history form. You know, when did the symptoms start, you know, describe the symptoms. And I have a number of questions they answer. I know what's going on. And it, really makes 
the uh, visit a lot more gratifying, not only for me, but for the patient who now was able to tell me everything he wanted to tell me, which he would not in the seven minutes I allocated for his consult. Wow. That was the greatest endorsement for this index that I've ever seen. Gee, I'm going to say with sarcasm, I wonder if the PCRI should put it somewhere on the website with the Men's Health Conference, at least to discuss it with your doctor. I didn't realize you were going to give such an overwhelming endorsement to it. I love validated questionnaires. I just think they're patient empowering. And so I, I appreciate what you said about that. And it's so easy to download it. It's so easy to put on a website, hint, 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 right. hint, so to so Alex so and Peter and to everyone else. We've got to do that. Okay, as long as you know the name has changed. Okay, because, that's a good point. Tell me why because, the name has changed. You know, we tend not to, you know, it's being used for, you know, pelvic pain, not just prostatitis. So in the wisdom, the NIH has changed it to the male goopy, the male genital urinary pain index. Okay. When did that okay. change take place? That took place about three or four years ago, but all the papers that are coming out now don't use the CPSI because okay. it's not... Um, you know, scientifically as sound as using the same one, but calling it the male genital urinary pain index. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, what comes to the top is always the NIH CPSI, but the goopy, hey, another teaching point that we got to make sure that it gets the right name to get to the right people. But well, I don't know. understand this then. If all this prostatitis is out there, why are people throwing antibiotics at it? You got to explain well, that one to me. Because the patients come in and they'll tell you, uh, every time I get put on ciprofloxacin, uh, after a week or two, I feel better. And why is that? Are we suppressing the microbiome that's causing the inflammation in the prostate? Unlikely. Uh, we now know that uh, the fluoroquinolones and many of the other antibiotics, including the beta-lactam antibiotics, all have anti-inflammatory and anti-cytokine activity. Mm. So what I didn't know was ciprofloxacin gives the same benefit for other aches and pains like headaches and back pains as ibuprofen. So that's the other reason why patients with flank pain always come in with recurrent abacterial pyelonephritis. Why? Mm -hmm. Every time they're put on Cipro, their flank pain gets better, not because of antimicrobial activity, but anti-inflammatory and anti-cytokine activity, which is a side effect of the antibiotic. That's really interesting. It's the pleiotropic effects of our most, pop, our most popular medications. But you're not expecting to see a PSA increase in men with chronic prostatitis non-bacterial. Is that right or wrong? Are there any PSA changes? No, you, the statement you said is right. We do expect to see a PSA rise in acute bacterial prostatitis, which can rise you know, to over 100 and can right. take uh, six months or longer to come back to baseline. In chronic bacterial prostatitis, in which we have recurrent bacterial episodes, we can also see episodic rises in PSAs that are very low, very um, long term to, to decrease. However, in the, in the average patient who presents, typical patients who presents with non bacterial chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, we've not been able in population uh, based studies with age match controls show a difference in PSA. Okay, so if you're not so seeing it, so if you see an elevated PSA in a prostatitis patient, you do not put it down to the prostatitis unless it's bacterial. You treat that patient and manage him exactly the same as you would with somebody without prostate, prostate pain. Wow. Okay. So now you, you've, you've defined the person goes, they, they've been told that that's what they have, chronic non-bacterial prostatitis. They have chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, uh, the one that makes up the majority. What? What are we looking at as standard of care for treatments in terms of start slow? I mean, I would think with this amount of pain that some people have been put on all sorts of high dose pain medications and maybe even become dependent on them. But, you know, where do you start with treatment and looking at how you treat this? I know you okay, mentioned so palmetto and I know you mentioned uh, Vioxx and there's the competitor Celebrex, the anti-inflammatories, but how should I look at the treatment paradigm or at least the spectrum of what patients should ask their doctor about or should be discussed. Okay, so the standard treatment that we would use on all patients is number one, education. Education is extremely important. We take the patient seriously, empathetically, and you'd be amazed, you know, you do have a problem. It's called CPPS, chronic mm -hmm. pelvic pain syndrome, might be related to your prostate, might not. 
We don't believe it's an infection, but we're going to double check and make sure just in case, you know, a new antibiotic might be a benefit. So that's education. That goes a long way. Second is diet. We try and find out if there's anything in their diet that, um, uh, you know, exacerbates it. And the simple thing is you, you stop that. Now, it's not like in women with interstitial cystitis where you use an elimination diet. It doesn't seem to work as well with, with men. With men. Mm-hmm. Um, we found that some men, uh, alcohol improves the symptoms and others, it exacerbates it. Others, it's seasonal. So we know it's seasonal foods like uh, tomatoes and things. It's amazing what we found has aggravated the inflammation. The next thing we do is we look at uh, activities and exercises. First, we look at what activities make it worse. What do they do for a living? Are they on a tractor all day? On a, you know, in the, in the old days, prostatitis used to be very popular in buggy seat uh, drivers because mm. you know they're on a on a uh, wooden board. But you know, people on uh, poorly sprung uh, tractors uh, is is their main sport riding a bicycle, either you know in, in their in their uh, outside or, or in their gym. Major contribution to pelvic pain and what we call prostatitis. High impact exercise. What makes it worse? You're continuing to run even though you're crippled with pain after mm. each time you come back from jogging. So what we change is the exercise pattern because exercise we know is good. Low impact exercise, change from a treadmill and running to an elliptical, change from jogging to swimming, uh, change from bicycle riding. But if you have to, and by the way, bicycle riders are always uh, addicted to it. Same with runners. Um, and so you change the bicycle seat so it's a buttock type, you know, or a tractor seat type mm. of thing. So there's no pressure on the perineum or bulb or urethra or anything like that. Uh, yoga, stretching exercises, physiotherapy exercises, all of which are benefit. Now, it's interesting. Those four uh, things of treatment, you know, uh, avoidance, uh, proper exercises, uh, diet, manipulation, education. For many men, that's all that's required, plus a little reassurance. For many wow. That's that's they just want to make sure they don't have prostate cancer because they have these symptoms down there. That's their major concern. That's a major concern of their spouse who came in with them. I think, you know, my husband has had prostate cancer because he has all this pain down here. But then what we do, uh, most patients, particularly men, want more therapy. So we put them through a phenotype phenotype differentiation uh, type thing, which we do clinically. Uh, Basically, for men, we use what's called U point or U points. And it's phenotypically differentiating into various categories. U is urinary, P is psychological, organ, O is organ specific, uh, I is infection, N is neurogenic and systemic, T is tenderness, because we didn't know what else we could put there for pelvic floor dysfunctional pain to make it work well. S is sexual, but sometimes we put that as O as penis. And what we do is we differentiate, and most men have more than one category that they're involved with one, two, or three. Now we have effective therapies for each one of those categories. So then we develop a tailored individual personalized treatment program for every patient, which is multimodal and attacks each one. So every patient that leaves our clinic for the first time leaves with a different treatment program. There is not one treatment tailored for all. One sock doesn't fit all in this case. So what what we do, and and we use all our standard therapies, um, you, you know, uh, alpha blockers, uh, finasteride, saw palmetto. Uh, we use Cernilton, which is a, another uh, herbal therapy, which is uh, an extract of rye, pollen, grass. Uh, uh, we use mirabegron for, for symptoms in the bladder that sometimes occur. We our, our next level that we go up to that we would consider using, depending on the U-point phenotype differentiation, is neuromodulation. And we particularly uh, like to use uh, one of the tricyclic antidepressants, uh, such as amitriptyline. We also will use the gabapentinoids, uh, Lyrica or pregabalin is, is the one of choice that, that you know, we tend to use. If we find a lot of muscle spasm and pain on examination, we use uh, you know, smooth and skeletal muscle relaxants. Um, you know, we can use diazepam or baclofen, or the one that I tend to use because it covers a lot of things is cyclobenzaprine, mm. uh, 10 milligrams titrating up to 10 milligrams three times a day. Again, if, if that doesn't work and we've identified point tenderness or sort of myofascial pain, we'll put them through a serial injection program, lidocaine with or without triamcinolone. What we avoid 
is uh, uh, narcotics. Narcotics are totally unsuccessful in this type of pain I've, I've found over the time. 30% reduction in chronic pain, which we can get a 28% when in, in all our uh, placebo controlled studies using placebo. So there really is, is not any benefit. You wipe out your endogenous opioids and the next thing yeah. you know, you have nothing to, to, to help you with, with the pain. So we do use a lot and it's legal in Canada medicinally for years, but now it's legal uh, recreational is uh, marijuana uh, or cannabis. And we use uh, government issued uh, cannabis prescriptions which can be covered by uh, insurance, private insurance. It's not covered through the government program at this point, unless you're a vet, uh, a vet of, uh, you know, a military uh, veteran. And we use that. We use it two ways. One is to try and improve the patient's quality of life because our studies have shown that it doesn't reduce the pain, but it improves the patient's quality of life, well-being, gets them back to work. But we really use it for an opioid cessation program. Mm. We change opioids with cannabinoids, cannabinoids, and what a difference! Uh, over six to twelve months, I'm changing a patient who is stuck on morphine, and we get them off that and onto cannabinoids. It's like a difference between night and day in in the patient how they're, they're they're coping, even though their pain hasn't changed. When they check off, doc, I still have six over ten out of pain, but we're going to go visit the grand. We're going to go visit the children. Uh, I'm talking to my boss about going back to work full time. All this stuff is very gratifying. That is awesome. And I just, there are a lot of drug names in there, but what I learned and when I have to write about this, I was one of the first reviewers of the, there was a study, I think it was the Italian group that looked at just exercise would help uh, in some of these scenarios. And it's mm -hmm. amazing how lifestyle, just simple lifestyle changes can help a lot of these individuals. But what a lot of people don't realize, and I sit back and smile while you rip off all these names of drugs and phytotherapies, is that you help come up with this thing called U-Point. And it's like you said, U-P-O-I-N-T. My handwriting is terrible, but the point is U-Point. If someone's diagnosed with this and they're seeing a physician, where they fit on the U-Point, are they a U, are they a P, are they an O? Again, they can look this up in the literature. If they, if at least, help me, help me give this some clarity. If the, the, the urologist or doctor can take the chronic prostatitis patient and figure out where they fit in the U point, are they a U, are they an I, they can then match all those different treatments to them specifically, right? Correct. And all, all those all those phenotypes are uh, easily identifiable using a yeah. standard uh, clinical assessment. Rarely needs an MRI or CAT scan, which is sometimes useful. Now, the interesting way that came out is we ended up looking at U point and it's six points. And my wife was in the plane coming back from Philadelphia and we were drawing it. She drew a, a six pointed like star as I was doing it and putting U point. She says, that's a snowflake, Curtis. And all of a sudden it all made sense. This, and so that's why we've got a number of papers calling it the snowflake hypothesis. And why is it the snowflake hypothesis? Because, you know, snowflakes, uh, every single one of them kind of looks the same. And when they're all together, there's an amorphous mass of cold H2O. However, when you tease out each uh, snowflake, the scientists will tell us that every one is unique and different. That's the same with our prostatitis patients. Every one is unique and different. So to ever think that we could do a clinical trial with one intervention versus placebo yeah. and kind of come up to success by having 360 individual phenotypically differentiated patients you know, we were blowing smoke. And that's the problem that we've had in all our clinical trials. Why some therapies worked for some patients extremely well, but none of the therapies worked for all the patients all the time. Yeah, no, it's an, it was an incredible, what people don't understand, a lot of people can't appreciate it. It's because it's difficult unless you've been around it for 30 years is that when you came up with help, come up with this system, it really is what's called individual patient care. I mean, it really individualizes the treatment to the specific person on the U point scale. If any anybody watching this is dealing with chronic prostatitis and should familiarize themselves not only with the questionnaire, but the U point, what it means. There's plenty of your papers out there. And it's funny you mentioned marijuana because I was just, I always like to pull, you, you did this one for Canadian Urologic on on uh, marijuana. I mean, there's just so much going on in this category. I love it. I just love it. I just think it's, we just learned a lot today in terms of, it's just amazing how 
the, the percentage of prostatitis that's out there is chronic non-bacterial prostatitis is amazing. It really, but please take a look at Point. Please take a look at papers by Dr. Nickel for suggested treatment approaches working with your doctor. But I want to end this segment unless there's something else you wanted to add because I've gone over and yeah, I wanted I, to add I, one of I would add, since you're giving some advice, I've written yeah. a, uh, over 600 papers. You can't expect the... Uh, the people to go out and look up PubMed, all my papers, you get very confused because a lot of them are very specific. But uh, a number of years ago, somewhere, trying to remember, but I think it's around 2018-ish, I published in a journal called the G Canadian Urologic Association Journal. Yes. There was a whole supplement there on um, urologic chronic pelvic pain. And there's about four or five papers. I wrote a, a couple of them. my colleagues wrote, wrote others. I was the overall editor of that. Those particular papers from 2018 in that uh, particular supplement are free to download from the journal. And they're more of a review and they actually cover the topic better for not only physicians, but also for patients who are interested in up to date what's going on in the field. That's what I would suggest, Mark. No, it's a good suggestion because all the papers I pulled for you before we did this little get together is from the Canadian Urologic Association Journal. You can download a lot of these papers that you've written for no charge. And it helped me just, and this is all over the past few years. So if they look at UPoint, they look at chronic prostatitis from the journal, they don't have to pay. It's it's all it's all open. Those papers were, and that's the ones oh, I pulled. So so there is a there is a website on UPoint. Uh, I believe it's still up. It was developed by one of my colleagues who helped develop uh, UPoint, Dr. Daniel Shaskis. Yeah. And it's actually where a patient can go. And I'm pretty well sure it's completely free. And you can put in your symptoms, uh, develop what you think is your UPoint score. It'll make a couple of suggestions for treatment. And you can take the printout to your doctor. And, uh, you know, may maybe some of his work is already done if you do that beforehand. Well, then you're going to give us, I mean, I, you're going to give us there's so many papers on U point. You're going to give us that U point link, right? I don't know what it is, but I'll try and find it. It's it's easy to. I mean, there's a number of U point links with you there. I mean, I'm, a lot of people are using it for their other websites, but we'll get the ones that are official that you mm. that, that you endorse. Fabulous, you. love it. Did I miss something else? I mean, we covered a lot here in the in. The, I I just think uh, the only thing I can add to the side here is that with all this inflammation going on. Um, and prostatitis in this words, you know, when you think about inflammation in other parts of the body, whether it's gastrointestinal, whether it's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, when you think about inflammation of the prostate, people always argue back and forth. Well, if you've got inflammation in the prostate, that has to be a risk factor for prostate cancer. And where do you sit on that now? Is, is having inflammation in your prostate long-term for many years does that increase the risk of prostate cancer or aggressive disease? Where are they now with all that? It's uh, controversial. We know that inflammation can promote carcinogenesis in many organs, and certainly it can in uh, prostate modeling. We had biopsy results at baseline two years and four years, and we're able to uh, look at the impact of present prostate inflammation on the development and progression of prostate cancer, we're not able to see an association. That was the largest and probably best uh, biopsy study in looking at prostate cancer. But that doesn't answer the question of whether you had prostate, prostate inflammation for 20 or 30 years, would that increase your risk of prostate cancer? Who knows? I want to thank you. I'm going to do a, we're going to do a surprise four minute segment after I thank you. See, I really appreciate, I mean, you and I have had a very good relationship. I've learned a lot. Um, People have no idea in our field, this guy is a giant and, or they have an idea if they look, if they do enough searching. So I just, thanks again, Curtis, for everything that you're doing. And oh, uh, good, good. I, I hope to see you soon. I'm going to add the bonus segment for two minutes after I say goodbye, but, but thank you. Okay. This is my uh, 25th annual. I'm just making this up off the top of my head. Bonus feature with an expert segment. That sounds good. I'm just, anyway, I couldn't let Dr. Nickel go today, even though we've worked him like a dog, D-A-W-G. We have worked him like a dog. I apologize, but I don't apologize <clears throat> because we're with greatness. But it's not just for the prostatitis. It's not just for the salt palmetto. It's not just for the BPH stuff. There's something he's known for right now globally that he's getting incredible attention that people are talking about all sorts of prizes with that a lot of people don't realize. And this is for women's health. But the <clears throat> reason I'm bringing it up is we have a lot of women 
that watch the Men's Health Conference, first of all. Second of all, we just don't want to promote men's health. If we have an opportunity and groundbreaking information to possibly promote women's health, we're going to do it. And so let me just tell you what he was involved. Here's one of the headlines. I'm just going to read you a few of the headlines in all the major papers. Sublingual vaccine shows promise in women with recurrent urinary tract infections. 40% of women who received a three-month course of this MV140 had no UTIs during the nine month follow up. That was just a recent press release. Here's the New England Journal of Medicine sublingual MV140 for prevention of recurrent urinary tract infections. And Curtis Nickel is on here. And this is New England Journal of Medicine evidence. And it's saying, wow, we might have a potential future vaccine for women who have suffered from urinary tract infections. And all this is happening with Curtis Nickel being one of the representatives of the trial. This is a this is potentially very amazing work. What am I missing? And what can you tell me of where we are with this vaccine for women potentially that maybe one day will turn out to be for some men? But where are we with this? Because lately I see your name everywhere in the headlines concerning this vaccine. Well, thanks for asking me about that, uh, Mark. Um, I've been involved with urinary tract infections since my uh, postdoc uh, back in 1983 and have been involved in looking at ways to prevent urinary tract infections in women with uh, recurrent urinary tract infections. Is it a problem? It certainly is. 11% of women every year develop a UTI, and a third of them end up with recurrent UTIs. That's more than three urinary tract infections uh, a year. And so that's 3% of women worldwide have recurrent urinary tract infections. And the only guideline treatment for each infection is antibiotics. Uh, for you know three to seven days. And the only way to prevent them, um, evidence-based, is long-term antibiotics, three, six months or longer. And antibiotics are poison. They kill things. They can't be good for us. And they're not. They cause mischief with our gut microbiome, which has significant long-term cons health consequences for an individual patient who has to take so much antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics Microbial resistance is a worldwide problem, and the treatment of urinary tract infections is contributing to this problem because of the truckloads of antibiotics we use. One of the ways that we've been looking at, and we're looking at many ways, including complementary herbal therapies and that, is vaccines. And we've been looking at vaccines for 20 years, and I was getting discouraged. Um, we were using injectable vaccines. We are using intravaginal vaccines. And this particular vaccine, again, I thought I was going to be discouraged. It was uh, been in use for now for about 12 or 13 years in Spain. It's mm. a sublingual vaccine uh, comprised of uh, dead bacteria, which is sprayed under the tongue, uh, two sprays for uh, under the tongue for three months. And it had remarkably benef remarkable benefits in observational studies. And the more I looked at it, and then we did an analysis of three or uh, five of these observational studies, and it looked too good to be true. It was safe. And it appeared to be effective in reducing UTIs. So I became involved in helping develop and run a European randomized placebo control trial in using this vaccine compared to placebo. And we were blown away by the results. In women who had an average of six UTIs or a median of five per year, over 40% of them had no UTIs uh, over the course. Actually, in, th in that particular study, it was 55 to 57% had no UTIs wow. compared to 25% in placebo. There was a 75% reduction in UTIs, significant reduction in antibiotic use, an improvement in quality of life of those patients. So I convinced Health Canada to let me use this vaccine in a small study in Kingston in my own patients. And I enrolled 67 of my own patients with recurrent urinary tract infections. Although we didn't see that 57% of patients with uh, no UTIs, we did see on average 40%, and this is in the real world, but we did see almost an 85% reduction in UTIs, improvement in a uh, patient's perception of what was going on. And we did this study during the COVID period when everybody was sort of down on vaccines, but this one proved to be exceptionally safe, has almost no side effects except for some mouth tingling and numbness of the lips that occur in, a, in maybe one or two out of a hundred patients. And those, those symptoms go away right away. It's remarkable how well it is. And we're putting together a package to Health Canada. And hopefully within a year or thereabouts, we'll see this uh, product available in Canada. In fact, 
It's already been uh, subjected to approval process in Mexico and was recently approved in Mexico in the Dominican Republic. Uh, it's used in Europe um, and in other 18 other countries, including the UK, Australia, New Zealand, on special access programs. So this is going to be a real big deal for women's health. I believe a game changer. So it's two sprays under the tongue uh, at the same time or different times of the day. It's just no, one, two, one, two. One, two. It, it tastes like a little bit of pineapple, uh, like there's pineapple essence, some yeah. glycerol and, yeah. and the dead, dead bacteria. And that's it. And that, that's the other thing I, I read in the papers, inactivated bacteria, which is nice because some people get nervous about live attenuated bacteria or viruses and vaccines, but this is this is dead bacteria, but you're eliciting a response with it still. Right, so, and it's a different type of response and you get, let's say with the COVID or flu vaccine, it's not a generalized uh, vaccination where the uh, immunity is spread through the bloodstream into all the tissues. It's actually absorbed by sort of the lymph system and it's transported through the lymph uh, system through inflammatory cells that present it again to mucosal surfaces. Uh -huh. So the, the, the vaccine actually works on the vag vagina, urethra, and bladder mucosa, probably also the, the uh, lung mucosa as well, and inside the mouth, but we don't get UTIs from that. And um, we see a type of vaccine that does not give systemic effects or have systemic long-term um, side effects. So, so I'm already getting texts. How can I get it? How can someone get, I'm, you know, I'm already getting, these are from people in the PCRI group. Uh, that, that is the question. Are we going to see it in the States? Are you going to, are we going to be able to go to Canada and get it in the next year? I mean, how is somebody, how am I going to get this in the U S first of all, and how should I look at this in the rest of the part of the world where I live in? Do I just talk to my doctor? It's going to be prescription. <clears throat> What's the thinking here? Well, the, the rest of the world does not have a problem with vaccines. So it is going to be available in Canada. It, will be, it is available in Mexico. It will be available in Europe and Asia. Where it will not be available is in vaccine-unfriendly United States. It is extremely hard, unless people are dying, like in COVID, to get a vaccine approved in the United States, a modern vaccine approved in the United States, unless it prevents cancer, prevents death, prevents you know, something serious. It's almost impossible. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be uh, discussions with the FDA, but I can tell you the FDA, uh, you know, the vaccine group is um, very leery of uh, um, approving a vaccine for what is perceived by many as a nuisance where there already is a cure and prevention, antibiotics. Well, to me, well, you know, you know my, I feel about vaccines. I, I love some of the technology and some of the pleiotropic effects when they're needed, you know, especially like looking at them in cancer, but this is an immune modulator. This is, you can call it a vaccine, but this is, you know, we take all sorts of, we, we make dietary changes. We exercise for immune modulation. This is an immune modulator. That's a little bit of a spray. So basically what you're telling me in the next 12 months, my chances of getting it in the United States are probably bupkis zero, yes. but my chances of getting it in Canada are possible. Possible. And like I say, right now, uh, my Canadian patients fly to Mexico to pick it up. Okay. I will at least we know. And then you say that's not a problem getting it. Uh, I mean, when they go pick it up in Mexico, are they picking it up? It's at some clinic. I mean, where yeah, are they, they, they? They need a prescription. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I provide a prescription, which is uh, countersigned by a Mexican clinical doctor. Okay. And then, so you're saying, but other parts of the world right now, you haven't seen a problem in getting it in terms of getting it out there. If the data is, is the data is shown to the appropriate group. Correct. And that's uh, women, you know, um, between the ages of, you know, 16, 17, 18, up into their eighties who have recurrent uncomplicated UTI. Curtis, let me tell you something, you know, how much, cause you know, this about me, I, I review a lot of papers for medical journals like you do. So I get to be a referee for medical journals. I got to review. I wasn't one of the original. I just had to, for some sites, I had to review this trial with your name on it in the New England Journal of Medicine. Let me tell you what struck me, which I haven't, can you just comment on? There was one thing that struck me, which might surprise you. When I looked at the makeup of the patients in the trial, if you look at them, they are extremely healthy patients who are getting these UTIs. You're not talking about extreme 
uh, on this extreme spectrum of an unhealthy weight. You're not talking about a long history of, for example, diabetes. Almost, I think it was, if I remember the review, it was almost 97% of them were non-smokers. I'm just saying this was a really healthy group, which I think that doesn't necessarily make it easy, um, but... And yet you still showed a benefit. Did you know, did you go out to recruit such a healthy group of people? Yes, it, 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 was, the, it was mandated by um, EU and Health Canada that they have to be uncomplicated UTIs with the first run. So uncomplicated urinary tract infections are basically recurrent UTIs, more than three per year in healthy women with no other comorbidities. So is it going to be helpful in patients, the diabetics, the old, the one with urinary retention, the patients that are getting intermittent catheterization? Those studies are being planned right now. Thank you. Because I'm thinking, man, if it's working here, what about all the people who are suffering from all those UTIs, men and women who are also dealing with comorbidities? And like you said, look, antibiotics have a role, but what, what's happening is we're creating this unbelievable level of resistance to these bugs because they're used so chronically. So right. that's so why to, but to people me, don't know this about you, but you, you in your clinic, because of all this resistance, you use things like cranberry extra, extract, you use mannose for UTIs. There, there are a couple of uh, great over-the-counter supplements for UTIs because antibiotics, even though it's been a partial solution, is not the solution to this problem. So this right. is brilliant research. Now, we could, we could go on and discuss this for hours, and I, I have. But, you know, basically, these aren't only my patients. They're, they're my, my, my sister. They're my mother. Uh, they're my wife. These are, these are the people that get recurrent urinary tract infections. And it's really good to be able to, to finally find something that may have a significant benefit. I, I, I love it. I love that this is part of the legacy of what you're putting together because people don't realize, you know, they, they see your name on prostatitis. They see your name on salt palmetto. But really what's happening in 2023 is your name with this sublingual vaccine research, which at the medical meetings to tell our audience when we're there and Dr. Nichols there, we want to ask him questions, but we're really asking most of our questions today about the vaccine. Like you were in Colorado with me at that meeting. People are asking you about the vaccine. And, yeah. and that's what is really exciting that we could possibly quell some of these with a spray. So anyway, I, I don't know if I missed anything on this five to 10 minute overview, but this is brilliant. And this is going to be a separate segment. And women's health is men's health and men's health is women's health. And this has got something here. This, this is exciting. Well, I appreciate the chance to talk about something that's uh, kind of dear to, to, to my heart and my interests at this point. Well, it's awesome. So thank you for letting me do this final segment. Bless you. And I'll see you. I'll see you soon. Thanks for everything you did today. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Mark. All, right. All right. And great. Yay, yay Canada. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nickel, and thank you, Dr. Moya. That was so informative and helpful. I just wanted to take a quick moment to remind you that we do have our exhibit hall on PCRI.org. You can download a lot of information there and take it to your doctor's office with you, and we find it very helpful to have a checklist of things you need to talk to your doctor about, or even information on treatments and side effects and lifestyle issues. So again, PCRI.org is a great resource. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can donate at pcri.org forward slash donate, or you can click on the fundraiser here on this YouTube channel. Now, I also want to take a quick moment to thank our sponsors, Janssen, Pfizer, and my event because of their generosity. Again, we were able to make this for free for everyone, and it's going to live here on our YouTube channel. So if you see something you want to rewind or come back to, you can do so after this live broadcast. So in our next session, we're going to be talking about BPH. Now, BPH is in a large prostate, and it's a very widespread condition. It often causes a lot of issues for men, especially with urinary flow. And there's a lot of different types of treatments that are out there to alleviate you know, the pressure on the urethra when it comes to the prostate. But because there are so many, we may not know which one's best for you as a patient. Again, we wanna make sure you're focusing on individualized care. Well, the person who's here today to explain this to us is Dr. Casey Dow. He's an incredible expert in his field, and he is the chief of the division of endourology and the associate professor of urology at the University of Michigan. He is 
an incredible person because he has focused specifically on BPH and has been able to determine, you know, this is what works for this patient, this is what doesn't work for another, and he's going to be able to describe that to us today. His presentation is very educational, and again, he's going to be moderated by our moderator, also from the University of Michigan, Dr. Mark Moyad, and he's going to be able to go through the ins and outs again of these treatments. We're very excited to have him. Thank you so much, Dr. Dow, and welcome to the PCRI. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, my name is Casey Dow. I'm an associate professor of urology at the University of Michigan, and I have the pleasure uh, to speak to you today about some of the myriad options for the surgical management of BPH. BPH, I think, as many of our listeners know, is a very, very common phenomenon as we age as men. It's estimated that more than 20 million men over the age of 30 are affected by BPH, and the biggest risk factor is increasing age. Indeed, uh, if you make it to age 80, about 90% of men will be afflicted with some form of lower urinary tract symptoms, that being bothersome urinary symptoms. Uh, other risks include things like metabolic syndrome and genetics, though certainly BPH can run in families. But when we really think about uh, moving forward with surgical management, we're talking about those patients who have already had a complication of BPH. And so what I mean by that is, in general, these five uh, uh, etiologies. So men who are in retention, right? Someone who cannot urinate and is either catheterizing themselves or has an indwelling catheter. Those who have recurrent blood in the urine, we call gross hematuria, uh, recurrent infections. Those who have formed bladder stones um, that can be removed at the time of uh, surgery for the prostate. And then those with renal functional deterioration. So when the, when the bladder and obstruction gets so bad that you're starting to see kidney disease, then we really start leaning on patients and offering surgical management. It's really important, uh, uh, this being a surgical management talk, that prior to considering any surgical intervention that we've offered conservative uh, measures to patients like behavioral changes and medication management before we move to surgical intervention. Um, uh, that's just a caveat here, as again, I'm discussing surgery, recognizing there's a wide range of metabolic uh, and uh, behavioral changes that we can undertake before we consider surgery. Um, this is straight from the American Urologic Association's most recent guidelines on the surgical management of BPH. Uh, and I think what's unique about this for patients is that we recognize now as urologists that the uh, treatments that we choose are dictated in large part by prostate size. And so one of the first things that we do after assessing symptom bother and doing a symptom questionnaire, maybe doing some rudimentary tests of the bladder and lab tests is really to try to understand how large the prostate is because for, as you can see, smaller or average size prostates, you have a whole smorgasbord of treatment options. And we'll touch on many of these things. But as the prostates get very, very large, we really start to think about a nucleation, whether that be done via simple prostatectomy or using a various energy source. We'll focus specifically on holmium laser and nucleation or HOLEP towards the end of this talk. So here is our menu, and I can understand as patients who are coming to see us in the office how this might be a little bit of a daunting prospect, right? It's like a massive menu of different treatment options. They all have their own uh, acronyms, which can make things confusing. So I'm going to try to systematically take us through these different options. And again, spend much of the time uh, talking about the last, which is HOLAP, which is something that uh, I uh, have particular expertise in and I think is a great surgical option for most men. So kind of beginning with the, the tried and true method of transurethral resection of the prostate, uh, otherwise known as TERP. Um, some patients will refer to this as roto rootering Essentially, uh, it is one of the longest standing treatment options that we have as urologists uh, uh, and certainly is a, is a, a great option for many men. Um, TERP uh, is always going to remain amongst the gold standard of BPH procedures. Uh, it uh, is um, considered to be probably one of the international standards for the surgical treatment of men with prostates up to 80 grams uh, or, or cc's. Um, and the reason behind that is that there's a long track record of efficacy. Um, uh, there have been multiple randomized controlled trials that suggest uh, and affirm the fact that TERP is a tried and true method to treat men with BPH. Um, we see that this is measured in improvements in urine flow a reduction in symptom scores, lower scores equal uh, uh, better outcomes, improvement in patient's quality of life, and better uh, uh, bladder emptying. So again, TERP has been around for a long time, uh, decades and decades. It also is relatively durable. Um, certainly, this is impacted by prostate size, but our long-term data would suggest that reoperation rates, so needing retreatment after having a TERP, are somewhere between 5 to 10, maybe up to 15%, depending on prostate size at 8 to 10 years. 
So again, a relatively durable treatment option. Um, TERP is done transurethrally, so a scope is inserted through the penis while the patient is asleep, and it can be done in many different ways. What you're seeing there on the right is what's called loop cautery, and, and this can be done either in monopolar or probably more commonly these days with bipolar cautery. Uh, bipolar TERP um, is probably done most commonly in the United States and worldwide today. It's safer than monopolar TERP in the sense that we can use irrigation in the form of saline, um, so it limits some of the um, concerns uh, with uh, hyponatremia, and we can have more prolonged resection times. Um, certainly, uh, um, uh, monopolar TERP is not the wrong answer, but in, in most people's hands, bipolar TERP is being done. Um, as I mentioned before, the biggest benefit to bipolar TERP is it allows us to use an irrigation a medium of saline, whereas in the old days we were using um, uh, sterile water. And there was a concern that as you liberated some of the prostate tissue and opened up some of these prostatic varices or veins that you could absorb the fluid, the water into the bloodstream, and it could result in pretty significant hyponatremia, which can be life-threatening. Um, so uh, nowadays, I think the gold standard if we're uh, proceeding with a TERP would be uh, to pr proceed with a bipolar TERP. Um, and uh, I, I think that this uh, figure kind of emphasizes the fact that uh, randomized controlled trials and a meta-analysis from the European Association of Urology have shown that uh, bipolar TERP is favored in almost all um, uh, fa facets over monopolar TERP. So again, it's becoming the standard if we're doing transurethral resection. I will put a slight plug in uh, that durability can be a concern with TERP. Um, this is a study that's looking at uh, reoperation rates for patients that either went underwent photo vapor, photoselective vaporization of the prostate, that is um, uh, commonly known as green light laser or TERP. And what you can see is this study, um, not controlled necessarily for gland size, did show that there was a reoperation rate of around 7% or 9% in the PVP or TERP arms. Uh, at two years. So some of the historical data I presented would suggest that that rate is uh, much higher than what we would anticipate. But as prostates get larger, I think that we do often see these reoperation rates in this range. So something to consider in men that are approaching that 80 gram or above threshold for prostate size. So in summary, uh, TERP will uh, always likely remain one of the gold standard treatments for men with BPH. Uh, it's performed by more urologists for BPH than any other surgery. It has a long track record of su success, predominantly being done using bipolar energy these days. Durability can be a concern and something patients should certainly be considering as they are ferreting out treatment options. I would probably utilize this for a patient who had a small or medium-sized prostate, maybe in the 60 grams or less range, um, just so that we don't run up against issues with durability. Uh, the next technology is very different than the TERP. This is uh, something called transurethral microwave thermotherapy, another acronym for you, TUMT. Um, this is uh, fundamentally different, right? TERP, I said, is done in the operating room, whereas TUMT is typically an office-based procedure. Um, it's minimally invasive in the sense that a catheter is inserted that has a microwave antenna via the urethra, and the prostate tissue is heated and atrophies and dies with some circulating water that allows to, the urethra to be protected so that there's no urethral sloughing. Uh, there have been several studies looking at TUMT outcomes. Uh, it, they have kind of uniformly showed that there is a decrease in symptom indices. I will caution patients that retreatment rates are very high, um, and this is likely best used for men with smaller prostates or those who are not willing to accept some of the possible um, side effects of TURP or some of the other technologies we're going to discuss um, uh, which can cause retrograde ejaculation, that is semen no longer comes out the tip of the penis when men climax, it goes back into the bladder. TUMT will preserve antegrade ejaculation, but as you can see towards the bottom, retreatment rates of approximately 30% at five to eight years, uh, in, in my opinion, is uh, pretty substantial and something that patients should be counseled about if they're considering this option. The next on the menu is prostatic urethral lift uh, under the trademark Eurolift. Um, this, again, is often an office-based procedure. Um, this is a, just a schema um, from the uh, company's website that indicates uh, how this is performed. Um, patients uh, typically have this scope inserted per urethra, uh, and um, these uh, sutures are essentially fired through the prostate tissue with the idea that they will tent the adenoma or benign tissue outwards, opening a channel which facilitates improved urination. Um, this is done in the operating room or in the office in some cases. Uh, there is a proprietary uh, device that's uh, equipped with a rigid cystoscope. Uh, the lobes of the prostate are compressed. 
uh, and a 19 gauge needle fires this monofilament suture and tabs through the prostate and into the uh, prostatic capsule, tacking the prostate tissue out. Um, it's important that this is done away from the bladder neck to prevent clip migration. Uh, and this is typically able to be done with just some lidocaine uh, jelly per urethra, and in many cases, a prostatic block, which is done transrectally. Um, there have been several studies that have evaluated the efficacy of the Eurolift technology. Uh, this is one particular randomized controlled trial comparing Eurolift with sham procedure uh, in more than 200 men over the age of 50. You can see they had relatively modest sized prostates. They were obstructed in the sense that their uh, max ur uh, urinary flow was low. And what their primary endpoint was in this study was improvement of symptom scores at three months. They excluded patients that had an anatomic uh, uh, median lobe. So that is a protrusion of the prostate into the mid portion of the, pro of the bladder. Um, they have broadened some of their criteria to include median lobes, but in this particular study, they used only bilobar or lateral lobe tissue only. What they found was that the AOA symptom score was reduced um, uh, in those who underwent Eurolift versus sham with an improvement in their peak urinary flow, and this was sustained at 12 months. Uh, they also reported in subsequent studies that these results were durable out to two and five years. Um, the procedure has relatively few side effects. Um, uh, certainly, this is a viable alternative to men who are considering a TERP in the sense that there's no risk of stress incontinence, that being leakage with coughing, sneezing, or straining. Uh, there's very, very little risk of bleeding. Uh, and there is a uh, short duration for any catheterization. I will say again, though, unlike uh, TERP or maybe similar to TERP, what we see is that retreatment rates can be somewhat elevated or high with this procedure. Uh, we see retreatment somewhere between 10 and 15% out to five years. And so we'll remember these numbers as we contrast it with some of the other options we're going to discuss later. So in summary, uh, Eurolift is the first of the options we're discussing that truly is a minimally invasive office-based procedure. I think it's more efficacious than the TUMT that we previously discussed and certainly done more frequently. Um, there is a reliable reduction in patients' urinary symptoms and improvements in flow. Uh, and this comes uh, with minimal risk of incontinence or retrograde ejaculation. Um, it is not useful, in my opinion, for men with substantial median low pathology, meaning a large protrusion of the prostate into the bladder, though there are um, some uh, surgeons who are uh, um, describing a technique where the median lobe is actually tacked over against the lateral lobe or resected at the time in a traditional TERP methodology before they do the Eurolift. Um, I would argue that the recurrence rates um, for patients are relatively high. And again, this is an option that is best suited for men with modest sized prostates and likely bilobar pathology. Moving on then to another minimally invasive surgical therapy uh, that has uh, uh, been on the market now for five to seven years, and this is water vapor thermal therapy under the trademark of Resume. Um, Resume got a lot of press as it initially came out because unlike the Eurolift technology, which is really just displacing prostate tissue, the Resume itself does actually cause obliteration or atrophy of tissue. Um, it is a convective thermal prostate ablation. It's been in use since 2013, FDA approved since 2015. It, like the Eurolift, is an office-based procedure. Uh, and uh, essentially what it does is uh, cause injection of steam or water vapor into the prostate tissue, which creates these finite zonal uh, areas of tissue atrophy. Um, the procedure itself is relatively brief. Typically, there's somewhere between four and six treatments that are conducted. Each lasts around nine seconds uh, and uh, generates a zone of atrophy of around 1.5 to 2 centimeters. Similar to the Eurolift procedure, these are men uh, that have prostates less than 80 cc's. But uh, unlike the Eurolift, this is uh, certainly an option for men who have median low pathology, as that can be treated with its own uh, injections before the lateral lobe tissue is treated. So this is just a picture of the device. Uh, it's uh, coupled to a rigid cystoscope. The scope is passed transurethrally, typically after performing a prostate block. Uh, and this uh, um, needle is injected into the prostate and the steam cycle generates about nine seconds uh, of uh, pressured steam into the prostate. Uh, and that results in uh, a zonal uh, a prostate death. Um, the tissue response uh, uh, typically occurs over the period of months, 
Uh, the lesions do remain in the transition zone of the prostate, which is key. All these technologies that we're discussing are targeted towards the adenoma uh, tissue, benign tissue, which is uh, in the in the transition zone of the prostate, un, uh, unlike the peripheral zone of the prostate where prostate cancer can often develop. We do protect key real estate when we're doing resume um, in the sense that we're not causing urethral sloughing. And certainly the penetration of the device is nowhere near the depth that we could end up with any rectal or uh, periprostatic tissue involvement. And what we see is unlike some of these other procedures we've discussed, with the exception maybe of TERP, where we're actually taking tissue out, is that we do see volume reduction. So tissue is dying. Uh, it's opening a channel, which is why this procedure is effective. This is just a representative image of, uh, uh, of an MRI performed to the prostate post-resume. And what you can see uh, in the bottom pane is those areas of uh, cell atrophy denoted in aqua and green, where the prostate tissue is, is shrinking. Uh, and this leaves a nice large channel, uh, which is why we see some of the symptom benefit, which we'll talk about now. So similar to Eurolift, if we look at one of the seminal studies that discuss the outcomes in men undergoing resume, uh, we uh, included uh, men with prostates under 80 cc's. Uh, as I indicated before, the prostate sizes were similar here on balance to what we saw in the Eurolift population. Um, uh, men had significant bother and uh, definitely had um, uh, uh, evidence of a poor Qmax, which is uh, their urine flow. This was a, a randomized placebo-controlled sham-controlled trial. And again, their endpoint was symptom score reduction at three months. What you can see is that there was a substantial reduction uh, in uh, symptom indices at three, six, and 12 months post-surgery uh, with uh, sustained improvement in peak flow uh, out to a year. Uh, and uh, interestingly, as we mentioned before, the presence of a median lobe in these patients did not impact outcomes. So for the, uh, for the keen observer and listener out there, if you're continue, considering one of these two minimally invasive surgical options, that being Eurolift or Resume, and you are told that you have median lobe pathology, and you're dead set on going with one of these, I would absolutely steer you towards this uh, resume technology. Um, when we looked at a crossover study that was a bit uh, longer term, it did appear that the outcomes were sustained out to two years, um, suggesting that this is a more uh, that this is a relatively durable treatment option. Um, side effects are relatively minimal. There's no risk of erectile, erectile dysfunction. Uh, there may be some slight transient retrograde uh, or retrograde ejaculation, but at 12 months, you can see that really this is non-existent. So this is another procedure like Eurolift that preserves, pr preserves forward ejaculation. Uh, I think the biggest thing that patients complain of with a procedure like this is most men experience some symptoms uh, similar to prostatitis. So pain with urination, perineal pain, pelvic pain for a good five to six days uh, after surgery. And another drawback to this procedure is that most men will be catheterized for anywhere from three to seven days after the procedure, uh, because as the tissue is atrophying, there can be some compensatory swelling, which can result in retention. So in summary, uh, Resume is a relatively brief office-based procedure. Uh, it reliably reduces symptoms and improves urine flow. There's minimal risk of incontinence or retrograde ejaculation. It does work for a median low pathology. So as I mentioned, this is something that you should consider. Those who'd like to avoid a catheter, this may not be the right choice for you, as most men will have an indwelling catheter for three to seven days. And symptoms of prostatitis, which can be relatively severe, although can be treated with things like alpha blockers and uh, um, anti-inflammatories, can last for as long as 30 days. I will say that recurrence rates with this technology are somewhere between 4 and 10%. Uh, as data matures, I think we'll understand that a little bit better. So kind of on par, maybe a little bit less risk of recurrence when we talk about uh, Eurolift. Um, next, we're going to talk about aquablation. This is an exciting technology um, that uh, uh, is now being performed in many centers uh, in the United States and worldwide. This is a fundamentally different procedure than we've discussed before. Uh, it is still a transurethral procedure, but uh, what this technology leverages is uh, real-time planning of the prostate tissue with ultrasound, uh, and then essentially a robotic um, uh, uh, removal of tissue using uh, uh, high-pressure uh, non-thermal aqua jet. Um, and so it is robotically controlled and planned by ultrasound, and that has some unique benefits. So this is just a schema of the heatless water jet technology. It's essentially leveraging the water pick effect, which causes tissue uh, uh, death um, immediately um, due to these high-pressure bursts um, coming from the uh, uh, treatment head. Uh, the patient will begin with treatment planning, which is done via transrectal ultrasound. This maps the prostate contours, and in particular, 
um, uh, preserves key areas uh, near the ejaculatory duct and urethral sphincter to limit the risk of uh, incontinence and also preserve uh, anterograde or forward ejaculation. Uh, this is just a different view of that. And what you can see is there, there um, um, on the left-hand side there is the bladder. Uh, and as you go towards the right, they're planning their treatment zone, depth of penetration, uh, and that yellow area there is an area that they're going to try to preserve to maintain forward ejaculation incontinence. This is just another schema indicating that what will happen when the treatment is planned is that this device will be controlled robotically in about a course of three and a half to five minutes will cause um, tissue destruction using that high pressure water jet. Uh, most uh, uh, surgeons are performing two treatments each around five minutes uh, each, um, which causes uh, tissue destruction, opens up a channel for urination. Um, the uh, studies uh, have indicated that when compared to the gold standard we discussed previously, that being TERP, that there's really uh, not much difference uh, in, in outcomes. And so when you're comparing against the gold standard and we see no real changes in, uh, in, in outcomes, that's a good thing, right? So we see that there's a reliable reduction in symptom scores, prostate volume, uh, uh, improvement in patients' uh, voided uh, volume, urine flow, and uh, uh, diminishing levels of their residual volume. Um, one thing that you will notice there at the bottom is one of the only things that was different in this study is that the resection time, that being the time it takes the treatment device to work, is substantially less than uh, TERP, uh, and that is uh, likely due to the automated and high-powered um, uh, water pick therapy that we have with this technology. I think most importantly, uh, what they find is that uh, there is a very low risk of incontinence, a low risk of erectile dysfunction and a lower risk than TERP of retrograde ejaculation due to preservation of that butterfly zone or area around the ejaculatory duct. Uh, these outcomes were sustained, uh, and uh, this study, uh, which was a randomized um, uh, uh, blinded trial, show that uh, aquablation remains not inferior to TERP, which we already kind of stated was the gold standard out to three years. This is just a couple more schemas showing that even when we expand the criteria of this study to men who have larger prostates, that being prostates that are between 80 and 150 cc's, you may remember from our schema before that we start to run out of treatment options here. Even in those larger prostates, we see reliable redu uh, reduction in symptom scores, improvements in uroflow, and decrease in uh, um, post-void residual. So uh, in summary, uh, aquablation, uh, I think, can be seen to treat any prostate size. Um, no configuration, meaning median lobe, lateral lobe, uh, are off limits. It may provide faster treatment as gland size increases because that's a relatively fixed uh, uh, aspect of things. I will say um, in the early days uh, of studying this procedure, patients were managed only with a catheter placed on traction, that being a little bit of tug to act as a pressure dressing to control any bleeding post-surgery. Uh, in the early studies, there was an unacceptably high rate of bleeding that required blood transfusions. Nowadays, your surgeon would likely perform what's called focal bladder neck cautery, where a scope is inserted after the treatment cycle and pinpoint cautery is performed. And this has dramatically reduced the risk of bleeding. Um, but this can be a little bit more of an issue with larger prostates and something that one should consider. Uh, the next is a procedure that is not done by urologists, or at least not done by many urologists, unless they have a background in interventional radiology, and that is prostatic artery embolization, or PAE. So PAE is fundamentally different than any of the procedures that we've performed, uh, again, being performed most uh, commonly by an interventional radiologist. This is a procedure typically done with sedation, so patients just get a little bit of twilight sedation, much like you'd have for an endoscopy or a colonoscopy. Uh, typically, the patients will have a puncture of their femoral, art femoral artery done by an interventional radiologist. And then essentially, much like we do for revascularization or work with the heart, we're cannulating the vessels that feed or provide blood supply to the prostate. Um, and uh, by blocking those with small microparticles or coils or whatever the interventional radiologist chooses to use, uh, there is blockage of blood supply to the prostate, which results in ischemic necrosis or death of the prostate uh, and size reduction. Uh, PAE has been studied uh, in patients uh, uh, with BPH. Um, I will tell you that it is a technically challenging procedure uh, in the sense that um, uh, it does take a specialized uh, interventional radiologist or one who has a special interest in treating men with BPH. 
And what we see is in many of the studies that we report, success rates are only about 80% for canalization or accessing the uh, prostatic arteries. Uh, this can be due to variant anatomy, small prostate uh, vessel size, and just some technical limitations. Um, clinical success, which they defined as greater than 25% reduction in symptom scores achieved in 80% of patients or more at a month. Uh, and this decreases slightly, um, raising some questions about the durability to around 70% in two years. But when you compare this to some of the other options that we have, this does hold some promise. Um, the complications from this sort of a procedure are kind of fundamentally different than any of the transurethral procedures. They're really confined to your area of the femoral puncture um, uh, and some local tissue reactions. One of the feared complications of this technology would be embolizing uh, an area that they shouldn't, such as uh, the arteries that feed the penis or things like that. They call that non-target embolization. That is very, very uncommon, occurring in less than 1% of patients. Um, in general, in my practice, I consider PAE for those patients that have substantial medical comorbidities. So uh, let's say, for instance, uh, really, really bad heart uh, uh, really, really bad uh, valvular disease, or a patient who can't come off anticoagulation for any reason, um, as these can be done on anticoagulation, though as I'm going to talk about next, uh, this is also an option for men undergoing holmium laser enucleation of the prostate or HOLEP. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about this technology. This is something that I utilize probably most frequently in my practice. Uh, my practice is such that um, I kind of cater to a group of men who uh, seek me out for this sort of an operation, and I think on balance, it has many of the characteristics of the procedures that we've discussed, uh, but the overall benefit to me is it's, it's true durability uh, and tolerability for men. So we'll, we'll delve into this uh, as we go forward. So what we're going to talk about here is uh, kind of the key benefits I see to HOLEP, which is that it's effective, it's safe, it's a very durable operation, more durable than I think anything that we've discussed today thus far. It is associated with sub substantial patient satisfaction. Uh, but one consideration is finding the right surgeon as there is a steep learning curve. Uh, we have several studies uh, that have shown the effectiveness of HOLEP. Uh, this is a study uh, that was uh, done by a mentor of mine in more than a thousand patients, uh, uh, of whom 40% came in with urinary retention needing a catheter, 10% had already failed some other prior BPH procedure, whether it be a TERP or a resume or green light laser ablation. Uh, they were significantly bothered by urinary symptoms up front. Uh, and uh, had uh, very low urine flow. These are larger prostates. The mean specimen weight that we measure at these procedures in this study was 70 cc. So this is catering to a men with larger prostates uh, and uh, men had catheters for less than 24 hours after surgery. What we can see is at one, six, 12 months and greater than five years, there's a uh, uh, reduction predictably in patient symptom scores uh, as well as an improvement in their urinary flow. So this is certainly a, a great option for these men. I think most importantly, only three out of a thousand men, and remember, I told you that 40% were in retention, three out of a thousand men were unable to urinate after HOLEP. So recurrent retention after this procedure is vanishingly rare. This is just plotting uh, the uh, uh, duration of uh, uh, symptom score improvement. And what you can see is plotted out to 15 months. We see a reliable uh, uh, decline in patients uh, bother. That's how bothersome their urinary symptoms are in their AUA symptom score, which is a measure of symptom severity. Uh, when we compare this um, to uh, other options such as uh, TERP, we see that there is uh, substantial uh, favorability relative to HOLEP or nucleation versus TERP, indicating that there may be a bit of a changing of the guard here, uh, favoring HOLEP as a gold standard rather, to, rather than TERP. And I think uh, what's important is that HOLEP is the only minimally invasive approach to show superiority to TERP uh, uh, in regards to AUA symptom reduction or symptom reduction uh, for BPH. You'll notice that the prior studies we discussed with things like aquablation were related to non-inferiority. This is truly showing that HOLEP has superior outcomes. It's a safe operation. Um, the risk of a blood transfusion uh, is somewhere less than 1%. Uh, bladder injury, uh, which is related to tissue morselation, is very, very uncommon. Urinary tract infections are, are, are uncommon as well. One thing we do discuss with patients is transient urinary incontinence or leakage. I typically quote to men that that risk is around 3% at three months and dot drops to less than 1% at six months, so it's more of a temporary nuisance than anything else. Risk of reoperation for recurrent adenoma is far less than 1%, which is excellent. And the risk of uh, uh, kind of aggressive healing or what we call a bladder neck contracture, which is really only seen in men with very small prostates, is, is, is less than 5%. 
Uh, as we mentioned before, uh, durability is a concern with many of the operations that we've discussed before. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we're thinking about things like Turpin PVP, which is green light laser, we see uh, retreatment rates of somewhere between, again, 10 to 20 percent at five years. Contrasting that with HOLEP, we see that even out to 10 years, uh, there's reliable uh, reduction in, in symptom score indices uh, and improvements in, in, in urine flow. And uh, this has been uh, highlighted in several uh, studies over the course of time. At a mean follow-up of five years in this study, 0.7%, so less than 1% of men needed reoperation for recurrent BPH. So really unparalleled durability when we're considering uh, HOLEP against these other treatment options. And I think this is important, you know, may not be the biggest deal for a guy who's 85 years old and just wants to start urinating again, but men that are in their early 60s who are likely to be around for another quarter century, durability, I think, is is is, is inc incredibly important. I think as important as any of these outcomes we measure on paper is patient satisfaction. Um, uh, and what I can say is that patients are highly satisfied when you uh, discuss um, uh, HOLEP uh, outcomes versus other men who have had other treatment options, uh, outcomes. HOLEP uh, patients uh, were more satisfied and harbored less regret about their surgical procedure than any of the other surgical procedures. Uh, and this was a nice paper illustrating that. I will say that one of the things that you'll want to find as you're seeking out a surgeon is one who's very experienced. One of the reasons that HOLEP has not taken off, like something like TERP or Resume or Aquablation or Eurolift, is that the learning curve is steep. Um, this is a, a complex figure, but these are cohorts of 25 patients. And what you can see is that uh, um, there was a gradual trend towards improved enucleation efficiency that could be read as speed of the operation as time goes on. Um, but it really took, you know, in this particular study, hundreds of patients for a patient, for a provider to feel comfortable with the procedure. Uh, uh, and um, that is something that should give you pause as you're considering this uh, operation in someone who may be a novice. And I think this is even cemented further when you look at, uh, this is a scatter plot of the case series, and you can see that there were uh, different procedures that were all over the map in the sense that some of these procedures aligned with being a, 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 an improved enucleation efficiency over time. But these outliers up here uh, were, were, were faster cases, and these down here were slower cases. So it does uh, take a little bit of time. In, in my experience, uh, um, this is the procedure that likely has a learning curve of somewhere between 30 and 50 cases um, for the provider. Um, and so you're definitely going to want to seek out someone who has substantial experience with this operation. Um, I will say that um, this was a very fascinating study looking at how surgeon experience impacted um, uh, patient outcomes in, in patients undergoing HOLEP. And certainly uh, experience uh, uh, over time did correlate with improved operative times, meaning shorter operative times. Uh, and preservation of urinary continence. So for men who are thinking about the side effects of this operation, one of the things that we discuss most uh, is this transient incontinence and certainly having a surgeon whose experience will reduce that risk of potential urinary incontinence. So to summarize, um, HOLEP is unparalleled uh, relative to these other procedures in that it can treat any prostate size, small or large. Uh, it has unparalleled durability with an excellent safety profile. I think it excels for men with larger prostates and those who are going to be around for a while and want durability, but do uh, seek out a surgeon who has experience with this operation as the learning curve can be a challenge or a limitation. Um, so with that, we'll conclude. Um, I hope what I illustrated uh, to you today is that there are myriad options for BPH surgical management. It can be quite daunting uh, as you're considering the, uh, again, using the term like buffet or smorgasbord of options here. Each uh, option that we discussed has its key indications and limitations. Some have broader uh, um, uh, applicability to prostate sizes. Uh, I think it's really important uh, that if you're considering surgical treatment, that the urologist has an understanding of your prostate gland size and configuration. As, as we've discussed, there are certain procedures that may not be suited to those with median low pathology or very large glands. And I think as you're considering this, I wouldn't necessarily gravitate to one surgical procedure being the best or the technology being the latest and greatest, but really trusting in your surgeon's experience uh, with each of the procedures rather than uh, valuing the latest and greatest technology, um, which over time may not prove to be the best technology. So with that, I'll conclude. Um, uh, for those interested in uh, surgical consultation with us at Michigan Medicine, um, this is our office contact information. We do offer a wide variety of treatment options for men with BPH, uh, and it was really a pleasure to chat with you today.
Love it. Okay, let me first give an introduction here. I've been moderating these conferences, at least co-moderating or moderating these conferences for, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years, depends. Now we do three conferences a year. We just started the Men's Health Conference. And it's difficult in my position because I can't have, to maintain my objectivity, I have only had one other person from Michigan at this conference to give a lecture because we want to make sure we spread the wealth and patients around the world can hear from different practitioners. But after a decade, it kind of became almost silly that we weren't including Dr. Dow to talk about since he is proficient in a procedure that not many people are proficient in. So the staff at PCR, everyone said, essentially, why aren't we getting you know, this person that we're hearing about? So if you think the next 30 minutes are shameless, it's rah, 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 Michigan, <laughs> it is shameless because I am so glad that finally one of our own, our own Michigan folks with all the Michigan beauty and the best football team in the nation, I can Go finally, blue, baby. Talk, right, baby? So I got yeah. my Michigan urology thing there. I got my Michigan pillow. So I know this is too much even for you, <laughs> Casey, but you have no idea. I've been waiting for over a decade to finally talk to someone in the department I'm associated with for our, our global meeting. So thank it's you. It's never enough when we're talking about the maize and blue. We probably just alienated everybody in Columbus, but I guess we're going to have to deal with that. <laughs> oh, well, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Last two years, I mean, we can gloat. Who cares? Yeah. So when they for now. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here's, before we start, I thought, what are the top three questions I want to ask Dr. Casey Dow? And this might surprise you. Here are my top three. Are you ready? Yep. Who's your BFF at the University of Michigan? Who is oh your Oh my best gosh, friend? that's Come, a I did, I did not realize it was going to go this way. That's no, really challenging. It is challenging, but it shouldn't take you very long because you know the answer to this. Is the answer that it's Mark Moyad? Yes, that's exactly okay. right. So you're one I, for one. One for one. Okay. Yes. Now I'm going to tell you why I'm at. What's the largest college football stadium in the United States? That would be the University of Michigan football stadium, the Big House in Ann Arbor. That's right. You're two for two, so that makes my day. Thank you. Now this one, and this is why I got to introduce it to the audience. This makes me proud. Um, you can answer this honestly. Who's the better swimmer, me or you? <laughs> so I, you I, and I'm... I got into a pool. Yeah, and we have to swim against each other. I want you to be yeah. honest. Would it be me or you? You'd be going down. Big, okay. Big <laughs> and so I agree. You're three for three. So when I, I always do background and all the speakers, here's the thing that blew my mind. And I've known you for a little while. I had no idea. I pulled this. University of Tennessee Athletics, Chapel Hill, the number 10 Tennessee men and swimming team. This is November 18th, 2004. Okay. Long time ago. And yeah. It says Casey Dow was spectacular with this qualifying time. He made the NCAAs in his 200-yard individual medley and also broke pool and meet records. You were an elite college swimmer, right? This is crazy. This is amazing. Yeah, swimming was a big part of my life. Uh, and I think for just as a it taught me a lot and opened a lot of doors for me. I, I probably wouldn't be honestly sitting here today if it weren't for some of the things that swimming did for me. That's for sure. That is awesome. And before I thought it was really incredible, something else caught my eye. I saw this name of a sister that's, okay, here's what her bio says, that she swims for Michigan. She's, I think it was in the 2012 or something. It says, Brother Curtis, this is your brother, swam at Michigan. Uh, brother Casey swam at the University of Tennessee. Mother swam at the University of Michigan. Father swam at the University of Michigan. So if I do the math, your dad and mom swam for the University of Michigan. Your sister did. Your brother did. But you swam for the University of Tennessee. Can you please explain that before I get sad? Yeah, it gets worse. My granddad, so my dad's dad, actually swam for the university as well, even before him. So uh, the, the the cliff notes to that story is I was out of the will for at least three years until my brother <laughs> and sister took the plunge to come to Ann Arbor. That's for sure. Why Tennessee? Because you grew up there? Uh, I, I, I did not grow up there. Oh, you I, I did love, not grow up I there. love old Rocky Top. The weather is delightful. The Smoky Mountains are beautiful. They have uh, a beautiful campus, great, great swimming program, uh, and great whiskey. So I mean, it was a it was a it was a trifecta for me. It's a fantastic place to to you know learn and and swim. Met some of the best friends of my life down there. So I, I love 
Tennessee. I, I would say Tennessee is another great place, Mark, for you to go try to catch a football game if you're an aficionado. Neyland Stadium is 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 tough to beat. I have been to Tennessee many times for academics and speaking, and I always stay near the stadium, and it looks great. And I, when I look at the videos, I think I would love to see a game there because last I checked, they were in the top five or six in terms of crowd number. Of course, yeah. Michigan's number one, but they're also up there in the top five or six. So that's funny you say that. I've gone by the stadium so many times, and I thought that would be a wild place to see a game. So It is a wild place to see a game. So you're forgiven – by the family and the masses that you went to Tennessee, even though everything happened at Michigan, but because you ended up at Michigan. So you ended up being the good son. Finally. That's right. Okay. That makes my day. So a peak swimmer. That is awesome. All right. Now let's talk about some stuff that I just have to get off my chest here when it comes to some of the options that you talk about. What is Here's some of the ones that you highlighted. And before we go into it, I thought we would talk a little bit about uh, some general things. Everyone uses the word learning curve, right? So I understand what that means. And that, if you think about in prostate cancer, it's the same idea. You want to you go to the best. You want to go to someone who's skilled. You don't want a pilot who's flown a plane 20 times to, to fly you. You want someone who's flown that plane a thousand times. Okay, I get that. But what about, what do you say when it comes to these procedures as far as not just the number, but the frequency? So I, I've come across situations where someone will do 50 or 100 of some procedure, but they're not necessarily doing them every week or every two weeks for the next few years. Is that something you talk about in terms of, so my question is this, what's the number, what's the magic number and what's the magic frequency of procedures? How often that makes you feel comfortable? Like what's your standard? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I think in general, um, one thing, a plug I'll give, you know, I, I learned this operation down at, uh, at Indiana Methodist Hospital, Jim Lingaman, uh, one of my closest mentors is kind of the godfather of Holep in the United States. Um, and one of the things that he said to me early on as I was learning was, if you are proficient at this and you learn it, people will find you from all over to have you do it. And so why I say that is because folks who offer this it's almost hard not to get inundated by people who want this operation. And so that lends itself to high volumes uh, mm -hmm. and doing this frequently. So for me, for instance, and I'm, you know, I'm, this is just my practice. Everyone's probably a little bit different. I operate between three and four days a week. Uh, and two of those days, since I also take care of kidney stone patients are dedicated to doing this operation. So somewhere between four and eight of these operations a week on a wow. weekly basis throughout the year. So I would, you know, I'm certainly not the highest volume surgeon that I know. There are others that do more of this than I do. Um, but someone that's operating at that level with that consistency is, I think, what you're looking for. Okay. That helps me a lot because we we often talk about the learning part, but what about the people that learned it? It's like a radical prostatectomy or something, but they're not doing it that often. They got to be busy. So that helps me. Now let's go to some other general thoughts. I, I thought about some BPH goalposts before we talk about the surgical options. And I, I wanted you to comment on some of these. These are terms that people hear all the time and it's difficult to explain what they mean. So maybe we can explain them together, especially you, um, because these are how you measure how well the surgeon does or how well a, a, a pill does, for example. So can you talk a little bit of, because I've got both of them here. Can you talk? I know that they want to see an IPSS reduction. They want to see a prostate score they want to see improvement in one of these questionnaires. Can you talk about that yeah. for a second? Why is that important? Yeah, so I, I see you have the Urology Care Foundation. Um, that's the philanthropic side of the AUA. Um, these are validated symptom questionnaires that ask patients a variety of symptoms, things like how often is your stream weak? How often do you have to strain to urinate? Are you getting up at night? Are you going frequently? Are you going urgently? Um, uh, and so you get a numeric score, which can categorize your symptoms as mild, moderate, or severe. I think as importantly, these questionnaires ask a question about quality of life. So you're not just putting a number on it. You're also telling the provider how bothered you are by the symptoms you have. And that's important because um, one could imagine a person who's exhibiting by numbers, severe urinary symptoms, but if they're happy as a clam by quality of life, it's really hard to make that person better. So these indices, these symptom indices are really important for us as providers to understand what patients would like and what they might need. Okay. So then why, this is my question and for the advocacy groups, why don't we just have this, why don't we have these online 
And people can fill these out before they come see you because I can fill this out before I come see you. So I understand that you do it in the clinic and I understand it's important, but, but these can be done at home too, before they go see the urologist or is, am I missing? Is there a problem? hundred percent. Yeah. All these are, all these are public access. And then I honestly, in most places, and I believe our clinic is no exception, we're sending you, uh, uh, especially with the kind of rollout of virtual healthcare, a lot of these things we're asking you to answer beforehand um, so that you're not spending time doing that in the office. Though, if you were to come see us in the office, I think you'll get a tablet or something where you can do a quick and dirty symptom indice. But absolutely, these are things that you can do and find uh, on the internet. Do you find that the uh, partner should be filling it out also for the for the person? I mean, <laughs> it seems like, how many times have you been in the situation? And we have yeah. mutual friends this way where the guy will go, uh, yeah, yeah, no, not a big deal. And then you talk to the partner, the partner goes, wait a second, these numbers don't correlate with what I'm seeing. Yeah, I mean, it's I like, almost, I almost wonder if the person who's dealing with BPH should fill it out and then the, the partner should fill it out. Or am I, am I not thinking right here? No, I mean, I think that everyone has their own take on the matter. I, I, I think it's great when uh, partners come to the office together because the eye roll that the, uh, uh, that the non-affected partner has in the corner is pretty telling when say, for instance, the man says, yeah, I get up one time at night and then their spouse or partner is just total eye rolls, like five. It's, you know, it's, it always makes for a little bit of an interesting thing. Yes. I think in general, men uh, are pretty good at minimizing um, some of the bother uh, of their symptoms. And so having a partner there is, is important to kind of provide a little reference. Beautiful. Okay, here's another goalpost. Emphasis on goalpost because Michigan has gone to the, the, the uh, final four the past two years in football. This year, we're going to win it all, but I'm not biased. Let's talk about... People talk about prostate volume or size. Why, why do you want to see a reduction in size with any treatment or the volume go down? Um, because here's what I learned in school. I learned there are some men that have really big prostates and they don't have urinary issues. And some men who have really tiny prostates and they have bad urinary issues and of course, vice versa. But this is one of the things that surgeons like you you look to see a volume or size reduction, especially big prostates. Can you comment on why that's important or not important, prostate size? Yeah, uh, I think the, the point you made before, Mark, is key for listeners, though, which is that prostate size in and of itself is not all we're current concerned about. And you highlighted the option or the idea of the man with a very large prostate who, again, is happy as a clam. That's not someone who I would ever offer surgery. Um, and there are men with very small prostates who are totally miserable and would benefit from outlet surgery. For, for me, I think that volume reduction, prostate volume reduction correlates with durability. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in procedures like aquablation uh, or HOLEP, for instance, where, you know, we're talking about a 40, somewhere upwards of 70 to 80% size reduction with things like HOLEP, that bulk of tissue that's removed will not regrow. And that's why at 10 years, you're looking at a retreatment rate of less than 1%. So for me, that's really important. That, that's, that, that should not be the defining characteristic of any procedure, but I think that's where some of the volume reductive surgeries really hold the most benefit. Okay, all right. And then here's another one that you, you don't hear often, but this is a part of studies when it comes to BPH procedures. I understand, but I put it in your words. Why is a... You want, we want a PSA reduction. Is that something you look for after a procedure? I mean, that anytime there's a PSA reduction, I think that must be a good thing. So what's the significance of also following PSA after these procedures? Yeah, I mean, so I think it depends on the patient's characteristics, right? Um, in men who are, you know, octogenarians over 80, who PSA screening probably doesn't have much benefit. I don't know that it makes any difference to check it afterwards, but PSA in these settings is likely a surrogate for prostate size. So larger prostates, we typically see a linear increase in patient's PSA. So if I'm doing a, pro, a hole up on a man who has a very large prostate and a preoperative PSA of 15, they've been screened for prostate cancer with either MRI or biopsy and it's negative, by taking out 70 to 80 grams of tissue, that PSA postoperatively will drop substantially. So it's really a surrogate for volume and size reduction. Beautiful. Here's another one that comes up on slides and it comes up in discussions, but can you comment on the pros and cons of it and why it's important? It's called a PVR, post void residual. Why do you care ab about a PVR and what the HE double toothpicks is a PVR? Yeah, so PVR stands for post void residual. Basically after a man or woman pees, we do a ultrasound in the office to see how empty the bladder is. 
So in an ideal circumstance, the bladder should empty completely. Now there's variability in that, right? There's no good or bad PVR necessarily. Um, it, it all varies based on patients, but in general, we want to see a PVR less than around 150. Um, okay. And as the PVR increases, it puts patients at risk for things like infection, bladder stones, and heaven forbid, some deterioration of kidney function. Okay. So that's always a part of measuring it. You want to see it, you want to see it go down with the procedure, but correct. The PVR would naturally go up as with aging, right? Because I mean, we just, as I get older, I feel like my PVR is going up just now. Yeah, it, it correlates with obstruction um, okay. uh, or or patients whose bladders don't function um, well. Um, that's that's what we, where we see elevations in P, PVR. Okay. And, and tell me again, if you're holding a lot of PVR and you're not emptying, what are some of the consequences? You said you can get urinary tract infections and other bad things like that, right? Yeah, patients can form bladder stones. Patients uh, in severe circumstances can actually have reflux or backup of that urine into the kidneys, which can cause kidney failure. Um, uh -huh. So uh, certainly uh, considerations are made there when it comes to PVR elevation. Qmax. I know this is called the flow rate, but can you patients and people will watch this and they'll see these words Qmax. What's mm -hmm. better, a high Qmax, a low Qmax? And how the heck do you measure my flow rate? How, how do I know if I got good flow? There's a lot of ways to measure it. What we typically do in the office is that men will pee through a specialized hat, so to speak, and it quantifies how fast the urine is coming out in cc's or milliliters per second. So we want to see a, a, a higher um, a Q max or peak flow, it correlates with the force and strength of the urine stream. And so that's highly associated with the degree of obstruction. So one could imagine if the prostate was pushing against the urethra and causing substantial obstruction, the stream would be really weak. That's a common symptom that men describe post-surgery. We would hope that it would be much stronger. Okay. So with a good procedure, my flow rate's going to increase. Correct. Okay. Now, listen, I got really good flow, as you probably know or don't know. And this is when I talk, sit around the department. I tell people I have the best flow. And so when you say these men go into a device, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they they do an entire urination into a device, in, into this like cone or funnel. And then that, Correct. Measures, that measures the Qmax. Yep. All right. Now, this is a half joke, but it's not. What's the splash rate here? Because I'm thinking I got to go into a cone. Is it going to really capture all the urine or is it going to splash like a bad urinal in an airport that I don't want to be in? I think aim is important. That would be what I would say. That, that, okay. that it could be it could be a, a, a messy proposition, but you know, thankfully our medical assistants and folks in the office provide really good counseling so that the splashback, as you describe it, is pretty uncommon. Am I, so I'm, I'm consuming fluids before I do this? I'm a, or, did, uh, I in most cases, we just ask that you don't urinate before you come to the office. And so the okay. first thing we do when we room you is send you to the bathroom to do the Euroflow. And then immediately afterwards, we'd scan the bladder to get that PVR or residual. Okay, that's awesome. So that explains some of the vernacular that goes on. Here are some of the additional. I took this off of the AUA website. These are some other things that they have people look at. They said that you can also look at your creatinine blood test, you know, kidney function. Do you do that? And 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 why why am I doing a blood test to look at kidney function before or after the procedure? I mean, I know it's optional, but yeah. So in general, um, any man who's going to have surgery in the operating room uh, at a baseline, the anesthesiology team typically wants some basic labs to be collected. So that's okay. how I'm utilizing it. There are circumstances where a man may have had really profound urinary retention where at baseline, they start out with their kidney function being poor. And so following that those values over time is important for their general health. But that's why I think the AUA includes it as an option. Okay. Um, it's not it's not necessary uh, in all patients. Okay, so now we've kind of gone all over the basic vernacular and then you've added a few. You've added a couple during your talk that you made me think of. So let me add it. You use the words... And nucleation. So what, what mm -hmm. does a nucleation mean? Am I, that, does that mean I'm taking out the nucleus? I'm taking out the portion of the prostate that makes a difference? What's the Yeah, it's, word? it's a great question. So I'll use a opposite example. When a man has a TERP, um, essentially the urologist is shaving small pieces, we call them chips, out yeah. of the prostate. And so the, the uh, urologist is widening out a channel for the urine to, to um, flow. A nucleation, I like to think of as almost like taking the fruit out of an orange, but leaving the rind of the orange okay. behind. 
though we're taking out large, large chunks of tissue. In the case of HOLEP, maybe one huge chunk of tissue if it's being done in a specific way. Uh, and, and that rind uh, is what's called the capsule of the prostate. So removing all that tissue or nucleating all that tissue down to the capsule is what really um, lends itself to the durability of the procedure and, and the outcomes that we see. Okay, that's great. So you want a very good enucleation, basically. That's predictive of a good response. Um, Correct. Why is urinary retention that urologists use this word all the time? If I don't want him to go into urinary, urinary retention, oh boy, he went into urinary retention. What's urinary retention to you? And why is this such a swear word? Why is it a bad thing? Well, it really negatively impacts men's quality of life, right? So urinary retention in most cases means that you cannot urinate on your own. And okay. acutely, the way we manage that is by putting a catheter into the man's penis and bladder to drain the bladder. So those are uncomfortable. They need to be carried around. They um, they just are, are, no one wants to have a catheter. Um, so that's why retention is such a, a life-changing thing for a guy. Yeah. And so that's something you never want to experience. That's a medical emergency, isn't it? It is. Do you see guys coming in retention? Totally. You do. They've just yep. gone to that point. They, I mean, correct. Yeah, their symptoms of them. symptoms have worsened to the point where their bladder no longer is able to push urine past obstruction. Um, so you know, I would I would anticipate somewhere between twenty five and forty percent of the patients that I see are in retention. Now, not all those men are managed with a catheter that's in the in the bladder all the time. Men can yeah. actually pass a catheter intermittently. We call that clean intermittent catheterization. So they'll use a small uh, clean catheter, drain the bladder, and then discard it and do that several times a day. But even yeah. still, most of those men aren't urinating on their own. And if that goes on a long time without it being relieved, that can be catastrophic. That can be. Yeah, that's where we really start to think about kidney damage, right? So if, if a man hasn't urinated in, let's say, 24 to you know 36 hours, that's where the pressure you know generated in the bladder has nowhere to go, but typically up into the kidneys. And that's where we'll see people come in with profound kidney dysfunction. Yikes. Okay. And then you used another word that I just want to clarify. And, and urologists and people throw this word out all the time, but you kind of have to ex explain this to us, to me. They talk about this median lobe. They talk about lateral lobe and a median lobe obstruction and median lobe. It goes in the, so part of the reason you decide what procedure to have is whether or not you have a median lobe issue. And I guess let's start with what is a median lobe? And then why should I be concerned about it? Yeah. So median lobe uh, is basically, it's a very distinct growth of the prostate that actually begins to protrude into the bladder. I like to think of a median lobe kind of like the flapper or the stopper in the back of your toilet, right? Uh -huh. So the way that that thing works is when your tank wants to fill, it closes over the uh, area that allows the, the water to flow out and it allows the tank to fill. In the reverse, that's what's happening in the bladder. That median lobe is is obstructing or ball valving against the outlet of the bladder, and men can't empty their bladder well. So in general, median lobes are highly obstructive. Um, and uh, when that sort of thing happens, you get into a situation where urination can become difficult. And so I think that it's uh, uh, something that we you know, certainly should be looking for when we're evaluating men. So men who are watching this, they've got to talk. If they have a doctor looking up there, they have to talk about what's the deal with this median lobe. Do I have a median lobe? Yeah, it's just important for men to know what configuration of the prostate they have, because I think median lobe is predictive of how well they do with medical therapy. So some okay. of the guys I see that most commonly are failing an alpha blocker is because they just have such an obstructive median lobe that it's really not going to be beneficial. And certainly some procedures are not best suited to a median lobe. Okay. that's a, So that's a big deal. Is that as big a deal as just knowing the word lateral lobe, what the lateral lobes are? That's just uh, kind of the rest of the prostate. So the prostate okay. circumferentially surrounds the urethra um, and the lateral lobe tissue is just the uh, additional tissue around the uh, prostatic urethra. I decided to make a table that we're going to talk about a different time. I mean, man, there's, this is a BPH medication world. I mean, this is just a short list. <laughs> and in the old days, I used to think, hey, what's the big deal? But can you tell me the pros and cons of, of I, I don't want you to go necessarily through, we don't, we don't have to go through the meds. I'm just saying, what's the pro and con here? Is the pro that it can help some men and the con is that some men just stay on these too long and they don't realize they can get a procedure? I mean, what's your just general 
thoughts on all these medications and the po- the pluses and negatives as a group as a whole yeah i mean it's it's a it's a balance of effectiveness and tolerability right like that that's right. that's that's medicine in general and so there are men that might be totally happy on an alpha blocker for the rest of their lives with minimal side effects a very different guy could have horrible nasal congestion malaise and 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 lightheadedness with <clears throat> with a medication like that and want to do anything to get off it so i think all of them have their benefits um, but, uh, no one is a panacea and they're not going to be perfect for every different guy. The reason I sought you out a couple of times is the people that you treated, uh, they went completely off medication and I'm thinking, well, wow, that, that should be the goal of a procedure. They go off their medications. They thought they were going to be on lifelong. And so isn't that one of your, and other people should be one of their success points or goalposts is let's see if we can get them off of any or all of this stuff. Right. hundred percent agree. Yeah. Okay. hundred percent agree. The goal yeah. of any of these surgeries should be to get men off medications. Okay. And then before we go into the last part, I want to talk about prostate size, you know, cause they always say a normal gland is a walnut. I don't know why we picked walnut, but they picked walnut. And then they talk about a plum being a plus one. And then they talk about a grapefruit. I couldn't find a grapefruit in my house. So I found this and, uh, and, So these sizes get larger and larger, but what are you seeing today in terms of prostate size? Have we kind of, it would seem, I would think that in this generation of the doctors who are treating this, that you're seeing some pretty big prostates. Can you comment on just prostate size? I mean, I'm hearing these stories where, you know, a normal prostate size runs what? I mean, is it 15, 20 cc's, or I mean, what, what's a, what's a 20 gram prostate? What's, what's a normal prostate size and what's the average that you're seeing? Yeah. So prostate size varies with age, right? Uh, that's the right. first thing. So a, a young man's prostate might be in that range you described, but I kind of tell guys, and this is not perfect, that their prostate is somewhere between 30 and 50 grams, depending on how old they are. Um, my practice doing what I do is highly enriched for men with large prostates um, because the people that are getting sent to me around the state are are typically guys who um, have been told that a Terp, for instance, may not be best choice for them because they have 120 gram prostate and we're talking about HOLEP. Um, I would say the average prostate that I'm seeing in the office is somewhere between 80 and 150 grams. And let's say someone's watching from India or they're watching from South Africa somewhere in the world and they they're interested in what you do. Uh, They're interested in finding a competent position besides seeing you, are you in a small enough community where you might know, you know, who might be doing these in Singapore or California or Texas, or, I mean, is it possible that if someone does a video consult or something, and you've got a competent person who does a certain procedure in another part of the world that the office can say, Hey, have you talked about seeing so-and-so? Does that happen? I would actually, you know, this has not necessarily been studied, but I would say my sense is that we probably lag behind other countries uh, in offering, uh, I should say, developed countries in offering HOLEP um, or enucleation in general. I think it's been widely popularized in Europe, um, uh, uh, Southeast Asia. um, uh, And I think that's fantastic. So there are, you know, we are a relatively tight knit community in the United States. And so, you know, I, 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 you know, I certainly don't know everybody, but I, I, yeah. I have a pretty good sense for geographically who's offering this this procedure. Um, uh, probably less so in the in the uh, internationally, but uh, as I said, in, in Europe, for instance, this is much more widely disseminated than it is in the United States. Okay, you talked about terp, and my daddy did terps, and um, he did them over at the VA and at St. Joe's, and my dad said, you know. You really got to learn these things. They're really great procedures. I remember you would talk about TERPs. And so tell me just uh, off the top of your head, forget the slides for a second. Maybe they could be a repeat of the slides. When you think of pros and cons of TERPs today, because people use this word, I've heard this a million times from patients and people in the public, the word roto-rooter, and that doesn't imply, and roto-rooter is a good thing, but I don't think that's a positive necessarily visual. But what's your pro and con off the top of your head of TERP right now of someone seeking a TERP? Uh, pro is that, uh, you can, it's in the wheelhouse of almost every urologist. Um, so you're likely to find surgical expertise, uh, with many urologists. I think that's a huge pro, um, con, uh, with, uh, with TERP for me is especially as prostates increase in size, 
Um, the post-operative course can be a bit rockier. And what I mean by that is if all the tissue is not removed out of the capsule, then you run the risk of a little bit more bleeding post-surgery. And that can lend itself to needing a catheter for a bit longer and long-term a recurrence. What's the learning curve on this? Because I thought you had to do a ton of TERPs to be good at TERP. Is that true? I think that's a I think that's a really important highlight, Mark. And that is that, you know, we say that there's a learning curve with HOLA, but there's a learning curve with TERP. And there are probably, yeah. there, there are definitely urologists that are better resectionists, TERP uh, surgeons than than others. And so I, I, I still think that experience is, is massively important for our patients when they're talking about these options. What's the crossover on some of these procedures you talked about? In other words, can, have you dealt with someone that had one type of procedure and then they come for you to get a, your, the procedure that you do? I mean, are, 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 is this kind of a, when you're doing these things like TERP and other things, these minimally invasive surgical therapies, they call them, they call them MIST. Is it tough to do crossover or do you see that? When no, it's not, it's not tough to do crossover. Um, there's been several studies written looking at how patients do if they've had a prior procedure with a, a, an, another procedure, specifically, I think with some of these kind of end of the road surgeries like HOLEP, um, you know, somewhere around 10% of the patients I see 10 to 15% have had a prior procedure um, and, and either had suboptimal outcomes or just out, outright treatment failure. And so we, we do that pretty routinely. Uh, pro and con of Eurolift prostatic, urethral lift, urolift, and I'm going to add, I'm going to add something I found recently after you go through your pro and con. What, what, off the top of your head, what do you think is a pro and con? Uh, pro is really minimal risk of uh, erectile, or excuse me, of ejaculatory dysfunction. So forward ejaculation is preserved. Con is questions around durability. Okay. I'll tell you, you know, I, I'm not picking on Eurolift. I'm just saying that I, you know, I have to always report the literature for the physicians as well as the advocacy groups. And Journal of Urology, Cleveland Clinic just published a case series. Well, to me, a retrospective series at one institution that they found that putting in that those clips, the device, in some people negatively affected uh, prostatic magnetic imaging uh, (MRI). So what they said was in this latest Journal of Urology article it might cause a significant artifact on prostate MRI. I was trying to get an answer to this for the past two years. And so I I don't know. I don't know if you've heard about that yet. This is a new one that just got published and they're not saying it's highly significant. They're saying it could be a problem for a subset of men. I just think that's interesting. I don't know. Yeah, I, and I, again, uh, MRI is becoming more common for prostate cancer screening and uh, certainly following men that are on active surveillance radiologists, uh, there is some subjectivity to the way we sc score these things. And so certainly yeah. if you're someone who's had a Eurolift, maybe having a couple radiologists view the film to make sure that there's some consensus on what they're seeing would be important. Yeah, that's a good point. Because I've seen a lot of men very happy with Eurolift. Eurolift's a great thing. A lot of my friends do Eurolift, but I also want to know what the catches are. And, and we couldn't get the, we weren't always getting the answer on MRI because I don't know if we knew it, but that's a good point. You know, don't be scared to get a couple of opinions, a couple of people looking at it if you need an MRI and there's concerns of prostate cancer. Um, the next one you had, I'm just, was resume or water vapor, water vapor thermal therapy, uh, pro and con of that. Uh, pro kind of like Eurolift is office-based. Um, uh, so no general anesthesia, low risk of uh, uh, sexual side effects vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, integrate ejaculation and, and very low risk of, of incontinence, even transient. I'd say the con is it's relatively uncomfortable in, in the experience that I have doing it, uh, having done maybe two dozen um, uh, before I, in many ways, abandoned it. Uh, even with a good prostate block, men are somewhat uncomfortable during the procedure. Uh, and it does create a fair bit of those prostatitis symptoms that I, that I mentioned. Now that's self-limited. I'm not saying that yeah. men will be left with that permanently, but that's definitely a consideration. When you say a good prostate block, what do you mean by prostate block? Meaning um, much like when a man has a transrectal prostate biopsy or even a transperineal prostate biopsy, um, local anesthetic is, is infiltrated into the areas around the prostate to hopefully help with some anesthesia during the procedure, local anesthesia. And even yeah. if that's done well, I've experienced men who still have a fair bit of bother when the, when the treatment cycle is happening. I think people get confused. <laughs> Look how much work you make me do, Casey. You make me do a lot of work because you're Michigan and I also like Tennessee. I thought, I don't care. If Casey wants me to work, I'll work for him. I just decided to list some of the procedures. I mean, this is a, this is a daunting list of procedures and I'll go back to this at the very end, but I think people get confused 
by resume water vapor water vapor thermal therapy and aquablation because right mm -hmm. aqua is water but but resume uses thermal therapy whereas aquablation doesn't use heat as much as it uses a hydro jet right so Correct. Uh, but remember when if you're watching this there is a difference between resume water vapor thermal therapy and aquablation so now let's move to aquablation What's your pro and con of aquablation before we now finish with yours? Your yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the newer kids on the block, that's for sure. Um, I think it holds great promise. Um, the pros are that uh, it is mapped with real-time ultrasound, the treatment planning is. And so, you know, preserving vital structures around the apex of the prostate uh, lends to a lower risk uh, of urinary incontinence uh, okay. and some degree of preservation of, of, of ejaculatory function. Um, I think the con uh, is its widespread availability at this point. Um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, the, I think the jury is out on the durability of the aquablation. And I only say that because, you know, um, there's an old mantra that, that, uh, that it, talking about TERP, that where a resectionist or a TERP surgeon really makes their money, so to speak, is their apical dissection, the, the, the removal of tissue at the apex of the prostate. And doing that well, I think, uh, is is what um, a good resectionist will will do to limit risk of recurrence. Aquablation is specifically leaving vital structures back there, which help with outcomes. Um, but I think that may lend itself to a, a, a recurrence rate that might be closer to something like TERP. And then you mentioned PAE, um, the arterial embolization. The you know it's getting a, a little bit of attention. We get a lot of calls on it and a lot of questions on it. And the pro and con of, and I didn't even put that on the list. I got so tired of making this list that I didn't add it. Uh, pro and con of PAE. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the plug I would make before we even talk pro and con is that um, medicine is a collaborative specialty field. And, and, and I think any urologist uh, is going to need to have a great collaboration with their interventional radiologist because there's so much overlap between our specialties. Yeah. PAE is one where there's the overlap or intersection in BPH. It's certainly not for all patients, um, but there is uh, definitely, I think, a role for it. Um, I think the jury is still out on exactly what patients are best suited to PAE. Where I'm using in my practice is primarily those that are just patients that aren't fit for a haircut, right? Their, their anesthetic risks are through the roof, but they have bothersome urinary symptoms. Um, and it can be done under local with sedation. Uh, it's, uh, you know, acceptable in all circumstances with patients on anticoagulation, though I'll say with HOLEP, we can do that as well. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where I'm utilizing it, but that's not to say it's the only place it should be utilized. That's a great answer. That's, that's a great overview. Okay. So uh, now let me go through my last one, which is this HOLEP. And I'm going to give you, since you do HOLEP, I'm going to tell you, my pro and con, and then we're going to go through my master list of questions that people should ask, and then we'll finish up. Is that good? Sure. So here's my pro. I got guys and gals like you that do it. I've seen unbelievable results in people who are on medications and they got off their medications. And I'll talk about some other benefits I saw that was really interesting to me. The con that I read every time I pull up a website is always two things. Steep learning curve, and I got to go under general anesthesia. So give me your, give me your brief pros and cons, and then then we'll just talk about that procedure a little bit. Yeah, again, I, I'm incredibly biased. I think it's, I think it's the best surgical procedure for men with BPH. I'll just come out and say it. Um, right. That's not to say that uh, there aren't side effects uh, any time that we do surgery, and so. Uh, you know, the pros that I give for HOLEP is, again, uh, it is agnostic to the size of your prostate, the configuration of your prostate. Uh, uh, and I think that's that's huge. I think the other pro is that uh, it is the most reliable surgical procedure, in my opinion, taking into account prostate size and configuration for getting men that are in urinary retention urinating again on their own yeah, uh, without the need for a catheter and without the need for medications. And Additional bonus, it should be a pretty darn durable operation in the sense that you're not going to need retreatment, another surgery in 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah, and I don't think it's a con to say steep learning curve. I don't want someone just to be able to pick it up on a whim and just go, anybody can do this. I mean, I, I would hope it's technologically challenging, but uh, but what about the whole general anesthesia part? Do you worry about that, that people have to undergo general anesthesia? 
Yeah, it's always a consideration, right? The only minor surgery is the surgery you're not having on yourself, right? So I, that's a consideration for family members and things like that. I think the multidisciplinary aspect of our teams and, and understanding patient surgical risk is key in counseling. Uh, and so that's why you've got to have a great partnership with your preoperative clinics and your anesthesia providers. I think uh, overwhelmingly anesthesia is safe. Um, uh, and especially if patients are counseled and empowered with information around what to expect around anesthesia and some of the side effects, that it's a, it's a safe way to go. Okay. So then how long am I knocked out? I mean, how long, what's the, what's your, I mean, I know this is tough. You treat all sorts of prostate sizes and what's the average time I got to be out while you're doing your thing? A nucleation time, the time it actually takes for you to remove the tissue, yeah. uh, is relatively constant. Uh, certainly for really, really large prostates, uh, that part may take a little bit longer, but I would say roughly speaking somewhere in the 30 to 60 minute range for the enucleation portion of the operation. Um, okay. and then morselation is where we use the device to basically gobble up that tissue and remove it. That device, uh, is, is, is heavily tied to largest size or the size of the prostate, right? So it can enucleate or more slight tissue at a specific grams per minute. And so there's some variability there. If you're if you're more slating a very large chunk of tissue, it's going to take longer than if it's a very small piece of tissue. So all told, you're probably in the operating room under anesthesia for somewhere between 90 minutes or so. Uh, at really large prostates, maybe two hours. Okay. And then when all these procedures involve slicing tissue, morselating, getting rid of tissue, and it comes out, and do you ever worry? You're always going to get this question the rest of your career the question still is going around with biopsies. Do you ever worry that it could spread cancer? I don't. Um, I, I would, um, I would certainly have a little bit of pause if we saw like a large coexisting bladder tumor, but that's a fundamentally different type of a cancer. Um, okay. I, I would have some reservations about, you know, removing that and then doing a, a whole or a terp or anything in that setting. But um, you know, Mark, we probably find low risk prostate cancer, that being like low risk Gleason grade one or Gleason six prostate cancer, low volume in around 15% of men who have this operation. So that really just gets at how commonly we find that in general in an aging population. Yeah. Uh, and I don't have any reservations uh, about that at all. Because I mean, all these procedures do, they have to get rid of tissue. You'd think if there was an issue, we'd have heard about it long ago, not just with the whole, Agreed. Thing, right? Agreed. All right. Here's how we'll finish today. We, I'm going to go through the Mark Moyad master list of just things I think about if I'm going to have Casey or someone treat me and I go through this list in my head and I make these lists up. So if any patients or the public are listening, whether this require whether this um, goes with whole app or whether this goes with radical a prostatectomy, it doesn't matter. This could be a heart procedure. These are the kind of things I make a list before I go see my own doctor of what I would just like to know. So I get comfortable before I have to go in, whether it's a colonoscopy or you name it. So I'm, let me take you through this list. And first of all, before the list starts, how do I even begin to think that I need one of, or any of these procedures you talked about? How would I even begin to evolve to that point? Is that something where, is that a misery index? Because I know conservative options are great, but what's your general advice before we go through my final list of when do I start thinking about going to see somebody like you? Yeah, I think it's the, um, by and large, not exclusively, but by and large, it's patients who have bothersome urinary symptoms. So the guy who, you know, used to be getting up once at night, if he had a few beers before bed, getting up at five, you know, five, six times at night, no matter what he drinks before bedtime, yeah. um, you know, really weak stream during the day, things like that. Many men that end up in a urologist's office have probably already been put on medications by their primary care doctor. Yeah. And so, you know, one, you know, in many instances that medicine helps initially, but when those symptoms return, despite medication, that's when I think we really need to start thinking about other options. Okay. That so progression, some type of, prog that, mm -hmm. that's great. Okay. Here, here's my list. I'm coming to see you. Does it matter how young or old I am? If I need a procedure, including the procedure you give me, it, does, it, does, does my age matter here? Uh, I think maybe to a degree. Uh, I tell patients that, um, you know, the the 60 year old that comes in having this procedure is probably going to bounce back faster than the 88 year old that has the surgery. That being said, uh, I, you know, don't really have an upper limit or cutoff for patients age. I think it's just counseling is important. Okay. Do you find it with this procedure that the, the health of the patient going into the procedure is a partially predictive of how they're going to do after the procedure in terms of recovery? Is that old adage still true? 
Uh, to a, to an extent, um, certainly those that require anticoagulation, for instance, and we're navigating that around the time of surgery, uh, those with really uh, uh, poor immune systems, whether they're on drugs for autoimmune disease or those with really poorly controlled diabetes, right, that impacts wound healing. So certainly those comorbid conditions have a bearing on patients' recovery. Um, okay. None of those things are necessarily a deal breaker, but that's kind of like the patient provider contract. We got to talk about all those things. Okay. And then the anesthesia we mentioned, you do general, they do that general anesthesia for this. You talked about the time. What about antibiotics? Do I need antibiotics with these procedures? Do I have to take so our, it? Pre, yeah, pre so our guidelines would say that at the time of surgery, you should absolutely have a dose of antibiotics. That'll be given, administered through the IV in most cases. My okay. general practice is for folks that are catheterizing themselves at baseline, for instance, or have a history of urinary tract infections. My custom is to get a urine sample before surgery. If it's positive, patients will get a few days of antibiotics before surgery. But it's not common to be on long-term antibiotics after surgery. Absolutely not. Does it matter my prostate size? What if I've got a grapefruit? What I got a 100 cc, 120? Where is, you used a word one time when I saw you in the hospital at Chelsea, you said a sweet spot or something. Where's the sweet spot? Where, what am I thinking in terms of prostate size and whether I can get whole up? Yeah. So I think I use the word sweet spot when I'm talking about training kind of the next generation of hopefully folks that are going to do whole up. And um, those patients with prostates between 80 and 120 grams, it's just a very manageable size. Typically the surgical planes are really well preserved. Um, so for learners, that's a great size to start. Um, realistically, no size is off limits. Um, uh, I, I, I typically use that sweet spot size for, for guys uh, as we're talking about learning. Okay. So really... Like the AUA says, it doesn't matter the prostate size. If you need the treatment, it's for prostates of all sizes. Correct. What about a transfusion or bleeding? Do I have to worry about that? Uh, I counsel all men that there's a risk. Um, in my hands, the transfusion rate is far less than 1%. It's a, it's a maybe once, once a year type of a thing. And typically those are not surprises, right? It's the guy who comes in who is, you know, needs to remain on Plavix because they had a recent stroke or something like that, where, you know, we're doing a surgery in some a bit more heroic circumstances. Okay. And again, for the audience listening, I am asking my questions of Holep specifically, if, if whether or not I want to go see Dr. Dow or another doctor, these are the kind of questions I think about. It doesn't mean you can't apply them to any of the other procedures that we talked about today. Okay. I'm taking aspirin or I'm taking a prescribed anticoagulant like Eliquis or something. Do I got to stop that before you treat me for a certain period of time or can I stay on my aspirin? I mean, where do you stand with that? Yeah. So those that are taking aspirin just for general preventive health, I would ask to stop. But those that have cardiac disease or a history of stroke, I'm very comfortable with you remaining on aspirin for the procedure. Typically, we'll decrease the dose to 81 milligrams. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it's pretty uncommon in this day and age to not be able to briefly interrupt uh, some of the anticoagulants like Eliquis or Xarelto and things like that. So again, somewhere around two to three days for those drugs for me. Um, but in situations where, for instance, someone has a mechanical heart valve where, you know, it absolutely needs to be on board, um, we'll, we'll typically still consider something like a Lovenox bridge for those patients. Okay. Um, so they're essentially done while on anticoagulation. Okay. And if I'm not on one of these drugs for blood thinning and um, I want to take something for discomfort after the procedure five days later, can I take aspirin? Do I got to take Tylenol? What do you generally recommend I can take if I don't feel comfortable? I'm pretty, pretty darn comfortable with patients taking anti-inflammatories like Motrin, okay. Advil, Aleve, and things like that pretty much immediately after surgery. Um, uh, I would probably avoid aspirin as first line pain control, but something like Motrin, Aleve, things, Tylenol, certainly. And one of the benefits of the surgery that I do is that really pain is not present in most patients after surgery. Uh, what about weight BMI? If I'm a very large BMI, very small BMI, or just, I'm at a healthy, I'm, I'm at a healthy weight, or they say I'm on an unhealthy weight. I'm carrying too much adipose tissue. Does this impact the procedure at all? Uh, two things I'd say about that men who are larger, um, just mechanically, it's a longer distance for us to work. And so in mm. some cases that can make the procedure more technically challenging. Um, though I'd say there's workarounds to that. I do counsel men, especially those that have substantial abdominal obesity, that they may struggle with the uh, incontinence, the stress leakage a bit more after surgery. Um, uh, but, uh, that's really the extent of it. Any sort of measure of an unhealthy weight 
it still it doesn't negate me. I can still get this procedure. It might just take Correct. a little longer, and the recovery might be different. Great to know. Correct. Here's another one that people don't realize: you're going through a lot of tissue, and then that tissue is discarded. Do you test the tissue for cancer so that when the tissue comes out of the person mm -hmm. and it goes wherever it goes, it doesn't stay in the body? You test it for cancer just anyway? That's correct. Yep. All the tissue is sent to the pathologist for review. Okay. That's that's great. What about a catheter? Do I mean, I need a catheter after you give me a whole app? Do I have to put a uh, catheter in myself? Yep. Yep. So while the patient's asleep, they'll have a catheter inserted at the end of surgery. My general practice is for patients that are earlier in the day, um, I will offer them what's called a same day discharge with avoiding trial. So what I mean by that is they wake up from surgery with a catheter. We're running some fluid through the bladder to keep the urine flushed and clear. If the urine's nice and clear, um, I'll run a few bags of fluid through and then take their catheter out and let them urinate that same day and potentially go home without a catheter. Okay. Those patients that are done later in the day, we typically have just an overnight catheterization and we take their catheter out the morning after surgery and let them go home without one. Okay. So the catheter time, if you need it, is very short. Less than 24 hours in, in almost all circumstances. Great. Uh, do I have any diet or exercise restrictions after you treat me? Uh, I mean, I tell people to avoid vigorous aerobic exercise while their urine is still bloody. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I joke with folks like, you know, if you're not a big, you know, guy that's working out, like don't take up powerlifting next week, right? I want you to <laughs> take it easy a little bit, but uh, activities of normal daily living, like shopping, walking flights of stairs, driving a car, all those things are fair game pretty much immediately. Okay. Fabulous. And you said blood in the urine. So am I expecting some blood in my urine after the procedure? Yeah, I tell folks uh, around a week or two, I think that that's probably a bit dependent on how large the prostate uh, was. Um, okay. Guys that we would take out a massive chunk of tissue, they may have a bit more prolonged bleeding than, than the folks where they had a smaller, more modest sized prostate. How long do I have to stay in the hospital after you treat me? Is it, can I go home the same day? Do I have to wait two days? What's, what's the average? Yeah. So I would say the average is just an overnight observation stay. But in those patients we talked about that are earlier in the day um, that are seeking that same day discharge, you're home same day. Okay, great. Does, will my insurance pay for what you're doing? Yes. Yes, okay. they will. Okay. That's good to know. So uh, what about medications needed after the procedure? Do I need any new medications after the procedure? I know the goal is to come off of the BPH medications, which yep. I've always loved that goal. What about, are you going to put me on any that I'm going to be on the next couple months? My general uh, uh, protocol is that men will be sent home with some Tylenol for pain control uh, right. and a medication called pyridium, which is a kind of a urinary anesthetic. It makes the urine look neon orange. That helps with the burning with urination um, just for a few days. And then guys right. who have really high risk for infection, uh, I will put on a couple of days of antibiotics, but that's, that's pretty uncommon. Okay. What's your average? So- I'm assuming because you carve out a bunch of the prostate comes out. What's the average reduction in prostate size? Is it 5%, 20%, 50? How much I can I- I tell guys it's between prostate? 60 and 70%. 60 and 70% of your prostate goes bye-bye. How did I love that? I kind of love that for a lot of people. <laughs> uh, quality of life, you said, has been, has been shown to improve. You said there were other groups that looked at the durability and people were very happy that they got this, unlike a number of others. I see that other other people aren't really asked five years later, or three years later. Um, so as we come to the end of my list, here's some other ones. Uh, just a brief, again, overview and whole lip. Short-term side effects I could expect on average and long-term side effects I could expect on average, just off the top of your head. No one's asking you to stay concrete to that. Yeah, so here's the way that I counsel folks. I say that most men will have their urinary symptoms go a bit haywire for the first four weeks after surgery. And what I mean by that is you may notice that you're having more frequency, urgency, nighttime awakening than you may have even had before surgery uh, after the prostate tissue comes out. So be expecting that. That's almost always self-limited. I tell guys to expect a little bit of urinary leakage. It's typically the type of leakage that happens when you cough, sneeze, or strain, but it can happen with an urge to get to the bathroom and you can't make it. That type of leakage is uncommon to last longer than three months um, uh, uh, and certainly very uncommon to last longer than six months. So I tell guys it's a temporary nuisance. That's the words that I almost always use. There are ways that we can mitigate that with physical therapy and things like that, but it's a, it's a relatively uh, uh, uncommon uh, permanent problem. 
And then the last thing that I say is expect retrograde ejaculation. Um, uh, the amount of tissue that's removed uh, really results in kind of a rerouting of the plumbing such that there is very low likelihood that that semen will come out after this procedure. That's not been shown to impact men's sexual satisfaction. It's just kind of a new state of affairs. Um, yeah. But it's important that we bring that up with people because uh, there, are, there are absolutely some patients that will choose a surgical procedure based on the ability to preserve ejaculation. And that's something that we should know about up front. Okay, so if if people are going to experience retrograde ejaculation from this, and they they know it up front. Is there any problem with experiencing that, or is that that's just safe? I mean, is there any worry? No, about- it's totally safe. Totally safe. It's actually not a reliable means of birth control. So I tell guys that are still okay. of childbearing age to not consider this. It's like a vasectomy, for instance, but there's nothing dangerous about retrograde ejaculation. Okay, under this situation, that's really good to know. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, this is a funny one. You're in an academic institution. It's not funny. I mean, I would ask the same thing if I wasn't at, at an academic place. What's the chances that I sign up with you that you're actually going to do the procedure and not some student? I mean, I love the students, but this is a question we get all the time at PCRI and other places. You know, this famous person is going to do my radical prostatectomy. When I got there, it didn't. I didn't seem like he or she was doing it. It seemed like the students were doing it, from what I heard. So, how do you answer that? Yeah, I, I answer it very honestly. So, I um, I train uh, urologists to do this surgery, uh, typically in the form of a fellow. So that's a person who's already done their urology residency and is doing additional training beyond that. Uh, uh, they're often board eligible, meaning that they've already made it through the first round of, uh, uh, of the American Board of Urology licensing. So um, they're functioning like I do, but they're learning the procedure from me. Um, I'm present uh, and in the room for the absolute duration of the operation, but uh, I'm very transparent with patients about that. And uh, I am never uh, um, uh, upset if a patient says, you know what, doc, I understand it's a teaching institution. You've got to do my entire operation. I will always honor patients' wishes if they ask that, but absolutely our mission at a place like the University of Michigan is to train the next generation of urologists. Yeah. And, and to beat Ohio State in football. Absolutely that. I know you know that. I'm just trying to remind the audience, but by the way, this year when we beat them, what's the score going to be? You want to predict? Oh, man, that's, that's, that's a really tough one. We're at home, right? I'm going to right. I'm going to say I'm going to say 45 to 21. Wow. You're going to take that to the bank. A third year for a blowout. Yeah, that's my guess. I'm going to give them more credit this year. I say you said 45, 21. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give them a little more credit. I say 45, 22. Oh, wow. That's a lot more credit. They they get another point. It's like a feel sorry for me point. I don't know where that happens. My God, you win two (laughs) years in a row and people get so cocky, right? Yeah, our our heads are so inflated right now. This is wrong. We're going to get my children. Some of my children had never been alive for a Michigan victory over Ohio State. They didn't understand why I got so bent out of shape about the game. They're like, you never win anyway. (laughs) I'll tell you how old I am. I went to Ohio State and we lost. And a fan started crying because we used to beat them all the time. And I remember thinking, what a bunch of babies. Okay. (laughs) Remember, I thought that. And then when we beat them two years ago, I cried. Yeah. (laughs) So I understood. I I understood the pain. Anyway, I don't want to digress. My last one, which is a beautiful way to end it, and then we'll end it, end it, is there's all this talk now on improvement in sleep. Do you see, because I mean, nocturia getting up at night do you see with people these procedures actually might come back to you at a certain point and go you know what doc i'm actually sleeping better i'm not getting up as often do you talk about that at all because sleep's such an issue yeah definitely i mean my goal for all patients is to get down to one time at night um you know understanding that there's a lot of things that go into that right if you're if you're drinking heavily before going to bed that that's not going to be feasible um the people I'm a little cautious of, uh, and this is a bit of a digression, are those that come in and they don't really have any symptoms during the day, right? They're not complaining of the classic week stream, feelings of incomplete emptying, but they're getting up five times at night. Those mm. are people where I'll do a bit more of a workup to make sure that we're not missing something like sleep apnea that's uncontrolled yeah. or uh, an issue where they made you, I saw on your list, could go on desmopressin or something. Yeah, um, yeah, but for the guy who has the classic suite of symptoms, weak stream, and, and what we're thinking is prostate, 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 um, and, and pre-surgery, they're getting up four, five, six, seven times at night. I would expect those guys to get down to one time at night. Okay. Is there a question you wish I would have asked you that I didn't ask you? No, I mean, I think you hit it on the head. I, I think, 
you know, uh, we, we talked about biases, my bias is towards HOLEP for sure. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, if, if there's anything in urology that really highlights shared decision making with patients because of all the options we have that cater to men's desires, it is that field of BPH. And so there's no one perfect treatment modality. I think HOLEP really takes the cake for, for, for most guys, but I am not shy about, you know, catering to men when they're, when they're talking about treatment options. Beautiful. Let me say 20 seconds, something about Dr. Dow, just for the audience who might think this is biased. First of all, I've never picked a speaker in the 15 years. I still forget. I've, I've interviewed 500 speakers. I've never picked a speaker based on the fact that they're my buddy. I, uh, there were too many people talking about Dr. Dow. I wasn't even familiar with what exactly he was doing. There were too many people that were happy with his outcomes. And I thought this is ridiculous. I need someone who's doing this all the time. And people have walked away, you know, generally very happy. And there's something that just does not get enough attention in BPH that I didn't realize it until a mutual friend of ours was treated. And that is what I call PSA anxiety. I have watched people deal with up and down PSA it's made them half wacky. They're getting MRIs. They think they're going to have a life of PSA and MRIs. Suddenly, most of this was due to BPH tissue. You or somebody else treats them effectively. And now their average PSA is 0.6 or 0.7. It's not nine. And they can just monitor that level now. So their anxiety of prostate cancer and PSA was up here most of their life. And then they get effective BPH treatment, which I never really thought about. The anxiety goes down dramatically. And they just seem like different people. And that is a part of BPH procedures I wish that would get more attention. I am watching men who are freaked out at every PSA, every MRI. You remove 60 or 70% of the tissue. They're doing just fine and they're still monitored, but their anxiety over PSA has dropped significantly. I don't know if you want to comment on that. That is what I've watched in following these procedures. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I have two comments to that. One, you're exactly right. Um, uh, the the expectation would be that the PSA would fall dramatically after a procedure where a substantial amount of tissue is removed. None of these procedures we've discussed uh, limit the risk of prostate cancer, however. So right. an appropriate screening approach is still important going forward because the peripheral zone of the prostate uh, is still present. Um, but you're right. Those who have been through multiple MRIs, prostate biopsies, and things like that, uh, who, for instance, undergo HOLEP, it's very common for the PSA to drop below one. And I think that that can absolutely impact the degree of anxiety that they have about future treatment. I mean, uh, that's the joy I've seen in people's faces with this. So the other thing is you were picked organically. That's why I haven't picked many people at Michigan. I mean, I just go to where people are going to, and then we make sure they're nice people too. But I, I also, people don't understand this and dealing with the students at Michigan, every time I I talk, you know, about, you know, who's some of the best teachers that you, that you see your name. You may know this, you might not. When I had a lot of students over my house a month ago, they said, you know, Casey Dow is just a great teacher. He's just incredibly skilled. He teaches us well. He's one of the best teachers I've seen. So from the students to the other physicians, to the patients, this was a perfect organic moment. It's sort of a culmination of your practice. And it, it made the most sense to do the longest BPH talk. I mean, we've gone, I mean, I've asked you questions. I said it was only gonna be 20 minutes. It was almost an hour, maybe longer, but um, I just wanna thank you because at the same time, the audience doesn't know that even though he's got an office in the department, he had no idea what questions were coming. I just said, get up there and present. And I want you to present on these things. He had no idea if I was gonna ask him a million questions or one question. I always say, thank you for all you do, but. Uh, hey, Casey, I'll see you soon for a drink, but I really appreciate your information today. And I can tell you, it is going to be an incredible source of information for people thinking about any BPH procedure. So thank you. Yeah, happy to help and really, really, you know, delighted to be included in this. I think it's a great forum. I appreciate it, Mark. Absolutely. And I'll leave you. Every single speaker gets a gift. But since I couldn't find you in the department because you were late with a patient, you're always working. <laughs> I decided to keep your gifts and I'm going to hold them hostage until you buy me a drink. So here are the, two gifts. Here are the two gifts are the advocacy boot group uh, got for you. Ready? One yep. is a Casey Michigan cup, which you can keep in your office. I bet Love you that. Don't, bet you don't have, I don't have one. Okay. No. Well, there you go. This is, we're about expensive gifts. Money is no object. So we got you a Casey cup. And now I thought, listen, I love Tennessee. I've been there a million times for, for work and other things, but 
I want to, I want to make sure that you're wearing this when I see you Michigan swimming. So I got you. In Michigan. Uh, I, I do not have one of those. That is a, uh, that is a, uh, you know what? I'm going to, it's going to be hard to keep that away from my kids. They're going to steal that almost immediately. Thank is you. This, see, it, see, they're talking not just life change. It's life changing in the sense that the gifts we give you, nobody has been that thoughtful to give you I a love it. cup. So I will give you these when I see you. Does that sound good? Fair enough. And keep it away from your kids. I want to get a picture of you in it. And we'll um, do that. thanks again. So this next session is one of my favorite sessions for every conference because it's an extended Q&A session from our founder, Dr. Mark Schulz. He's also the executive director here at the PCRI and our moderator, Dr. Mark Moyad. He is the Jenkins Poe Kempner Director of Alternative Medicine and Complementary Medicine in the Department of Urology for the University of Michigan. And he does this in the education space. So he educates the masses on men's health, BPH, prostatitis, prostate cancer, and many more. He is an expert. He's like a supplement guru. He wrote the supplement handbook. He is the person who's able to give us such amazing context to the entire world of men's health. And because of him, we even have the speakers here today. He invited all of our speakers and chose them and did all the vetting to make sure that all the presentations were built, customized, and understandable for patients just like you. So we really appreciate everything that he does for us. He's volunteered for over 15 years to the PCRI. And our executive director, Dr. Dr. Schulz, he volunteers every week filming our videos and doing so much. He founded the organization with the purpose of getting education like this out for free for patients. And we really appreciate both of them. One's in private practice, one's in academia, and they're able to give us two different perspectives. And when they meet together, it really gives us a great whole picture of what's going on. They're going to be able to cover topics today in men's health when it comes to supplements, diet, lifestyle, weight loss, and things that are just really important to pay attention to. Heart health, cardiovascular, diabetes, all of it. We really appreciate you guys submitting your questions. They're going to be answering a lot of them right now. So thank you, Dr. Scholes, and thank you, Dr. Moyad. We really appreciate you, and thank you for being here at your conference, the Men's Health Virtual Conference. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! How are you? There is my best friend who I used to see all the time. And now we only talk to each other during conferences, but uh, he texts me. You do text me, but we used to in the old days when both of us had more time, we used to communicate like brothers from another mother. And now uh, essentially, so since you don't know what I've been doing the past few months, I'm going to let you in on it. First, I want to welcome you into the screen. Uh, first and foremost, I went to the asparagus festival. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's in Empire, Michigan. That's one of the biggest asparagus events around the world. And of course, all I did was eat asparagus. And uh, I won't talk about I won't talk about the the urine smell part. That's that's not as attractive. But this is the T-shirt I got. And if you ever get a chance, if you ever come visit me, which I'm just praying one day you come visit me in the state of Michigan, I will take you up north to my favorite areas and we'll go to the asparagus festival and we'll eat healthy food and we'll listen to music. And then the second thing I did, which you're going to be shocked at, I finished a half marathon. I finished second in my division, got a t-shirt, got a medal, got a plaque, second into my division. And there were countless hundreds of runners and guess how many people were in my division thousands good guess two so <laughs> i got the silver medal because nobody else my age in the 50 to 59 bracket <laughs> wanted to run a really hard half marathon i think the saddest thing about the glenn arbor solstice half marathon was the fact that i couldn't I couldn't stop counting the number of 20 year olds that passed me and they looked like they were making no effort. It was really uh, disheartening, but I finished it. Right. How, how apropos for our men's health conference, those yep. 20 year olds can probably uh, sin egregiously for the next 20 years and maybe suffer no harm. But if they don't change their ways, when they start to get to be your age, it's going to have a, super deleterious impact on their longevity. So I'm glad yeah. you said you're setting an example for us, Mark. I'm, I'm setting an example, and this will lead into talking about Dr. Dow, who, again, I never get to talk about anyone at Michigan, but myself, because we try to make sure we cover speakers from around the world and we don't want to show 
favoritism, but in this case, he, he, one of the best in the world, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, I, over 25 years ago, I think it was, it was in the 1990s, one of the first papers that got me excited about lifestyle was actually in BPH. It was a Harvard study. It was done with their large epidemiologic database that showed that men who were physically active on a regular basis and did vigorous exercise and regular exercise had a lower risk of being treated for BPH, including with procedures. So mm -hmm. I thought, I don't want to, if I, I would get one of these if I need it, but I just never want to need it. Right. So it, so this is part of the reason I run the half marathon. It's totally for selfless reasons. And, and I, you know, I'm trying to avoid BPH treatment, but if I need it, I know where to go. Well, it, I mean, the, the fitness, of course, as you know, even better than I, covers a multitude of sins. It's uh, less cardiovascular disease, less memory loss, less, it just goes on and on. I think we'll probably circle back and dive into that more deeply at the end of the talk when we're uh, reviewing with uh, uh, Dr. Goldenberg's talk. But uh, the, in terms of the BPS, BPH, thank you so much for inviting him. It was such a, a tour de force talk that... Um, I think it's good to start with what we're trying to av avoid first. Uh, Dr. Nichols goes into the different medications that we can use to try and prevent needing a procedure. Yeah. And uh, But this is sort of a, a backdrop because these procedures really do work. But when the day comes when someone needs to have something done, look at all these options. How do you decide and ferret out which one's going to be best for you? And I think that's what you and I can cover a little bit. Uh, his emphasis was find someone, uh, if you're going to find someone, find someone who's doing one thing really, really well. This is yeah. such a sensitive area of the body that if you, if you, you know, get second rate treatment, it can have lasting negative repercussions and you're taking unnecessary risks. So I think he emphasized that over and over, which I heartily endorse. Um, his uh, uh, favored methodology, his expertise with the hull up laser, I think is a sort of a, a de facto standard for people that are really in arrears that have you know, blockage symptoms and they wanna try and fix it once and for all. There's a lot of people that are leading up to this that haven't allowed it to get to that extreme where they're actually, the prostate pinches off their urine flow altogether and they're just, they have a catheter and how do you get out of that ditch? Yeah. Um, so he, um, uh, he's, I think, I think this is one thing that our, the Peace Ride does uh, for our audience is to help aim, point a finger at people that we would go to if we were in those dire situations. And uh, obviously, he's got, uh, you know, fantastic uh, credentials as someone to try and fix that problem when it gets to be that serious. Now, what if the what if the urine situation isn't that serious? It is serious enough to require an intervention, and he was kind enough to go through all the different methodologies. Um, the one that uh, is not done by urologists, the one where they inject something to block the blood flow to the prostate, has actually become my favorite first step in people that are not in, in such serious straits that they're blocked off. When they're blocked off, they're going to need something to, to open up the prostate with one of those other procedures that he mentioned, either the laser or the transurethral resection, uh, or for less dire situations, resume uh, and um, or Eurolift. There you go. All that long list. I showed but, him that monster list. I think that actually intimidated him too. It's an intimidating list. Anyway. Yeah. So I, I would just say as a, as a medical oncologist sitting on the uh, sidelines, who sees a lot of men who have prostate-related problems. Most of them have cancer. Sometimes the cancer is incidental in their big prostate or their urinary problems are a bigger problem than their cancer is. Yeah. And I have uh, favored these prostate arterial embolization procedures, which are done not by urologists, but by interventional radiologists, over the other options, primarily because of simplicity. It's an outpatient procedure. You don't need a catheter afterwards. And it works best in the men that have the biggest prostates. That's the uh, the issue with uh, what Dr. Dow is uh, looking at is that let's do the laser or the TERP in those men that have big prostates and really severe blockage. But if they're not already blocked, these uh, embolization procedures, one day outpatient procedure, pretty much pain-free, no catheter, and maybe doesn't deliver the consistent results that he's achieving with laser, 
but it comes with a lot less investment in terms of risks of you know retrograde ejaculation or tiny risks of incontinence or other complications that a bigger procedure is associated with yeah you kept going back to the word durability and i think mm -hmm. we're p pae we call it right yes uh and PAE has got this question of durability, which is why a number of big groups haven't yet embraced it wholeheartedly, but it's got short-term data. And then you've got this bi-directional effect where, you know, they're looking at it to treat prostate cancer as well as BPH. So the durability item, I mean, it's definitely, it was definitely on the list of something, and he covered it that should be looked at. And, mm -hmm. and the question is, I, I, again, this goes back to what he he said too. He said, whatever you pick, you know, make sure this person is really doing a lot of procedures. And then what we emphasize enough, which which makes me a little bit wacky in prostate too, because the word, I mentioned this in the Q&A and I, I was really trying to get this in. I was really being selfish here. I I love the word, the number of procedures. You talk to someone or if you, or if you talk to anyone that says, how many procedures do you do? Well, maybe they've done a thousand, but they only do now one a month. So it's not just the number, it's the frequency, right? And that's why when he said, you know, I'm doing this three days a week, every single week. And so if you're looking into PAE, you're looking into any of these, it's not just the number they've done, but, you know, how often are they doing it now? Or are they just kind of hanging out and it's a hobby? Because you need a lot of yeah, turnover. And, and there's a third level too, third and a fourth level. That is, you can have someone that's doing a lot of them, but perhaps doesn't do it really that well. Absolutely. Uh, there's a skill factor in all these things. And so how do you find out how well the doctor is performing? Well, your family doctor who's maybe referred you to this individual has seen multiple patients or, uh, or of course, online reviews. I, you know, obviously those are fraught with problems, but that is another window into uh, you know, what's going on with the patients after their treatment. Yeah, you know, you make me think that when I look at all of these options, and again, I just, this is just such an incredible list. Mm -hmm. When I look at all the, this is alphabetized, by the way. <laughs> uh, I think of, you know, we have support groups in prostate cancer. That's understandable. It's almost as if there's so much going on in BPH and there's so much misery that people deal with. I'm almost surprised sometimes there's not support groups in terms of BPH. I mean, I almost fell off my chair when I said, how many men come see you and they're already in retention? They're already at that emergency stage. And he didn't even blink. He said something like 25 to 40 percent, anywhere yeah. from a quarter to a third. And I'm thinking one out of every three patients you're seeing or one out of four, they're coming in in retention. I so, almost fell off my chair. Right. So the good. Well, this shows you how us guys can procrastinate. But the uh, the good news is that in that situation, you know, you're committed to doing a procedure. Um, yeah. The uh, uh, it's unlikely that uh, just plain old medicines are going to turn this around, uh, and if it does, it'll be for a while, and then you're going to end up needing a procedure later anyway. So yeah. Uh, so that you know, when we're dealing with a sensitive area of the body, the prostate, with all the ramifications on your day-to-day -day urinary function, your sexual function, it's such a high-stakes game, and it's not surprising that people want to procrastinate and kind of put it off. They don't want to roll the dice and go through a procedure that might have some irreversible side effects. So, but when you come in and with a, a retention situation and that's, it's a very scary thing when people all of a sudden they can't pass their urine, they're in an emergency room with a big swollen bladder. And if, uh, if the emergency doctors can't get a catheter in, uh, in a timely fashion, it's scary. And uh, that loss of inability to just function normally is very frightening. And, uh, and people don't want to go through that again, if any way possible to avoid it. Yeah. I want to make one comment, Mark, about um, the idea of the big prostate always being the cause of urinary problems. He, he alluded to that, and I think it uh, deserves uh, further emphasis. The, there is not a one-to-one -one ratio with as the prostate gets bigger, the urine situations get worse. There's a lot of guys with huge prostates that would never know about it that are functioning just fine. So there's a, a rough connection as prostates get bigger, you might have more urinary problems, but it's not a guaranteed or foregone conclusion. And men with smaller prostates uh, can have serious blockage issues. That's because the, if the prostate presses in on the urethra, it doesn't necessarily have to be a big prostate to create problems. 
The reason I mention that is, is that a lot of talk is about making the prostate smaller, like that's always going to fix the problem. Uh-uh. You have overactive bladder, you've got prostatitis, you've got people who are addicted to drinking 12 glasses of water a day. There's all kinds of, of backstory as to why people may be frustrated with their urinary function that may be totally unrelated to how big the prostate is. So yeah. I don't want to totally discount that, but I don't want it to be like the final word, you know, oh, my prostate's big, I got to do something about it. Yeah, I, I, I think a, I think a big prostate, a prostate that gets bigger is concerning in, in other areas, right? We could debate, we could talk all day about that because a PSA goes up, it makes things confusing. And if you don't really know your prostate size and your PSA density, I, I mean, I certainly don't want my prostate to get bigger. Having had two rectal exams, uh, one, one during the colonoscopy I just had recently and one right after, and they said I had a normal size prostate for age, I was happy. I won't lie to you. I was very happy. Um, I are you I wait, wait, let that. me break in there. Uh, yeah. Are you aware? As you, I'm sure you are that the men who catch prostate cancer with big prostates do substantially better than the men with small prostates. I mean, I'd be more nervous about if I got prostate cancer. I'd like to have that uh, whatever it is confidence that maybe it won't be as serious if I have a larger prostate. Yeah. Uh, we're not entirely sure why that is, but it's definitely a, 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 a concern when men have a high-grade cancer in a small prostate, their, pro their prognosis is not as good as when men have a higher-grade cancer in a large prostate. So, yeah. so that, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to imply that we all want to have big prostates, but there are no, some no, mitigating things that, that suggest that uh, there is a protective uh, effect of big prostates uh, against prostate cancer to some degree. Yeah, no, I mean, that's very true because when I was growing up, it, the concern was, is there a relationship between BPH and cancer? And the debate mostly centered around the fact that could this increase the risk? There was never a thought that it had no impact or could decrease the risk. And so now we've abandoned the idea that just because you have a big prostate doesn't mean you're going to get prostate cancer. So there's not really a relation. However, I, I want to go back to that for a moment in terms of lifestyle a little bit later on. So now it, some of the epidemiologic stuff is starting to suggest that there might actually be a decreased risk. From a biostatistician standpoint, an epidemiology standpoint, I don't know if I buy into that yet. I think part of it is due to a bias. It's called like a sampling bias, a larger prostate. If you're going to do random, this goes back to your MRI and how much you love MRI, which is another reason to like it. When you're doing random sampling in 16 or 12 spots of a large prostate, you're getting even less than 1% of what you would normally get from a small prostate. So the chances of you hitting the target becomes less and less. And I think that's why epidemiologically they're showing slight favoritism. I think there's a there's a confounding bias there, but that's just, that's from no, what I'm thinking. No, that it. makes sense. And I think that's true. Um, but I think there's something beyond that because I've just been looking at prostates for so long that as an experienced prostate oncologist, I just get more nervous about men that have these high-grade lesions in small glands. And yeah. I don't know if that's because it's easier for it to get out because there's not as much room for it to run. And yeah. it might be just an intuitive bias that is incorrect. It could be 100% sampling error. This is There is ambiguity, but it's kind of, kind of nice to point out that at least we're having this discussion that maybe yes. there is something actually good about a big prostate. I, I, I think, you know, it's always like anything. The truth is somewhere in between. I also believe, you know, the theory is exactly, a lot of people theorize who have done these studies suggest that it's the prostate needs to, the cancer needs to travel further to get out. And, right. and that makes sense too. So I think there's something going on on both of those ends. Yeah. At the same time, I got to tell you, honestly, BPH scares me personally. Well, so does prostate cancer. Of well, you grew you grew up in a in a in a family where your dad came home and probably uh, he did terps. Uh, he, he was yeah, he was fighting the big prostate his whole life. And I don't know yeah. did did he win or did the prostate win? I don't know. Well, he was you know I, he would do transurethral resection of the prostate. He did what was the gold standard. So everything's compared to the gold standard. That's got ten plus year data, fifteen twenty. So any mm -hmm. procedure that you're looking at, they're always going to compare it to the TURP. Yeah. And he used to always say to me all the time, he used to say, you know, we're not training enough people. You've got to be really good at this. You've got to do a lot of procedures. You've got to do them frequently. And I get nervous that the next generation of doctors aren't doing a lot of these things. They're just yep. doing them sparingly. And then when I mentioned that to Dr. Dow, he said, yeah, you know, we all, all of these procedures, people need to realize this is, has to be their calling, which is so I, I uh, along, that, along those lines, let me say that. So. Dr. Dow uh, kind of started with 
the, the relatively less invasive procedures like uh, TUMT, which was uh, transurethral microwave, uh, Eurolift, Euro and then he, mo he moved on to the uh, procedures where transurethral resection, where they're cutting tissue out or lasering tissue out, which is a more definitive and perhaps more durable treatment. As a medical oncologist who's usually starting, and he recommended too, starting with some pills, let's start with the easy stuff, the reversible side effects, move on stepwise. I tend to think in the sequence of all this is to, uh, if we if it is feasible, you know, you, the really big prostates are not amenable to um, to to doing the transurethral uh, microwave or the or the uh, urolifts. But uh, if, they, if someone has a smaller prostate, urinary blockage symptoms, those are far less uh, risky in terms of creating impotence, incontinence, uh, and and uh, retrograde ejaculation. All those. Uh, shifts. And so I tend to see it sort of a hierarchy in the, in the men with the smaller prostates that don't have too serious urinary problems but need a procedure. I look at it like Eurolift or trans uh, TUMT first. Uh, and then in the men that are functioning okay but look like they need a procedure, I look at the prostate arterial embolization, the PAE first. And then, of course, in the more severe cases, like what Dr. Dow is seeing, we're moving on to finding an expert who's good at laser or transurethral resection. Yeah, I was good at whole lab. I mean, those, and I like the fact that independent of prostate size, it's recommended, but people really need help. But you know, the you know what the problem with Dr. Dow is? It's not a it's it's a problem that he recognizes. He's he's trying to train as many people as possible in this. There's just not enough people. You know, I mean, that was the thing. I've got all these groups endorsing it. It's one of the only things that are endorsed regardless of size. And I'm thinking, man, you got it. We just don't have enough of these practitioners doing it. But I I still, did, I don't know if you caught the part. I, I didn't mean to throw a wrench in the whole thing, but you know, we've talked about Eurolift a lot and I'm excited and people have had good results who qualify for Eurolift. But I had to bring back this, I had to bring up, excuse me, this paper from Journal of Urology last month. And I held it up from Cleveland Clinic that showed that because the metal in there that you've got to have a good person reading the MRIs because it can, in a small number of cases, it still could be significant, mm -hmm. it can distort MRI readings. And so you got to keep that in mind that if you've had a Eurolift or you're getting one, I think it's important to say, listen, I just want to make sure that this is a proficient MRI reader, which should be the case anyway, right? Well, it should. And, and I love your pointing that out because, you know, here at the PCR, we've been beating the drum for using MRIs rather than random biopsies when, you, when you're exploring for the possibility of prostate cancer. And some experts are projecting that uh, prostate MRIs, probably without contrast, annual on an annual basis, will come to where we are with mammograms in women. Uh, breast cancer, the most common cancer in women. Everyone gets a mammogram over a certain age if you're female, obviously. And... Um, and then uh, MRI of the prostate, uh, prostate cancer being the most common cancer in men, uh, and with high mortality rates if it's diagnosed late. So we're using PSA as a lead-in, kind of like a check engine light, but it's not super precise. And where people want to go to that next level, I th it's possible that they'll get these MRIs down to a 30, 40 minute procedure, no contrast, and on an annual basis. So we can catch these cancers at the early and curable stage that is feasible. Isn't it funny how when we started this conference going back over a decade, MRI came up once in a while, right? Mm -hmm. And it was all about random biopsies and all of these things. And now MRI is just basically, if you don't have an MRI and you're not doing MRI, you're, bas you're basically missing the boat. You're behind the mm -hmm. times. Yep. And the other beautiful thing about MRI, and you can speak to this, and I have to just remind people, there's many beautiful things about MRI then the technology is only going to get better and better. Another beautiful item, and I know other, other imaging tests do this, but the MRI does this fairly well, is tell you prostate size. Can you elaborate? Because again, I want to go back to the fact that there are certain numbers every man should know, but I do believe that if you're going to get involved in all of this, prostate size, it's important to know for many reasons. And do you want to elaborate on some of those? Sure. I haven't pushed it as hard as you are, but I will take this opportunity to jump on the boat with you, Mark, on that conclusion, because the the men that come in and understand how big their prostate is and how it relates to how much PSA they have are a level of sophistication way beyond most of my patients. And this 
this journey, if you have prostate cancer or BPH, toward learning what's going to be optimal in this rapidly changing field, it's going to require that level of, of uh, diligence on behalf of the patient to find out what's really going on, who really knows what they're doing, and am I getting state-of-the-art treatment? The state-of-the-art's changing every couple of years now. That's the right. doctors don't even know state-of-the-art. Uh, there are experts, of course, doing the state-of-the-art, but figuring out who those are uh, is difficult. So people that know their prostate size usually also understand that PSA is a relative number. You know, the, the, this idea that anything above four is scary and anything under four is, is fine is a very arbitrary thing. If someone has a big prostate, your normal PSA might be eight. And if it's a very small prostate or you're young, your normal PSA maybe should be one or two. So people aren't utilizing PSA to its full power unless they understand how big their prostate is. This concern, as men have moved on to doing more MRIs, is diffused a little bit. And it's interesting that PSA was the driving factor for 30 years, because we were always trying to use that one data point to figure out what do we do? Do we do a biopsy? And uh, does this is man need aggressive treatment if he has cancer? Now with the scans that we have, I will say that PSA is being put out to pasture, and I'm talking about for um, assessing things, but it's really just a starting point now because those small movements, you know, someone comes in, oh, every day I have someone come in, my PSA went from three to four, and let's say this is someone we've previously scanned and we've assured them there's no cancer. Um, that movement of a PSA of three to four, or even three to five over a short period of time is not a sign of cancer growth. It's a sign of the background inflammation. So we're gonna go into that a little bit more when we talked about Dr. Uh, Nichols' talk on prostatitis. Yeah. Um, but uh, the beginning point is, yes, understanding how big your prostate is. If you have an 80 cc gland, that's twice as big as the average prostate for someone in their 50s or 60s. A normal PSA could be up to 10 in that individual. That's That 10 number sounds frightening, uh, yeah. but Actually, it could be normal for a PSA or for a prostate that's 80 cubic centimeters. That's well said. I, I we probably should move on to Nichols' talk, but I, again, part of the reason we do this Q and A is sort of stimulation of thought. So I'm gonna th I'm gonna throw in one. At, I'm gonna throw in a couple thoughts here, and then I'm gonna ask you a question. I want to remind the audience that I didn't even know who Dr. Dow was. Actually, people think, oh well, he's in your department. Yeah, but the reality is, is I'm kind of a unique person in the department. And, the re and also the other reality is we have hundreds of people. And I always try to put my ear to the railroad track to hear what's coming and who's doing what. So a number of my friends and a number of people had these incredible outcomes. And I realized he trained with the, the what's well, arguably the best person in the world at Indiana. And then, you know, all this came together organically because otherwise, I mean, I could interview anybody. I could interview 100 people in the department. I only like to pick the very, very best in what they do. So the, the story, you're going to love this story. One of my friends actually was treated. He'd always been dealing with a prostate, a PSA of eight to 10 MRIs, lots of headaches, worried. And this is what this story I, to, I told him about at the end. I said, this is the beauty of really effective BPH treatment is the PSA anxiety went down. So here, this guy's got PSAs of eight to 10. He's getting MRIs. There's all this concern. There might be cancer around. And then lo and behold, he gets this done. And his PSA now is less than one and it's flat. So here's a guy who had PSAs of eight to 10 is most of his adult life gets treated. It's flat below one. He's got a PSA of a kid and mm -hmm. it's not moving. And now they're not concerned about the kinetics. They're not concerned in the MRI. He took, you know, 70% of the volume of the prostate out. That's the beauty of what I mentioned to him is the anxiety can go down dramatically. And he realized his PSA was not tied to a cancer. His PSA was tied to a big prostate. Yeah, there's another way you can uh, make that determination that your high PSA is not uh, tied to a cancer. And this is something that um, is evolving uh, slowly because of what we've already talked about, the relative lack of familiarity of how powerful these MRIs are now as of 2023. Um, the, the raw statistics indicate that with a well-performed three Tesla multiparametric MRI at a state-of-the-art center, the chances of missing clinically significant prostate cancer in the background where the MRI says it's all clear and you've missed a prostate cancer of consequence is about one in 10. And urologists have used that information to, uh, to, to push doing a random biopsy on top of the MRI just to be safe. 
But what they're forgetting about is the natural history of prostate cancer. The cancer that's being missed on that high resolution MRI is small. And the metastatic potential of a small, even high grade cancer is extremely small. And these high grade prostate cancers actually are low grade compared to other cancers and they grow slowly. So if you just circle back and do another MRI a year later and compare the before and after side by side, look for any small changes. And if you find one, biopsy that small change with a uh, you know, state of the art targeted biopsy, you're gonna catch 99.9% .9 of the bad cancers at a cure, early curable stage. And we're just not exploiting the, the uh, MRI technology. Now, all, that took a long time. I'm an expert explaining this. I've said that many, many times. The average urologist is thinking an MRI is like third line. And he's not really sold on the fact that you can use it in this, uh, in this approach. And therefore, the anxiety that the patient has, because his expert is a little uncertain, his, his urology expert is kind of, eh, you know, this, I'm a little nervous. I want to do a random biopsy on you. And, uh, and that kind of anxiety, it's not just the patient's concern about the PSA, it's hit when he's talking to his professional and his expert who also is expressing anxiety. And I understand why, because we're all would feel terrible if we missed a, even a single cancer. Yeah. So, uh, but I think as of 2023 with state-of-the-art MRIs and uh, with experts that understand the power of this technology, we can calm people down about their high PSA as long as we ourselves, the experts can articulate the message. I want to bring up something just randomly because I've I've received a number of calls from doctors around the country, and you probably would you would know this answer better than I would. I'm going to be humble here and tell you that you definitely would know this. I mean, I I know enough to be dangerous, and I could hurt you in a game of Jeopardy, hurt you badly. But this is something that I realize is making me wacky, and so I just want you to comment on it briefly. So now we're talking about the obvious scenario. So if your PSA is going up. Is it cancer? Is it prostatitis? Is it BPH? Okay, I MRI. We know some of these things come with a little bit of amb ambiguity. There's a couple of tests, blood tests out there mm -hmm. that men are going through all the ringers, but they never get that test. And so whether it's 4K, I want you to explain mm -hmm. a couple of these tests because they, to me, they haven't really become standard. I just hear about them in pockets, mm -hmm. but the fact that they're available and the fact that some people think that are valuable and the fact that when I talk to somebody about it, including some docs that and some a lot of primary cares, they don't realize that these tests are even out there. Right. Um, it's a long question, but it doesn't require a long answer. Nope. Will no, you no, talk no. About, uh, will you talk about these? We've never talked about this during the Q&A. So I want sure. you to talk about it. So OPCO 4K, select MDX, XODX, um, pro PSA, these, these uh, commercially available tests, which are are better than just a PSA and even better than a PSA density. We've been talking about getting the PSA in the context of how big your prostate is. That's the best way to exploit PSA. These tests that uh, you're now asking about are more accurate than PSA density. Wow, that's pretty exciting. Why aren't they being used routinely? The reason that, and I'm seeing a lot of patients with high PSA now that haven't been diagnosed with prostate cancer and we're not using those tests very much. And let me explain why. The bottom line is that those tests only come back with a probabilistic construct of whether you have clinically significant prostate cancer. So when is that helpful? Only when the probability is either extremely low or extremely high. And how often do these tests come back? Extremely low or extremely high? Not that often. Mm -hmm. Usually it's somewhere like you've got a 30 to 50% chance of, of bad cancer. It's not good enough. We need 99% chance that you don't have cancer. So I haven't found them that useful, even though they they are more accurate than PSA. So we usually just move on to a, uh, an MRI scan and say, we got to get to the bottom of this. MRI is not that difficult. There's no radiation. It'll get us some answers if it's done at a center of excellence. But you've seen those guys who have been biopsied. They've been MRI. They're not finding anything. The PSA keeps going up. And then someone pulls one of those scores. And once in a while, it's really high. I don't know. Oh, it's I just... almost, it, it will almost always be high. But remember, a, a 70, 80% chance of prostate cancer is not the same thing as having prostate cancer. It just means yeah. probably. And uh, of course, a 10% chance of having prostate cancer is no guarantee that you don't have prostate cancer. But the former, we'll come and talk about those patients with the rising PSAs and scans are, and everyone's on back on their heels and nervous and concerned uh, when we get to Dr. Nichols' uh, 
Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted talk. to bring that up because we never really talked about that. And, uh, you know, who's using those tests, who are not using those tests. And so that's mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah. So should we, should we, do you want to say any quick word about the pills for BPH? And that will lead us into Dr. Nichols' talk about the over the counter pills. Yeah. So why don't we go backwards? I, did, uh, I don't remember the sequence. Did he do it? He did his prostatitis talk second and his second. supplement talk first. first. So we'll jump to the second one first. Yeah, let me yeah, and let me introduce that. Let me introduce that and throw it back to you. I've known Curtis for 30 years and I met him because <clears throat> we were at some meetings where we were presenting on over the counter products and we would compare notes and he'll call me and say, "Hey, what do you think of this and what do you think of that?" and I'll call him and say, "What's the latest in that?" So he was one of the only urologists out there that I could actually debate or compare notes with when it came to over-the-counter products. So this is not a guy who's been working in the over-the-counter product space like a lot of people just in the past few days, and they want to be an expert. He's been doing this a long time. Um, so I list, I tend to listen to him more when he talks about over-the-counter and prescription pills. So that's that's the introduction I wanted to give you. Okay. I'll have to confess that I am... Um... Uh, we are starting some research with an, uh, a non-prescription uh, research anti-inflammatory to help our patients with prostatitis. Prostatitis is a big issue in my world because people present with a high PSA concerned about cancer. And a goodly number of these men have prostatitis, not cancer. So, so I'm dealing with this on, a, on an ongoing basis. And I typically am not relying heavily on supplements, even though they have, I believe, some benefit. Uh, Sopomeno and uh, Serona Repens and Permix and these sorts of things are um, going to help men uh, have fewer urinary symptoms. Uh, and I think they're very safe. The trouble is by the time they get to see me, let's say your PSA is 12 and you've, you've got bad uh, urinary symptoms, those are milder agents. Those are the types of things that maybe you or I would try if we started noticing you know, some subtle changes in our urinary function as we were getting older. Well, let's try this and see if it'll it'll improve our our status. It's very safe. Um, someone that presents with a high PSA, I, we're looking at something, uh, you know, trying to get something a little more definitive going. Some uh, a pharmaceutical usually. So, so I was fascinated. Uh, I think we should just address the his prostatitis talk because it was such a great uh, presentation and uh, demonstrated the um, the challenges of finding not only a supplement that might help you. But finding one that really is a supplement with active ingredients in it—that yeah. was uh, that was a real, I think, an eye opener for our audience to see uh, the, how unregulated this industry is. It's a tough industry because the reality is, I've you know, I've spent my life in the industry in some level, and I I believe in it, and I believe in the in the power of supplements for the right condition, which is AKA a medicine. Yes, you know, I I find it ironic that. The number one salt palmetto in the world is actually a prescription, and that's the one that has all the data. And mm -hmm. I always love it when people say, "Well, a supplement's natural; you can get over the counter. It's it's not a prescription." And I'm going, "It's all smoke and mirrors, man. It's all smoke and mirrors because some of the biggest selling supplements in the United States are actually prescription drugs in other countries. You know, if you go to Europe, melatonin prescription is hot. Mm -hmm. It's really good. It's a two milligram for a long release melatonin. You can even look it up. It's called Circadian, and so Permixin is a prescription." So we do have a quality control issue. I think it's better if, and I made sure that we talked about it. We talk about some of these third-party quality control sites you can look for, a USP label, for example, Underwriters Laboratory, which we- So well, well, let's let's take that. I saw that slide and it was really good. I was on a roll, baby. No, 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 no. This is so important. I want to interrupt. What uh, will these supplements uh, put that on the bottle? And if they, you know, like this was reviewed and- yeah. Can that be trusted? Or do we have to actually go to these sites and look up the supplement or the manufacturer? How do we make that real? Both. I would, so, so you have to go to the site and see if they have one of the labels. Because so you go to the website, you go to the you website. Go to, you go to their official website yeah. and you ask for any of the top third-party control labels, quality control labels, like, yeah. um, or what's called the COA, a certificate of analysis. I've talked about this before when it comes to marijuana and CBD. You've got to look for analysis that mm -hmm. what it's saying, 
Now, remember, we're not saying it's efficacious. We're not saying that specific product's been in clinical trials. Right. We're saying that what they're advertising as their active ingredients and their dosage is, is accurate, generally speaking. It's, it's it, the medicine or the, the supplement is really there. Yes. Now, uh, again, I, there were the so many part. things on that. You had like six or eight different. Do you have like one favorite site that you would start with? I have a, I have a top third-party quality control seals. So if you see these seals, if, if these trademarks or these seals, these third-party stamps are on the website, I'm getting very excited. So okay. USP is one of the top ones. Oh, I see. So instead of going to the, the actual review website, what you do is you go to the medicine website or the, uh, the supplement website. Yes. And you look to see, just like the PCRI has seals of uh, reliability for our fundraising. Yes. We put that up there. We're very proud of it. These people will post that if they've had it reviewed. So if, have you ever been to the men's restroom in an airport? Never. No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's why you haven't been treated. I'm, I'm, for that's why you haven't been treated for BPH. <laughs> Sorry. So no, but what I'm saying, or, or pull back on your refrigerator, all your appliances, um, all of your electronics. If you go to any airport, it will say there'll be a, there'll be a label that verifies this is a quality product that you can depend on it. One, a symbol you see all the time, it says UL, Underwriters Laboratories. You'll see that on the back of a lot of electronics. It says they fulfilled certain standards. You'll see in the back of a refrigerator, a microwave. You'll see NSF, it's a seal. You'll see that on uh, hand, you know, air dryers in bathrooms. So the entire world functions on these third-party quality control seals. These same companies are now doing quality control for supplements. Right. So I look for USP. I look for NSF, right? I look for UL, underwrite. I look for consumer labs. I look for someone to tell me that they're willing to pay a little bit more to have their product tested. Now I'm going to tell you the catch though. The catch is not many people want to do it with herbal products. So they, you mean they don't, they, the patients themselves just don't want to double check? Is that what well, you're saying? No, no, not the patients themselves is that we still are begging for more and more manufacturers and sellers of herbal products to get those seals. So what because, you're saying is that what, 80% of the stuff that's out there is unreviewed? No, no, I'm not saying 80%. It's getting better. I'm just saying that when you're looking at vitamin D or you're looking at a multivitamin, if you're looking at vitamin C, well, you'll notice a lot of times at the drugstore is a lot of them who can have seals. In fact, there's something else that it, this would be so much easier if the large pharmacy chains just adopted that they would not sell a product unless it went through a third party. Well, let me tell you, there is a company that's done that and I have no relationship with them. They're called CVS. CVS has a program called Tested to be Trusted. It means that anything selling on their shelves has had to have gone through one of the companies I mentioned, including one in Europe called Eurofins. And that I thought was going to be groundbreaking and it was going to lead to all these other pharmacies and everybody was going to get in line and say, we're going to do this. And they're the only ones that I know that do it still. Now, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that Costco doesn't have a good supplement line, it does. So I'm just saying that when it gets more complicated, when you have a grounded up plant part, an herbal, this is what I teach in class. I say, when I'm talking to students, I, I say, herbals are a different animal. Everyone repeat after me when I talk to the residents, herbals are a different animal, meaning it's really hard to find a consistent group of herbals that have those labels because standardization is so much more difficult. So people, I think, avoid it. Mm -hmm. So Nickel talked about a couple companies that now do USP labels on Sol Palmetto, one in particular in Florida, which is great. And then it becomes a price comparison. And then it becomes being monitored by your doctor too, right? I mean, there's a lot oh, of things. Well, I like. Yeah, that's good. Let's stop right there for, I want to ask you a question about, you. May, something went by really quickly in your discussion. He, you talked about these these multivitamin, multi-mineral formulas that seem to be very attractive to patients. We'll just cover everything with one pill or with 12 pills a day or yeah. something. Um, they, so that totally eliminates the possibility that you're going to actually address a specific problem with a specific herbal. What you're saying is that all these herbals will somehow make me better. And it, Actually, in the prostate cancer world, we try and steer people away from these things because we think that the, all the vitamins and minerals are fertilizing the cancer and helping it grow quicker. So 
I can definitely see using a specific herbal for a specific problem. And this is exactly. outlined in, in your book. You, yes. you, you line these herbal products up by, let's fix uh, eczema, let's fix BPH. Right. And, and the nice thing about that is these patients can then embark upon a trial and error process, start this one agent and see if their symptoms improve over a period of a month or two. Does it really work rather than this, just this belief in all herbals will somehow make me a better person? Yeah. And, uh, and can you talk to a little bit about uh, the, the downside of just taking these shotguns that, you know, like 40 things to improve your prostate. It's got zinc and 12 different things in there. What if anything is working? Yeah. First of all, you don't know, you don't know what's working unless you're being monitored, right? I mean, you want to be monitored. And the second thing is just popping things over the counter, just simply popping them for the sake of popping them, hoping for a lottery win. People forget is that it's not just the ingredients that you want to look for. A lot of times you're not sure of the contaminants. So whether you're talking about heavy metals, whether you're talking about bacterial contamination, whether you're talking about a variety of ingredients that aren't supposed to be in there. You know, MIT did a great study a few years ago and they looked at just products, whether it was prescription, they just looked out there and they found out that 75% of most pills, and this includes prescription, are in active ingredients. And in fact, very little of a pill makes up the active ingredient. The rest of it is fillers. The rest of it is inactive ingredients that support the active ingredient to make sure it dissolves well, it tastes well. So my point is, if you're just popping things over the counter, and if you don't think there's some level of whether it's lead, arsenic, mercury, you know, we don't have, there's, there's gonna be contaminants, whether it's a small amount in terms of PPMs or a large amount, it makes me nervous. And then you got to dissolve the actual tablet or the capsule, which comes with its own set of ingredients, which are, which are interesting, right? And then it could be the overexposure to ingredient that could help fuel something that you don't want to. So my philosophy was this, that supplements would get the attention that they deserve if we treated them as drugs in the sense that when they prove themselves, you use it for a specific condition or to prevent a specific condition if it proves itself. But even when it proves itself, I still think you have to look for a third party quality control seal. And I think you have to look for it on the manufacturer website. And then I also think that, that patients and the public need to go even a step further. They need to go find the best study that supports, they need to go find the best study that supports taking that product for the condition. And then when they find that study, hopefully it's an independent, very large study, like some of the best ones out there, they'll see the brand that was used in the product. So I'll give you a classic example of what I'm talking about. If you look on TV today and someone's got macular degeneration, there's a product called Preservision, A-R-E-D-S. That was the product that went through the large government trial that actually showed it can slow the progression of the disease itself. Mm -hmm. And so if you do enough homework, you can find the product that was used in the trial that gets the doctors and the healthcare professionals excited to use the supplement, but you've mm -hmm. gotta be willing to do that work. And I know it can be exhaustive, but it's worth it. And you know what I found as you read, what I have found in many of these cases, not all, but many of these cases where a product's gone through what we consider phase three testing and it's impressed everyone, is it's usually a single ingredient or a couple small, small number of ingredients. And usually it's cost is not really an issue. It's pretty, it's pretty low cost. Mm -hmm. So there's the perception of the over-the-counter world and then there's the reality. It's like I tell people, if you're looking for an allergy product, once you go over the counter, everything becomes fair game. You can now get generics, right? Mm -hmm. So you can go buy a brand name aspirin. Absolutely. And you can pay twice as much for it or three times, but you can also buy a reputable generic aspirin that has the exact same ingredient that costs a lot less. The same thing with allergy medicines. All your, pharmace all your pharmacies make their own generics that have been tested. So it's a part of this is just learning the rules of the game. And part of it is realizing that you should take it for a condition. You yes. So people tell me, what's a good supplement? I say, it's a drug. What's a good drug? It's a supplement. In my world, it's a, a supplement. So, so let's just make that crystal clear right now. So as we age, we develop problems, whether it's joint aches or urinary frequency or, um, or uh, rashes or whatever. So as 
As physicians, of course, we're usually defaulting to a pharmaceutical, uh, something that was made by a, you know, a pharmacy company, it takes a prescription. But what's clear is that some of these conditions can be helped by uh, supplements that are non-prescription. Yeah. And what's the proper way to utilize them? A specific supplement for a specific condition in your life that you now have determined that you're better off because you're taking it. You can see improvement. That's right. That's that's the reason to take a supplement. And the rest of of this loading up on stuff so that your life is better, you say, well, that's how do I know I'm not better off? Maybe some people have an improved sense of well-being or more energy. Or if you, is it an energy deficit that you're able to to improve with a shotgun supplement? Well, then yeah. maybe it's worth it. The trouble is, everything in life has a risk-benefit ratio. That's right. If if you take these supplements, the risks are not great, but they're not zero. That's and, right. Uh, the, there's unnecessary cost. There's unnecessary hassle of taking stuff. Um, if you can see a true benefit and you're better off, then it's certainly worth taking a risk and that's taking right. the supplement. And that's why you asked me what some of the standards I think about and I teach on, and here's another one that will make you happy. You know, if you talk to someone and you say, well, you're on a blood pressure medicine, how do you know it's working? Well, my blood pressure came down. Well, but how do you feel on it? I feel fine. I don't feel any different, but my blood pressure's down or some people might feel less anxiety, whatever. So they say, well, that's why I'm on the blood pressure medication. Well, why are you on Saul Palmetto? Why are you on this? Well, I heard it's good for my prostate, but you should apply the same standards in the sense that every outcome that you look for in your clinic and every outcome that I look for is in data is a subjective outcome and an objective outcome. It's how you feel when you're taking something and then it's how something can be measured. And ideally, you want to hit a home run on both of these areas. So let's go back to salt palmetto. Let's say you have mild BPH and you want to try it with your doctor for three months, right? And so you take it and you feel perfectly fine, or maybe your flow is better and you just feel better. You're not getting up as much at night. So subjectively, you just feel better. That's a good sign. Well, objectively, how can you measure that? Well, like we talked about with the Casey Dow, you can do Europolmetry or they can do what's called a Qmax. They can see if your flow is better overall. And so if you're able to get a home run on both of those, then most of the doctors, I think, will say continue the product. Mm-hmm. But anytime you take a product, you should keep in mind, how do I feel, including a prescription? How do I feel when I take it? And is my doctor or healthcare professional, are they measuring also a benefit? And I want to see both of those. Mm-hmm. I don't want to feel worse. And I don't want to not be seeing, can you imagine if you took a cholesterol drug and you said, hey, I feel pretty good on it. How's your cholesterol change? And you go, I don't know. That would seem silly. Or if you said my cholesterol didn't change at all on the drug, but I feel good. We wouldn't think that's success, right? Mm -hmm. So I just wish if people took BPH supplements, they would be monitored. They would ask if they can take them with some of the regular medicines if they want to try it. They would look for quality control. They would find something that's cost effective, something that's been through studies and do the actual homework and see how they feel for three months and see if their doctor can measure in their scores or their or their flow rates if they're actually improving. And if things aren't going better after several months of this kind of experiment, it's time to move on. I'll give you one more example. The American- oh, wait, wait, wait. One, one last, no, I think we made the point, but let me, let me ask you a different question because I, I think we got to move on to prostatitis. But no. are you taking, so I've been talking down these, these multi-agent, multi- uh, mineral things and say, you know, use directed stuff. Au contraire, you're the herbal expert. Are you taking a multivitamin? And if so, which one and why? Okay. So this has been a great 12 months for multivitamins in a specific category. And this is what I'm saying. I, you, you, you can't tie me into like, a, I'm not saying you do this. I'm saying this is what happens. It's like Michigan versus Ohio state. People want me to hate Ohio state. Of course, I can't stand them one day of the year and we play them, but I admire their success rate. And I'm not going to get caught up in the fact that, oh, I hate Ohio State. I love them as an opponent. I just want to beat them all the time. I just always know there's a middle ground story. And people make these things uh, very political. They go back. The supplement people say that big pharma is out of control. The pharma people will say supplements are a wild, wild west. And everybody's fighting. And the truth is somewhere in between, right? Mm-hmm. So. When I did one of my first books going back 10 years ago, one that you read, I outlined a supplement that had been tested in the most clinical studies so far that they didn't fund, they were just government studies. 
And I got a lot of hate mail. Let me explain it. It was Centrum Silver. Mm -hmm. The reason I mentioned Centrum Silver is that was the product that went through the big studies that might have shown a benefit in a couple different areas, right? Mm -hmm. So I got all this hate mail online. It's part of the reason I don't do Instagram and all this stuff that said, you're in the pocket of Centrum Silver. I said, no. I said, what I'm trying to tell you is this is the product that's been through the most clinical trials and has shown safety. So even if you don't like Centrum Silver, and you want to take something else, at least compare the ingredients on Centrum Silver to your product to make sure they match up. Okay. So yep. in the past 12 months, Harvard with a bunch of other groups does a study called Cosmos, which is theoretically moving in toward a phase three study. They show in two different studies in that area, a cognitive benefit to healthy men and women cognitively. This has caused me... They weren't going out to, they were going out to test something else, actually a product found in dark chocolate. And it turned out the other group showed a consistent benefit in cognition in two separate arms of their study, leading to some of their most conservative people at Harvard saying, what we found here is remarkable. We need to possibly look at this further. And there's something to this, but guess what they used? They used Centrum Silver <laughs> one a day. Not because they got some big grant. That was the product that donated uh, material. And that's the product that's shown quality. I'm just saying, hold that up as your standard in terms of price, quality control, but people will bash it constantly. Look. So, so what, one a day. And what, what, are, day. What, are the, what are like the top five ingredients of Centrum Silver? Well, if you think about it, it's sort of brilliant because it comes in two. The problem with it is the pills are too large. So of course- they have minis now okay. because it's a problem swallowing these large pills as we get uh, older. So, in terms so, it's, of so it's, it's one, one, one pill a day. It's, it was one pill a day versus placebo mm -hmm. in the Cosmos trial. OK. Yep. And, and so through two separate parts of that trial, they showed a consistent benefit of cognitive resilience mm -hmm. versus the group that took. So placebo. top five ingredients are. Well, if you look at it, I look at it this way. Everybody's taking separate pills. But the multivitamins, Centrum Silver is smart because it's got plenty of B12 in there. So you get it in one pill. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you go see someone, that someone sees you in the clinic and you say you need more vitamin, more vitamin D because you're on androgen deprivation. Well, it's got a thousand IU, so it can give you 10 points. So it can take care of that, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's B2, B6, B12, vitamin D, a little bit of calcium, the theory is, is because it's providing this sort of insurance of all these things in smaller dosages, kind of like food probably, mm -hmm. that, but nobody is willing yet to say that this is level one evidence. What they're saying is, if we could have another trial, and I'm going, well, wait a second, apart from lifestyle, how else can I pre prevent cognitive decline? You know, I mean- well, apart ex from, exercise, but that's right, hard. Apart from lifestyle, apart yeah. from lifestyle. So yeah. I've got two major arms of Cosmos. I've got the Harvard people going, I got, you know, I, I wish I could read this to you and I might, oh, I did. I, oh my gosh, you can't believe how you're making my day. This is from one of the top physicians at Harvard after the second trial just published about a month ago. She said, and this is Dr. Manson, who's just a big wig in this field. I mean, she solid, objective, I, anything that she says I'm listening to. The finding, this is a quotation in all the media, and it gets no attention. The finding that a daily multivitamin improved memory in two separate cognition studies in the Cosmos randomized trial is remarkable. She wow. used the word remarkable, suggesting that multivitamin supplementation holds promise as a safe, accessible, and affordable approach to protecting cognitive health in older adults. So it has really caused me to think Maybe the only thing I should be taking apart from what I'm told to take for medicine if I need it is something that resembles a Centrum Silver, a Centrum Silver. And again, to this day, 10 years later, I have no relationship with this company. And this was a major farm, you know, a lot of pharmaceutical companies now want to sell supplements because it's big business now too. Yep. But I have no relationship with them, but I hold them as a standard. Look, let's face it, Dr. Scholes, admit it. Let's just throw out a name. Nubeca or something. I don't know. Let's say they have a big study. Nubeca does or Zytiga. 
you you know that when you talk to a patient, you don't go, oh, well, there was this drug and I just want you to go find it and just go copy the active ingredient. You <laughs> mentioned the name that was in the trial, don't you? Of course. Right. It doesn't mean you're biased. It means you're trying to send person to the product that was used in the trial. Yeah. Well, Had they I mean, failed that, that... the study, I wouldn't take it. Yeah, but that's 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 actually groundbreaking. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, isn't that close to the number one thing we aging folks are concerned about? Is our exactly. memories, exactly. our our mental abilities? Absolutely. That's I huge. know, but here, but here, but here's the funny thing. Here, I'm gonna I gotta grab this. So I've got all these fun notes because when I talk to you, I get all fired up. So I decided to take a, put put a bunch of papers together, and I wanted to see what they were recommending to preserve cognitive health and reduce the risk of dementia. And here's the list I came up with. I gotta put this in, a P, in the PCRI on a slide. Okay, here's the list I came up with. See if any of these sound familiar to preserve your cognitive health. It says, control your blood pressure. G, control your cholesterol. Maintain your blood sugar. Stay active. Uh, eat a diet that's healthy. Okay, does these sound familiar? Lose weight if necessary. Don't use tobacco products. Gee, these sound like just general heart healthy recommendations, don't they? Don't drink alcohol at all or drink responsibly. Try to get some sleep. Stay social, stay socially stimulated. Don't allow hearing loss to take you. In other words, you have to use a hearing aid if you're having hearing loss because we're seeing higher risk of dementia and mild cognitive impairment for people who don't wanna use a hearing aid when they need it. Seek help for depression. So this was in like in prevention and all these magazines and then continue to learn, continue to stimulate the brain, right? Mm -hmm. All of these are beautiful, just beautiful, absolutely and, beautiful. And so can, are we adding a multi to that list? I don't know, but I'm just mm -hmm. telling you, I do believe this and I, I'm willing to play both sides of the coin because I worked with pharma and I've worked with supplements in the past. I don't basically work hard with anybody anymore, but um, we have to admit that if there was a prescription drug that cost several pennies a day, that went through two randomized trials versus placebo and showed a cognitive benefit in healthy 60 and 70 year olds. We have to admit that we'd be talking about it a lot. And well, you'd be, be, we'd be asking, toward approval. Yeah, we'd be asking ourselves, why aren't we taking this? That'd exactly. Be, that'd be the question. All exactly. right, with that wonderful pearl of wisdom, let's talk about a Woo, really enigmatic awesome. and challenging and difficult situation, which is inflamed prostates, and I think you landed probably the number one expert in the world, Dr. Nichols, on that. Um, yes. I was absolutely blown away because I deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. I've never heard anyone articulate the, the essence of what this very diverse entity is about. I, I loved his, his uh, conclusion that every patient has to be individualized. It's not one entity. Yeah. I love that he said that the number one treatment is education wow <laughs> I mean, the, to really to diffuse the fear beautiful. because pe people are coming into obviously to my office prostate oncology with concerns about cancer and when people have symptoms i as an expert am comforted and reassured because if the psa is high and they have symptoms we know those symptoms don't come from cancer. They come from prostatitis. Now, it doesn't mean they can't have prost uh, prostate cancer at, in addition to their prostatitis, but we know at the very least they have prostatitis, and we know that prostatitis causes the PSA to rise. Yeah. So it is a potential benign explanation for why the PSA is running high. Why do I call prostatitis ben benign? Uh, obviously, it's not benign in how it can stimulate anxiety, but the real reality with prostatitis is it almost always, not always, but almost always, it doesn't progress into a serious problem. It creates low grade symptoms that are troublesome. And the biggest concern is the thought that, oh, maybe that discomfort I have is cancer. And, and the anxiety that results through the lack of education is huge. So I was, I was, I was just brilliant of him to open up and talk about how the first treatment for prostatitis, you'd think it'd be a pill or something, is actually education. You know, you can provide a unique insight from where you come from. I can provide a unique insight. People don't, it's tough to embrace this fact that for 30 years, if you went anywhere in the world, I mean anywhere, and they said, who's the number one urologist in the prostatitis? Always in the top one or two, always probably number one is Curtis Nickel. I mean, the guy that this doctor is Mr. Prostatitis, 
he was a visiting professor at our institution just a couple of years ago, all on prostatitis, days and days of prostatitis. And so you're really talking about a guru here. I mean, a yeah. real expert. And what he's basically saying, and that's why we mentioned the U point, it's this is a very complex situation. Getting the right, getting the diagnosis right, seeing to where you fit in the U point scale, uh, understanding the subjective as well as the objective benefits with treatment. And the fact that chronic non-bacterial prostatitis makes up by far and away the vast majority of the prostatitis that's out there. And many of these individuals go on for years and years misdiagnosed. So what if it's non-bacterial, that means not a bacterial infection. Yeah. What it, if I'm always asked, and I don't have a really great answer, what is it, Dr. Is Moyad? It, is, it, is it is it an is it a, just a standard inflammatory condition? Is it autoimmune? Is it auto autoimmune? Is it, so so what does autoimmune mean? So it, you know, is this part of your own body a, a, attacking itself, your own immune system attacking? The same itself? as like, like eczema, like, asthma, yeah. uh, it, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, what is it? The the bladder colitis. Yes. Right. Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel, bowel yes. disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's funny how if you get a spot here or if you if you sneeze, you know, that's autoimmune, right? Allergies are autoimmune situations. Yes. So from head to toe, we know that autoimmune reactions happen, but nobody talks about an autoimmune situation potentially in the prostate. Well, that is, right. it's very possible. It's a gland, yeah. right? There's a lot well, of it, activity. It's common. When I do ultrasounds in, the, in men in our age group, you can see the scar tissue, the calcified scar tissue in 80% of men that they've had inflammation in the gland. Maybe yeah. some of it was bacterial. Um, but it is so common. It's got to. There's got to be a component of autoimmune inflammation. So, yeah, and, and some people say some people just call it autoinflammatory. That that some kind of insult happens. It's not necessarily autoimmune. It's not necessarily sort of something in between. It's autoinflammatory, where you just have these bouts of inflammatory moments from a stimulus, and it and it continues, right? And well, so these are some of the theories. And so, so the surprised. so the second thing on his list after education. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, this sounds doesn't sound like a doctor. Was diet, so uh, <laughs> diet. Um, I know. If, now and you so, can so does that make sense to you that that autoimmune uh, problems can respond to diet? Well, I think it's really interesting that we've been renaming heart healthy diets. We've been giving them synonyms, making them sound different, but we're just basically saying adopt a heart healthy diet. So all I'm trying to say is we all come up with these amazing names of eating healthier, whole unprocessed foods. So the new the new term out there, which has data is called an anti-inflammatory index. And mm -hmm. so you're picking out foods that are associated with reducing inflammatory markers. Mm -hmm. Gee, those seem to be the same foods that we push that are mostly plant-based for the whole, for the most part, not always, mm -hmm. but they're just generally healthy, unprocessed foods, you know, whether it's legumes, whether, you know, beans, nuts, seeds, fruits, veggies, you know, the whole grains. So we just call these things different name. But what we're saying is an anti-inflammatory diet is one that makes you heart healthier. And so what he has found in other groups, I mentioned one of, one of the first papers I was a reviewer for, it was from Italy. And they found that just being physically active, not extremely active, but just being active seem to help with prostatitis symptoms. And so I think it's interesting that a number of these things, like you said, there are diet triggers. There are certain things that people eat that trigger, that trigger the problem. So what he's talking about is being aware of what you're consuming and figuring out what are those stimulants and what are those repressors. Well, and, I, I, the patients that I see, they know, they learn through that's right. trial and error. Said, oh boy, I've been really hurting. My, I've been off my diet. My symptoms are worse. Dr. Scholz, they'll predict for me. My PSA is going to be high this time, Dr. Scholz. Um, they have learned through experience. They can feel it down there in their pelvis, an abnormality that's not right. And that when they change their diet and improve their diet, the symptoms get better. Yeah. You know, you're talking about cardiovascular, and maybe we'll go uh, into more detail with uh, Dr. Goldenberg. But the um, uh, I think there's still a lack of awareness that what we call cardiovascular disease is also an inflammatory state. That's exactly and, right. And, and, you know, we think of, oh, I ate fats and they cause sludge in my blood vessels and now they're blocking up and I need to eat less fats. And it's not so much the fats, it's the uh, immune reaction against the irritation of those flat fats, kind of like pimples on the inside of your blood vessels. 
and yeah. that when you go on a better diet, you can re- improve your complexion and you can improve the lining and reduce the inflammation in your coronary arteries and uh, forestall progressive heart disease. That's exactly right. What we're learning in the body is when things go very wrong, including the lungs there's, and, and the heart, there's an obstructive component. There's a blockage, a partial blockage. It could be a lot. It could be very little. And then there's an obstructive component. And then there's an inflammatory component. And both of them contribute to a problem. So now when they're going back on cardiovascular trials, they're realizing that the people of the lowest rates of heart attacks and cardiovascular events and mortality are not only the ones that have the low cholesterol, they have the low inflammatory markers. So the two of them. So the reason this is so timely is I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you didn't hear this. This is a big piece of news. This is the stuff that makes my job the greatest job in the world. In the past few months, since the last time I talked to you, the first anti-inflammatory, pure anti-inflammatory drug for people with certain types of heart disease was FDA approved. And it's it's quietly coming out in the market. So it's the first time just an inflam- anti-inflammatory is now approved for some individuals with heart disease. And you're not even going to guess what this drug is. The drug is called colchicine. So Which colchicine- was originally thought for gout. Exactly, which is an anti-inflammatory that's used in other diseases. They used it. And now for those people who are really want to, if I really want to test um, my brain power, you're going to start seeing a company that advertises. I'm just trying to think if I know they're going to advertise Lodoco, it's called L-O-D-O-C-O. It's a 0.5 milligram colchicine for some people that qualify with their cardiologists who have cardiovascular disease. There's a subset of people, but this came from clinical trials. So now we're there's all this talk of inflammation. Man, this came to roost this year. It really did. And colchicine is from the autumn crocus. It's been around since Roman times. Mm-hmm. And now they've repositioned it to work in heart disease, which shouldn't be a shocker, right? I'm not saying people should run out and take it. I'm saying it's further proof that it's not just about blocking the artery, it's the inflammation around the artery. And you gotta believe it's the same thing in the prostate, just like it is in the lungs. If there's an inflammatory component that's bad, I'm not talking about short-term inflammatory. I'm talking about chronic. It hangs out, it doesn't go away. Mm Because sometimes inflammation gets a bad rap because when you exercise hard, it causes a short-term inflammatory reaction, which tells the body, hey, you're working out. I need to up my game in terms of my immunity, in terms of your cognition. And then the inflammation goes away right away. This is chronic. It's constantly there unless you do something about it. It's a beautiful topic. I love this. Yeah, that's a wonderful distinction between people always say, is stress good or bad? Yeah. And my, my sense is intermittent stress is necessary to grow. Constant unremitting stress can kill you. That's right. That's right. That's a, this idea that stress or a little bit of anxiety or inflammation is bad is, again, going back to the Michigan, Ohio State argument. It's all we have to either love them or hate them. There's no in between. Right. It just makes me nuts. Or you've got to be all this one political party. You can't be the other at all. It just and we do this in medicine way too much. So there's there's a middle ground here. And it's and finding out what that middle ground is important. But it was a big year for inflammation. But prostatitis. If you're having any issues, like he said, and you look up anything under Curtis Nickel, a lot of his articles, late articles are free on the internet. You, it can be transformational. Let's just briefly uh, tip our hat to him. Is he gave the longest uh, comprehensive list of <laughs> things that can treat symptoms. Now you've been yeah. educated, you're on the right diet, you're exercising, you've made sure that you don't have prostate cancer. Now you're still hurting, you have problems. There are things that symptomatically can help you. And he, he so he listed alpha blockers, salpomeno, uh, merbetric, amitriptyline, gabapentin. All of this is, is Greek to a lot of people. But it is good to know that there are s- things that can improve symptomatic. I'm not going to list the whole, he, yeah, you know, no, he finished, he right, finished right. up with cannabis. This is for some of the people that were in such desperate straits from chronic pain in their pelvis that they were on narcotics. Uh, I don't I don't see that that level of intensity, but it can get there. Remember Duke Bond, the color Doppler expert? Yeah, he he had a program before he retired. That he would inject antibiotics and steroids, cortisone into the prostate to relieve these men that were crippled by pelvic pain. Uh-huh. Uh, so uh, and that was something that Dr. Uh, 
Nichols mentioned the, that he, I guess, sometimes injects Novocaine into the prostate or has someone do it for him. So yeah. there's a lot of things. Obviously, this is a deep subject. We're, we're trying to just hit the high points here. But uh, I was uh, so, so comforted and encouraged to realize at least someone has some sense of what prostatitis is about. It's a very difficult area. So it's so, I mean, I would have liked to have been the fly on the wall at his clinic once in a while. I mean, he he's dealt with some, like he said, when he told people in Canada, he has a prostatitis clinic, the phone rang off the hook the whole first week that he had to shut it down. I mean, <laughs> it's, that's a, t- that's a tough gig. That's a tough gig for the doctor. It's t- It's so hard for these patients. Uh, because they're experiencing something very real and they're being misdiagnosed in some cases and it's frustrating. Let's talk but, Let's talk now, um, our last speaker, Larry Goldenberg, uh, who has got a more broad-based uh, approach to trying to deal with the fact that us guys aren't very good at taking care of ourselves. I think he mentioned the same thing I've mentioned, that prostate, the prostate is a portal to men's health. So this is an area where we say, that's a big enough priority. I'm going to take a chance on going to that scary, scary person called a doctor and and talk to him about intimate aspects of my life. So you get over that hump, then this is a, a, he's taken uh, that step to say, okay, we've we've got this, uh, this reluctant patient in the office finally, but his real risk is that he hasn't been checked for heart disease. He hasn't been screened for colon cancer. He hasn't had a vaccine against shingles. And, uh, and he has taken it to a new level in Canada, absolutely amazing, where he's, div- he's motivated a, a whole country to start to raise awareness. And I was so uh, impressed by their brilliance in terms of if you can get any activity, in other words, we're not going to solve all this in one day, but if you can start to recast where people start to value their health and say, there are certain things I can do that will really make a difference in my longevity and my quality of life, and they're not that onerous. Even just getting started to think that way is what yeah. I think it's a brilliant program that they've developed. And you, and you mentioned that he's got a website that just doesn't quit. He's got a website that's one of the best I've ever seen. Well, first, I, I tested him on his hockey knowledge. I wouldn't have gotten that. You wouldn't get that either. That's a Vancouver Canuck. I don't. <laughs> so uh, menshealthfoundation.ca. I call him Larry the Golden Boy Goldenberg. Here's, here's the website. So here's what I did. Here's what I did. And um, they've been talking to people at PCRI, which is kind of neat. And I just decided to to list some of the stuff on the website, just some of the topics, right? Men's health. I didn't even, I, I forgot how many topics there were, where it was anti-ejaculation, anxiety disorders, anorgasmia, BPH, blood pressure, colon cancer, delayed ejaculation, depression, epididymitis, epididymitis, sorry, ED, heart attacks, hydrocele, low testosterone, uh, mental illness, osteoporosis, painful ejaculation, pyronies, uh, prostatitis, uh, spermatocele, testicular cancer, <laughs> testicular torsion, undescended testicle. It's just, they have every possible topic you could think about. I mean, they are so far ahead of the game in men's health. So it's kind of neat. We uh, it's great. joined forces there for that moment. Yeah, his passion and his his uh, wisdom in terms of how you can put put a you know just a starting place. And this when we say the prostate is the portal of men's health, it's really just getting started. Um, yeah. Where you start to because when you look at all this as a oh I'm going to become a different person tomorrow and do everything right, that's ridiculous. This is an investment in a long term plan that even every you know large journey begins with the first step. If we if we get just started thinking and caring about some of the simple things, maybe just the minimal amount of exercise every day and doing that successfully for three months so that it becomes just a part of your life, the same as you brush your teeth and you try and go to bed at the same time every night. These certain things that can make your life so much better over the long term that you can build on that foundation little by little and slowly educate yourself. The, uh, the value of this might be adding 10 years to your life expectancy, 10 good years to your life expectancy. And the improvements in mental health are just profound, right? Yeah, and of course you feel better about yourself because you know you're responsible for this body. This is a great gift that we've all received. And there's, there's, you know, there's a certain low level constant guilt when we're not really managing it wisely. Yeah, no, well put, well put. It was, uh, 
I, d- I think what I walked away with, besides the fact that this person's ahead of his time, is what a lot of people don't know. I've known him also for about 30 years. And uh, what he's doing is he's getting older, as he's making sure he's teaching more and more of the students about men's health. And he's raising money for more of the program so they can study it. And <clears throat> he's sort of giving back in huge amounts. And uh, it's impressive. It's impressive. Yeah, I love this. You realize, you realize we've already gone an hour and 15 minutes and we said we were only going to go about... 45. <laughs> we, are, are we ready to talk some other stuff or you want to keep talking about the Goldenberg lecture? No, no. The, my only other comment um, on Dr. Goldenberg was, you know, he, he not only is addressing a problem, he's actually measuring it. They say you don't really fix anything unless you measure it. Yeah. And they, in their studies, found that if you, by certain criteria, decide which men are pursuing a healthy lifestyle and which ones are not, seven out of 10 are not. So there's an immense opportunity for improvement. And I assume that it's going to turn out to be the same in the United States as it is in Canada. Yeah, it's it's this complete and utter fascination with <clears throat> the pill that will solve the problem. Mark, we were talking about how coronary artery disease is often inflammation as well as blockage. Um, and what we haven't mentioned is, of course, that this is the number one cause of death for men over age 45. And uh, that there's a, a certain... Um, guesswork that's involved in trying to decide who really needs those cholesterol pills who needs to see a cardiologist every year and who doesn't even need to worry uh yeah. we're you know they're saying historically well look at your cholesterol look at your look at your family history look at your blood pressure and if things these things don't look good then get more serious i contend that there's no reason at all to guess about this because there's a scan um you want to talk about that a little bit yeah, I mean, I, I want to talk about, I also want to talk about some blood work that I know that people get done. But, you know, there is a scan that people kind of made fun of in the old days because more scans, more imaging, more technology, I'm being overwhelmed. And there's two types that people will read about, right? It's just called, it's both, they're both CT based. So one is a CT calcium scoring test, right? You don't need contrast. You just sit there. It takes minutes. It just, Make sure it takes a picture of your heart and, and the coronary artery supplying your heart. And it looks for any calcium buildup in or basically around the artery is what it does. So it's a quick, cheap flash of how are you doing besides your blood work? The yep. reason why it's not going to go away anytime soon is we always make it sound like the blood test that everybody's come to accept with perfection is never perfection. So we call PSA the great blood test, but we realize now it comes with its own faults and its own benefits, and that alone can't diagnose prostate cancer or tell you your risk. What we did was we accepted cholesterol as the end-all, be-all. If it's high, you got to lower it. And what you don't want to say that happens in the corner of every room is that somewhere, depending on which cardiology group you're talking to, as much as half of the first-time heart attacks and cardiovascular events are in people that have perfectly fine cholesterols. So it's not It's helpful, but it's not the end all be all predictor. What else can I do? What I always used to tell people, and I still tell them, is that whether it's prostate cancer or whether it's heart disease or whether it's risk, you're basically a puzzle. And the idea is to connect or collect as many of those pieces to the puzzle as possible. And then that creates a beautiful picture of you and what you need to do. And not one piece matters more than the other, but the pieces coming together, it was gives you the idea of your risk. So yeah, I want you to get cholesterol. Yeah, I want you to get blood pressure. Yeah, I want you to control your weight. I call these the big four overall, where I say weight, blood cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugar, right? I want you to get that. I want you to get an inflammatory marker when you see Mark Schultz. I want you to get what's called a cardiac CRP or an HSCRP. That measures low-grade inflammation in the coronary arteries. And so that's a brilliant test. And then there are these two imaging tests, the CT calcium score, which you've had, and the other one that's a little more invasive, especially for someone that's had chest pain, they're now comparing that to a regular, just getting an angiogram is is called CT angiogram. Mm -hmm. The advantage of the CT calcium score is it's cheap. It could give you a better idea of what your risk is. The advantage of the more invasive CT angiogram, which requires contrast, is it can tell you, it can see obstruction. It can see things in the artery that might be obstructing. It also sees things that are non-calcified. People don't realize that many plaques, some of the dangerous plaques out there don't have calcium and they can still cause heart attacks. 
So the CT angiogram is becoming the gold standard of finding out what's going on if you qualify. Otherwise, the CT calcium score is really sort of found a place for those intermediate risks where your doctor can't tell you whether you're high risk or low risk. They're just not sure. Mm -hmm. Some of your tests say you're pretty good. Other tests say you're not. Some part of your family history says, "Uh uh-oh, look out. Other parts of the family history, like in mine, say not so bad. Like one side of my family bad, one side good. Mm -hmm. So for intermediate risks, this has become a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so those two types of CT tests, especially the CT calcium score, is another piece of the puzzle for many people watching today that can make the difference between you being treated aggressively and further lowering your risk or you missing that important piece and suddenly there's a problem arises. Or, or you may find you have no, no calcium at all and maybe you can uh, be somewhat less concerned. Um, the thing I like about the CT calcium score, maybe 100, 150 bucks, takes yeah. five minutes yeah. and gives you more precise information than any blood test can provide instantly. And it kind of awakens people to thinking about this silent issue. You know, they, oh, my heart's fine. So I like that. What I also want to mention about the CT angiogram, which, as you point out, is a much more accurate test because they can look and see if there's any pinching off of the you know, uh, impending blockage, is, uh, is not have to do with the test. It has to do with the medical milieu that we live in. Cardiologists have made a great living doing regular angiograms where they thread that little catheter through your right. groin up into your heart and squirt the the contrast into your heart to get an idea of what the inner lining of these coronary arteries look like. And they get paid well to do that. Do they like CT angiograms, which can be done by a radiologist and basically takes food off the table for their business? Eh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say it's just not as accurate. You're right. It's probably only about 90% as accurate. Um, are there any risks with angiograms, real angiograms compared to CT angiograms? Mm, stroke. Um, they get that catheter in there, start banging around, and your and little pieces start flying up to your head. Uh, is that common? No, only about one percent. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but so so CT angiogram as a step uh, in people that are trying to really get to the bottom of what's going on to me makes a lot of sense. But the sad thing is that the cardiologists are, who are you're consulting aren't going to tell you about it. They're going to say we'll do us we'll just guess, and then if you have a bad situation, we'll take you into the OR and we'll do a regular angiogram. So I, I think we, there needs to be some awareness that our cardiology friends are sometimes not that motivated to order these tests. Yeah, I mean, they, there has to be an awareness that if you think one test is going to make or break your risk, that's where people get in trouble with in PSA, right? Mm-hmm. All right. of these, all, and you're talking, about, you're, you're talking about the number one killer of men and women, right, for the over 100 years in a row. Yep. Now, if a football team was number one for a hundred years in a row more, everybody would be obsessed with that football team. What are they doing? Why is this happening? We need to figure out all the ins and outs of this team. So you have someone that's not even been beaten. The only time it was beaten, I think since 1900 was that one year during the great influenza pandemic in the early 1900s. For one year, diseases of the heart, which the CDC called at that time, finished number two. So you've got something running basically a hundred plus year streak. It still is. It's arguably, and you and I would agree on this, the number one cause of death in, in men with localized prostate cancer. Absolutely. Not, right? Absolutely. And the, the number one cause of death is, as Lori Klotz would say in his active surveillance group is because it's just so common, not because prostate right. cancer is causing it. Right. So the obsession should be over trying to reduce your risk to zero. It mm-hmm. really should. There yes. should be obsession there. Yes. And, and if, of course, there's a spillover off. effect too. all the things that help your heart reduce your risk of Alzheimer's and re- reduce right. your risk of strokes. That's right. Reduce your risk of impotence, uh, all kinds of dreadful things that come with this vascular problem. Yeah, because we're all just vessels. We're all connected vessels from head to toe. The brain is the penis is you name it. Mm-hmm. And what people always forget is, for example, in the penis, the artery is yeah, yeah, yay, yeah, so wide, very mm-hmm. tiny in the coronaries. It's much wider right? Mm-hmm. So actually, if you start getting plaque buildup, it goes after the small arteries first. Mm-hmm. And so that's why a lot of the urologists will say, if you're seeing a young man with erectile dysfunction at an early age, you have to also make sure his cardiovascular risk is okay. And I think that's true of an older man also, mm-hmm. but everything runs through the heart essentially. So heart healthy is brain healthy, heart healthy is immune healthy, heart healthy is prostate mm-hmm. healthy. 
You know, mm -hmm. I know a doctor that coined that in the literature in 2003. Mm -hmm. I think his last name's Moyad. It's probably, mm -hmm. I, I could do 6,000 papers and I just, one paper, I said, heart healthy is prostate healthy. And I think I'm going to go to my grave with that, which is fine. It was good we'll, enough. We'll put that on your RIP. <laughs> but, but heart healthy is sexual health. Heart healthy is breast healthy. Heart healthy is just healthy for uh, in almost most situations, right? And so there should be this obsession with, do I qualify for a CT calcium score? Do I qualify for these things? I have to have a discussion. What else besides cholesterol testing? Why do I need to get a blood sugar test? And you know, I really, I don't know about you. I also have a different approach when it comes to, I, mean, I know I'm Johnny lifestyle in terms of preaching, but I think we look at medication the wrong way. I know so many people that do everything right and they still have high cholesterol mm -hmm. and they still have a high blood sugar. They've got bad genetics, right? Yep. And yet they don't want to take a pill, but they're doing everything right. I'm more concerned about the person who doesn't want to do anything from lifestyle and wants the pill to do everything. But there's plenty of other types of men and women who do everything right and their numbers are still bad, but they don't want to take a pill. Yep. And the reason why I'm having trouble with this is because if you think about in our generation, we embrace we embrace technology. We embrace the latest and greatest. If I said, Dr. Scholes, I'm going to give you a free iPhone 14. Uh, you're not going to say, I want to keep my iPhone 2. You're not going to say that, right? Or I'm going to give you the latest big screen television. You're not going to tell me that you want an RCA that you turn the channel with the knob. <laughs> Medicine is that way. Medicine's to the point where if you need a blood pressure medication, most of them are about this size that can help control your blood pressure. Most and of the very target, very targeted very targeted. And most of the cholesterol drugs now I can barely fit in my two fingers that can reduce your cholesterol by another 20 to 30 points. Yeah. It's incredible technology yeah. if you qualify and you've done everything right, yeah. but yet you still can't get the numbers down. And people mm -hmm. are too hard on themselves. There's a segment of society where they're too hard. They're like, well, wait a second, Dr. Moyet, if I move into a cave and eat nuts and berries and I basically have no life and I eat basically cardboard, I know I can get the number down. <laughs> and then they get the number down a little more and I say, how do you feel? And they go, I'm miserable. I hate this. <laughs> and then the first time, you know, when someone tries a pill or they get, they drop their cholesterol by 40 points and they've worked so hard, they go, now I get it. Now well, I am. And, not, and not only that, you know, there's a whole industry out there because there is a subgroup of people that don't tolerate statins, for example. Yes. Um, and but people don't realize that if you have a doctor who's on the cutting edge, he's going to start you on a small dose. He's going to monitor your blood very closely. He's going to listen carefully to whether you're having any side effects. And he's going to change the program if you're one of those 10% that does that those medications don't agree with you. Yeah. What's really scary about uh, statins is someone just writes you a prescription and says, good luck, have fun. That, it's, could, be, it's, that could be dangerous. It's I mean, statin intolerance is a big problem still. And the reality is we have so many statins and most of them are generic. But remember, the only people who could afford statins 20, 30 years ago were the people who had a lot of money. Now, mm -hmm. basically, most people can afford them. Most of them are generic. If one doesn't work at a certain dose, try another one. If another one doesn't work, you can try another one. Try one with a long half-life. Don't take it as often. You know, yep. there are studies of people taking Crestor, for example, just a couple times a week versus every day. And then what's happening in the cholesterol field is not nothing less than blowing my mind away. We have not only all these generic cholesterol lowering drugs, these stands, we have another category called PCSK9 inhibitors. They're injectables. Mm -hmm. And you just take it and whammo, your cholesterol goes down like anywhere from 50%. And it can help clean some arteries, arguably. This year, we saw the approval of something called bempedoic acid. Bempedoic acid is also known as nexletol. It's for people who can't tolerate a statin. And they, they drop cholesterol 20, 30 points. And in their trial of perfectly healthy people, it reduced the risk of first heart attack, stroke, it improved all cause mortality. Mm -hmm. So the game of cholesterol has completely changed, right? And then you have yeah. this cholesterol absorption, the, the old Zetia, it's now gone, mm -hmm. you know, going generic. If yep. you can't tolerate one med and they're telling you this is the only med you can take, you need to find someone else. There's right. a smorgasbord of options here just yeah. like in the blood pressure world, right? Yeah. And we're not taking advantage of them, which breaks my heart. Now, I want to introduce to you another test that's going to get a ton of attention in the next few years that people can get with their cholesterol. And they can also get, for example, if they want to do an imaging and they want to put the pieces together, right? Mm -hmm. So there was this test 
you've heard about before is called lipoprotein A. It was a variant of bad cholesterol. And the reason the test is starting to gain steam in cardiology and now has been recommended as a one-time look in your life to get it mm -hmm. is because you have to admit that family history is kind of a funny thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's very mixed. You know, which family history do you go by? Well, I had someone die at 50. I'm not sure what they died of. Are you higher risk for heart? So there are all these people who are intermediate risk, like I mentioned. And so another piece of the puzzle that people are starting to talk about in cardiology that's really bubbling up is a one-time lipoprotein A test because the value basically stays, for the most part, it's 90 to 95% genetically determined. It doesn't really move. It plays within a plus or minus. And so if you're one of those people and there, there's so many out there that you're not sure what your risk is. And suddenly this is off the charts. Mm -hmm. The cardiologist will go, whoa, this, I, we've got to do something here, I believe. This is a piece of the puzzle I'm glad I have, but I don't like. Or if you don't know your family history and this thing comes back low, this is another important piece that I just think in three to five years, the cardiologists are starting to pull it. You're going to pull it at your clinic because you're, you're cutting edge. And it's just a new thing that's happened this year that's gotten me excited. Yeah. And just the fact that we're spending this much time talking about it, of course, makes perfect sense because this yes. is the number one cause of death. And it's not only the people that are, are dying unnecessarily of preventable disease, preventable heart attacks. It's also those that are crippled. People go through heart attacks and, and lose a function of their heart and they end up with what we call congestive heart failure. Yeah. Where their hearts are, they're still alive, but their hearts aren't strong enough to get the job done and they get swollen ankles and they feel tired all the time. All this in many cases will be preventable if people will adopt a forward looking attitude towards trying to minimize these risks. So you talk diet, exercise and selective use of appropriate pharmaceuticals. You know, the, the, I, I want to ask you a to, question though. I want to ask you a question because this is the other thing that made me half wacky this year. And I think you can address this better than anyone that I talk to. And, th and I know this is going to be mostly therapy for me, but it's important for the audience. The NIH did something really amazing with HIV patients this year. They did a trial called Reprieve. And what they did in this trial is they used Laval, you used this cholesterol lowering drug. Anyway, they did it. They basically decided that they would do it against placebo and people that had HIV. Now, why HIV? Because people with HIV who take some of these medications have a higher risk for heart disease because of what some of these medications do. Yeah, they can stamp out the virus, but they also come with, ironically or paradoxically, cardiovascular risk, right? The trial was stopped. The trial was interim stopped because of 35% reduction in events. So we're going to see the publication. So this was like, this is a novel idea. And wait, wait, events, it, events is ambiguous. 35, one third lower heart attacks. Exactly. So lower rate of events. So then what happens is there's a presentation. And I'm trying to remember, it was in chemotherapy. It was with lymphoma patients. And you know, these chemotherapies better than I do. That's called the anthracycline or something. They gave chemotherapy, which they assume was going to put people at higher risk. So they gave them also, it's called the STOP CA trial. So stop STOP-CA, and they did the same thing, but they used Lipitor, same concept, right? And lo and behold, after the trial was done, they found that the group did better in terms of preventing ejection fraction or one of the markers of the heart from going awry. And now they're going, the, the, the oncologists who are working with these drugs are going, maybe we should put some of these patients on a prophylactic upfront statin. And I'm thinking, this is making me nuts. Because paradoxically, all of your prostate cancer treatments, the pills are putting men at a higher risk of cardiovascular events. Why aren't we also entertaining this idea in prostate that if you're going to go on all these antiandrogens and you're going to go on these LHRHs and all these other things, and it's going to possibly increase your risk of heart disease, depending on how you talk to you, it's not going to lower your risk. Right. Why aren't they being thought about to be putting on this same medication? Why are other people doing these trials that we should have done in prostate 25 years ago? Well, uh, along the same line, uh, it, radiation has become the most popular way to eradicate prostate cancer in the prostate. And database studies over and over show that men have higher prostate cancer cure rates when they take statins in conjunction with their radiation compared to the men that don't. I mean, it's not a small difference. We're talking about 10, 15, 20% higher cure rates. 
uh, as a result of being on these statins. So it's 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 a spillover effect across the board, Mark. It's not just uh, one thing. It's with a variety of different conditions. I just can't. I just can't. I mean, I'm you know, God bless the HIV situation and the lymphoma, and they're talking about. It. I'm thinking we have known for decades that these prostate treatment treatments are beautiful, but they come with a bad side, which is they don't lower your risk for cardiovascular events. And they either increase it or they do nothing. But for a number of people, it seemed to increase it. And you've got this pill that costs pennies. I just wonder, I know you do this in your clinic. I just wonder if this has to be a, dis this to me should be a discussion with every oncologist and urologist before you go on any of these hormone altering drugs, in my opinion. Well, everyone in my clinic, because everyone that's concerned about prostate cancer is in the prime age group for cardiovascular disease. So this is why we say prostate is the portal of men's health. Men are showing up for the first time, sometimes in a doctor's office, and we always grab that opportunity to, to check their cholesterol, get a CT coronary calcium score, and make sure that they're not a ticking time bomb of someone about to develop a, a irreversible, disastrous heart attack that we could... We could uh, reduce those risks dramatically with these different measures. We do, by the way. We have we have a mutual friend who's a doctor who is doing. It's al he has oligometastatic disease, and he's been getting a little hits of radiation. He didn't want to go on any therapy. He just wanted a little hits of radiation. You you see him to spots. You might not even know this. In the past few days, I should have called you. <laughs> He's been doing this for six years. He just went to undetectable. He went to less than 0 0.006. And he called me and he said, I also take a cholesterol drug. You know, I always, I take these things. I, my cholesterol, my heart disease risk is zero. He said, do you think that helped me get down to zero with my PSA? I said, I know one thing. It certainly reduced your risk of the number one cause of death in men and women for the last 100 plus years, which is heart disease. Everything else is gravy. And we laughed. And I thought, I got to tell Schultz this guy's number. Anyway, it just made me think of that. Sorry. <laughs> All right, let's talk about just briefly for awareness reasons that uh, incredible thought uh, for our uh, wonderful caregivers, uh, the, our spouses and significant others that um, who are troubled with frequent urinary tract infections. Uh, you and uh, Dr. Nichols talked briefly about the uh, that there may be a vaccine for that will seriously or or excuse me that there may be a vaccine that will substantially reduce the risk of recurrent urinary tract infections. Yeah, I mean, UTIs are a massive problem uh, in women and in men. And the reality is the constant throwing of antibiotics at them might make sense in some worlds, but ultimately not only are you developing resistance, you're developing chronic toxicity or issues that can be, I don't even wanna go through these because I don't wanna scare people. And so here's, a, here's an interesting thought, right? It's a bug that's causing this problem. And our immune system, maybe if it was heightened and we had better immune surveillance, we could eradicate this thing from it ever adhering uh, to it, it, adhere to the actual uh, urethra or the lining of the bladder, you name it. And so they have this sublingual and you put a couple of sprays uh, sublingually and it's moving toward being allowed to be used in many countries, but not the United States. And I'm just saying, I don't want to ruin it for people, but they need to watch the segment on UTIs because he's one of the primary investigators in the New England Journal of Medicine or all the other publication who's seeing these benefits and including his own clinic. And so you need to watch that 10 minute segment, which PCRI is going to put out called the UTI vaccine and try to take notes from it. If you're one of those caregivers or you're one of those men, well, right now it's basically for women, but eventually I think it will evolve. Yeah. And uh, for if you've had these just recurrent UTIs and, you know, it also opens up all these possibilities for pediatrics, for kids that have recurrent UTIs, people have neurological insults that have UTIs. Mm -hmm. And these are very difficult to deal with. The reason we he's excited about UTIs is because he, he also had been using supplements for UTIs in his clinic. One was called Manos and the other one was, you know, Cranberry. These were quality control products, but he's on to something here. And if you're one of those people impacted by recurrent UTIs, uh, you need to watch that video. And he's, that, and he's we were, hopeful. He's hopeful that this is going to uh, get approval in Canada at some point. I, I I believe it will. It's not like we don't have. It's not no one's cornered the market here, right? I mean, you can we throw them that all these well, things. Said are three thrown three at percent it. three percent of women have this problem. I mean, this is you're talking about millions of people. Yeah, you're talking about even higher by by 
some surveys and then and it's the recurrent of nature of it. It's like a kidney stone. You know, right. if you get one, oh man, the chance you get another are very high. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of these kidney stones are associated with, you know, UTIs and in, in certain uh, individuals. And these UTIs can be so damaging if they're allowed to just go on unchecked. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it was one of the most exciting things he's working on. And that's mm -hmm. that whole team. If it continues, it's sort of almost Nobel prize esque if they can really get this going. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's really sort of brilliant. We have to talk about this because I just finished a paper and submitted it. It's, we got a ton of views last time you and I talked on the weight loss drugs. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> and where are we? So we did this. So to, to, to catch people up and to move toward the end of the wonderful two hours that I have with Dr. Souls, who I'm going to have again in a month from now at the conference, these weight loss drugs, we talked about them a year ago and we were using words like game changer and it's exciting and we think they have potential. And um, of course, you can tell that I didn't bring really nice shoes today. Uh, these are my Crocs and you know, everybody's waiting for the other shoe to drop, you know, but we but the point is we said we were saying nice things about it. And I don't work with any of these companies. I was just seeing what I see and I was going to the meetings and going, they might have something here. Well, it's almost been a year. Tons of people saw that video between us. So people are asking for an update on the weight loss drugs. And if you're still excited about it, and then I'll tell you if I'm excited about it too. Uh, more excited than ever. I, I uh, for the first time, you know, seeing a lot of men all day long, and we have known for a long time that being overweight is a bad indicator for prostate cancer and heart disease and all kinds of things. And have I spent a lot of time throughout the last 30 years talking to men about how they can uh, lose weight? And the answer is not really, because it was a, a, a such a time consuming and uphill battle because of the difficulties of change. I know these are intelligent people that they've tried already to lose weight. They've struggled with it and they've made little or any headway. They have a big pot belly and that's just part of the reality of our human frame. It's weak. And uh, so now that is totally different. When I see someone with something hanging over their belt, I jump right in and ask them, are you aware of these new medications, Ozempic, Wegovi, and others uh, that can help lose weight? And, uh, and the answer is, I would say the most common answer is, I think I've heard something. Uh, sometimes the answer is, no, I haven't, tell me more. And then of course, there's a minority of people that are saying, yes, I've, I, I understand it's getting spectacular results. And that's my impression, is that we are seeing spectacular results. I wouldn't really go down that pathway. I don't have a lot of time to kind of just shoot the bull about, you know, how do we lose weight? But I do have time to introduce people to a game changing medicine that can really eliminate appetite and result in uh, consistently uh, substantial weight loss with relatively little uh, hassle or uh, side effects. Uh, it's not cheap. I mean, we're looking at hundreds of dollars per month, and that's a problem. Uh, but the um, uh, for the people that are overweight, they need to at least be aware that this is a new era for weight loss. It's it's uh, it's finally arrived after uh, after my 30 year career of just capitulating and realizing that don't really have enough time to get into the counseling people about weight loss. It's like counseling people about quitting smoking. Uh, yeah. The you're, you are going to have maybe a 10 percent success rate. You know, talk about tobacco. Maybe you shouldn't do it. Uh, talk about overweight. Maybe you need to be more careful. But it just has been an unfruitful use of my time. We have other higher value things that we could talk about in the past. Not now. It's it, it's emboldened me to really just get out there and talk to people about when I see people. Have, have you have you considered these new weight loss treatments? And uh, my uh, nurse practitioner is supervising uh, the administration of these medicines, probably in about twenty people, and it's very exciting. That is exciting because I. I didn't think we, I, I never thought you'd, we'd see this day. I, I, I did not I, if you follow the, this, as I try to write all the time and lecture on, if you follow the history of weight loss drugs in this country and many other places, it sort of went something like this. We can help you lose weight, but we're going to increase your risk of cardiovascular events, which is completely 
it's, it's a paradox. It makes just no sense. If you're right. going to lose weight, you're supposed to reduce your risk of cardiovascular events. Right. So these were stimulants. These caused blood pressure increases. You know, they used to sell some of the stuff over the counter. These were just hardcore stimulants that helped you lose weight, but was so taxing on your blood pressure and your heart or, rate or tobacco. Mind. Remember people stop smoking and they'd put on 20 pounds when they quit. Yeah. yeah. And this is, this is another great potential indication that people gain weight. They tend to gain 10 to 20 pounds in that first year. They, maybe this will help them. So I didn't think we'd see the day. So what do they do? They copy basically a hormone that the human body makes to say you're full, but then you just get a ton of it. You don't get a little bit of it. Yep. And what happens with this hormone, it's called a GLP-1 agonist. And you make it when food hits, when you start eating food, we release a little bit of it. But the problem is it goes to the bloodstream. And I think the half-life, I looked it up. It was unbelievable. I mean, you talk about a horrible joke. The half-life of this thing that we make is about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes if you're lucky, right? So they turn this thing into a one week long half-life. So we had we had the compounds, right? But they don't last long enough to make you feel suppressed. So that's reassuring. During Mark, so what you're saying is that this phone is just you're getting more of it. Yes, it's, it's called GLP-1 agonist. So semaglutide, which is rebelsis in a pill, Ozembic for diabetes, and now Wagovi has got the indication for weight loss. It's just higher and higher dosages of the same hormone that affects one certain agonist, one area that it slows gastric emptying. It makes you feel, it reduces cravings and it impacts the part of the brain that reduces that drive. Now, what I found so fascinating in researching these drugs is now they're getting studies, for example, for people who are used to substance abuse disorders. Because if you're affecting the same part of the, of the brain that makes you wanna reach for a drink or makes you wanna reach for a bad substance, uh, they're, they're finding in animals that it turns that off. It, it, it reduces that desire. And if wow. you talk to a lot of people, because there's a lot of doctors on these drugs too, not just patients, they'll say they've just lost their interest, which hurts my feelings a little bit. And it's also exciting. Like they just don't want that olive oil and bread anymore. They don't want that. It just doesn't seem appealing. They, in a couple of studies they looked at, it reduced cravings for salt. It reduced cravings for, you know, high fats. So it's doing its job overall, but that's a single agonist. What's going to get approved later this year is terzepatide. Terzepatide is a dual agonist. Now it takes care. There's another hormone in the gut that's also released that tells you you're full. So it combines these two of them. So we call it a dual agonist and it's already available on the market for diabetics called Mongero. And so they're, they already put in for FDA approval. We're expecting it by the end of the year for terzepatide as a dual agonist. Okay, so if you want to know before I reveal like the next hot one, I first I first always want to tell people the cons with these drugs. They're embarrassingly too high in terms of cost. I, they're an embarrassment. So access is an embarrassment with these drugs. Um, I don't like the commercials much. I think they should redo a number of these commercials. I don't find them to be um, that interesting, but maybe they have too many commercials. The conflict of interest I have found is is too much. Uh, there's 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 too much going. There's too much. There's too much interaction with some of the companies and we need to let the data sort itself out. So, okay, if you can bring down price, you can bring down conflict of interest, if you can keep following, but now it's got three-year data and the side effects have been mostly gastrointestinal short-term and they've been during dose escalation for the most part, but now you truly have drugs that are competing with bariatric surgery, right? So semaglutide or Wagovi on average from baseline is getting 15% body weight loss. So oh, just, wait, wait, wait. So let's let people know you're saying, so this competes with bariatric surgery. Some people don't know what that is. I think you should you know, paint a little picture of what bariatric surgery is. <laughs> bariatric surgery has been groundbreaking. You know, we have, we have, a, we have a decade. So been, no, 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 no. It's been life saving. Say, it's been life saving. It, it has been, it has, it has been, been life saving, but tell them what you're doing to these poor folks. Well, you're doing, you're, you're basically going in there surgically and you're rearranging things. I'm going to be nice about this. You're rearranging things. You're making the stomach smaller in some cases. So you got multiple types of surgery. 
And it either comes with a malabsorptive component where you're not absorbing things as well and or a restrictive component where you're simply cutting things and making them smaller. And it works. It forces you to feel full faster. And look, we look back on it now in Sweden, they've got 15, I just looked at their 10 to 15 year data. You're seeing lower risk of death you're seeing lower risk of certain cancers, lower risk of death from some cancers, lower risk of cardiovascular events, mm -hmm. all these potential benefits. But what people don't realize still is that depending on the data set that you look at, anywhere from 15 to 30% of patients don't get the result they want. So that can be almost up to a third. So it's not for everybody. So they, so they have the, this huge operation. I, I'm going to call it a huge operation huge in someone operation. who's who's already overweight and it's more dangerous to operate on. Yes. And they're able to show that a significant percentage of people are better off as a result, but not all people. And uh, and now we've got a medicine you said that is as good as that or better? In the first three to four years. So what happens in bariatric or weight loss surgery, the first year or two, you see profound weight loss. And if you follow people five and 10 years out, you see a gradual increase as people not only get older and their metabolism slows, but they begin to be able to work around the system, so to speak, as well as people who just don't respond as well. So bariatric surgery, weight loss surgery has been life changing and life saving for the majority of people who get it, but there is a very strong minority that have not. Now, three years in, with these weight loss drugs, you're seeing sort of a, a flat line to use a, it's probably not the best term, but you're seeing essentially they're able to maintain for three years, this anywhere from 15% with Wagovi. And will this continue? Because we know that Wagovi did a study where you came off the drug for a year and two thirds of the weight, two thirds was gained back in that first year being off the drug. So that's another con of these drugs right now is lifelong use. But I see a day where if these continue to be safe, that's an if, because we're only three, four years in, then maybe you'll have some weight loss procedures combined with the drug for effective results. So maybe it won't be as serious a procedure, maybe it'll be minimally invasive. There'll be some kind of combination of the two or longer half-life, so you don't have, this is just the beginning. Now, the big news in the past few weeks that quietly came out is first of all, I'm going, all right, you've got semaglutide with 15% average weight loss. So you're 300 pounds, you're losing 45 pounds. That's just like an average, right? Okay. And the majority of people are getting to goal or getting over 5% easily. And then you've got the new one I mentioned, the dual one, terzepatide, that's now 20%. And I'm going, okay, 20% weight loss. And remember, if you're diabetic though, the weight loss is much less. If you have insulin resistance, so the diabetes don't have, the diabetics don't have response that's as good as people without diabetes, but it's still adequate. So now along comes, <laughs> and I made this sign, rutatrutide, and I'm going, I'm not even giving it justice. R-E-T-A-T-R-U-T-I-D-E, -E, just published. It's a triple agonist. They copy three things that go on in the human body. So you got GLP-1, doesn't matter, GIP, and you got a same thing that's an agonist to a glucagon receptor. 24% on their phase two. So that's, so let's say you weigh- Once a week injection. Right, so if you weigh 200 pounds, and uh, that means that you're going to lose, on average, if you're just an average Joe, 50 pounds. I mean, and now they're saying that now this is phase two. I don't know if this will continue, but this is a triple agonist. Mm -hmm. It's got three different attack modes. This has two different attack modes. This has one different attack mode. The best news about this one is they just tried a high dose pill and they got the same result as the injection. So they're gonna go for an approval. There's so much happening here. I spent the last three weeks putting together a clinical guide for people working in prostate or urology basically. And it was the most fascinating paper I've probably written in a long time, but this hitting at 24%, as a phase two is remarkable, right? Mm -hmm. And if they can continue, now these scientists think they can adjust the drug in the next few years if it's still safe, so you won't have a GI side effect. Wow. Because so, and then, and, and what's so funny is that everybody's going after this data and they're turning out to be wrong. In the first year they said, oh, within the first three years, everything's gonna go wrong. There's gonna be more cancers. You know, and there's a warning label for an increased risk of thyroid tumors from laboratory animals. They haven't seen it so far in the trials. Look, I'm worried about some long-term side effect, but what people don't realize is this is intended for people who are running BMIs in 35, 40, 45. 
These are people that need help immediately to save their life. We're not talking about Hollywood stars that need this. That's a whole other discussion for a different day between me and you. We're talking about people that don't have time to wait. They need to get this weight off immediately. Yep. So even if the benefit's only for three years, and we don't know yet what the five-year result is, you've got to be at least excited about it, right? Overall. Oh, yeah. Well, it's always, as we talk about all these different things, it's always risk-benefit ratio. If right. people are carrying a lot of other weight, the risks are uh, heart disease, all kinds, a long list of problems. And if we can cut those risks, that justifies uh, taking a risk against a pharmaceutical that hasn't been out that long, but has been given to millions of people so far without problems. Yeah, these are devastating events, strokes, heart attacks. These are sudden cardiovascular events. You know, yeah. we call these non-support group events because People, people, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's the way to really educate. These are events that are catastrophic. They happen in a moment and people die from these events. And so the idea of, oh, let's, let's wait a couple more years and try to get it off with diet and exercise. I mean, that's also very naive for the people that have absolutely tried everything. And if you're dealing with an addiction center with processed food and food in general, this is, you're stacking the deck against so many patients that need to lose weight. So I'm glad they're getting help. So let me just tell you every month or two, I hear somebody tell me what the catch is and it turns out to be wrong. The latest catch was something called ozembic face or what they said is that you drew, you, you droop. It makes you look weird, right? Because you lose all this muscle mass. They've actually studied this and they, they studied this in weight loss surgery. They studied this with diet and exercise and they have found in weight loss surgery and diet and exercise, if you lose a large amount of weight on average, on average, 25 to 33% of that weight is muscle and about 66% is fat, it's adipose tissue. What they were implying here with these drugs where you were losing primarily muscle. Well, they just did DEXA scans on a whole bunch of patients and found out actually the vast majority of what they were losing was adipose tissue. Very little of it was muscle. And in fact, in the placebo group, in this trial, in one of the trials they looked at, they actually lost more muscle. So I don't know what they put in the placebo. So what I'm just saying is that it keeps passing these bars. And I don't know, I'm sure there's going to be something that we never anticipated that's going to be a problem. But I still think right now the biggest problem is access. And the other big problem is cost. It's an embarrassment. And but you you have to be excited about what's going on here. Now, what role do these have in cancer? You know, for all people on these drugs that you know, gain, I don't know. I mean, you're looking at this, but the reality is, is that it's, it's opening up doors. And the reason I also wrote this article is think about this in general, like just in men's health or general health, think about how just extreme weight loss might reduce your risk from incontinence, right? We see incontinence get better when people lose weight. We mm -hmm. see a reduction for some people in kidney stones. We see sexual function improve there. On, we see diabetes and go into remission. There's so many diseases that you can potentially go after with this kind of weight loss that people ask me all the time, how do you feel about these drugs? You must be with these companies. I'll never work with one of these companies. It's not the point. My job is to educate here, but I'm halfway jealous. Well, well, we're very- I mean, this very... is an incredible advance and I hope it continues, but nobody knows what the five-year data is going to look like. Nobody. Well, I think that the exciting thing is the times that we're living in where- new stuff is coming out faster than it's ever come out before. And I think finally our thinking is becoming acclimatized to, to what's been the case in the technology world now for 20 years. Yeah. That if you don't remake who and what you are every five years, the competition will just leave you behind. That's exactly You right. have to be ready to move on with the new stuff. And this is a for people in our age group, and you're not as old as I am, but this is a new phenomena for people in my age group where things changed very slowly throughout most of my lifetime. We get one new breakthrough every five or yeah. 10 years. Now we're getting one every five to 10 weeks. It's really a crazy time, a wonderful time. It creates a new challenge for us to figure out how to, how to manage all the wealth of new opportunities. Uh, with that, Mark, I want to, you maybe know something. I'm waiting for a, a medicine, a shot, a pill. I'd even willing to do a shot where I don't have to exercise anymore. Do you see anything like that on the, uh, on the horizon? I see zero chance, you know, but, but, you know, you make a joke, but I've talked to a millions of people. It seems like millions that think that day is coming. And I, I said, so. I'm, I, I'm, well, I'm telling you, it's not, there's just, there is no way, whatever you believe in creationism, evolution, evolution, both 
There's no way the human body was set up not to be active. There's no way. There's too many circuits. If you look at the history of time and research, mm -hmm. there's too many circuits from the brain down to the toes that thrive based on physical activity. Mm -hmm. It wants to be active. It wants to move. I'm not saying you should abuse it. I'm saying that it gives us these mental and physical health benefits that we are only beginning to appreciate now that I have still seen no pill do. And one of those in particular is just the building of muscle. You know, sarcopenia, sarcos flesh, penia meaning the lack of, this is a pandemic problem of as men get older and women get older, they essentially put on more adipose tissue, they lose more muscle. And so essentially they become metabolically unhealthy and they be, so they become more frail. And so nothing has come close to the stimulation of muscle tissue to build muscle tissue. We have nothing that comes, not a protein bar or a protein supplement, not that those don't help, but to answer your question, every time someone thinks we're going to replace exercise with a pill, I see a thousand more studies that says there's zero chance of that happening because you, you can't, so, you can't Mark, put all you, that in the pill. So you just completed running a half marathon. You came in second in your category. Obviously, you practice what you preach. <laughs> so yeah. what so the main problem that we 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 less motivated folks out here face is that lack of motivation or conviction, or maybe we don't have the fear of death or what motive what's your number one motivation to stay after this on a consistent basis that may spill over to help the rest of us be a little bit better at exercising? Well, that's a loaded question, but I can just tell you right offhand that PCR, you would have you would have fired me 12 years ago if I didn't exercise. My wife would have left me 12 years ago if I didn't exercise. I wouldn't be working at Michigan for almost 30 years if I didn't exercise. People think I'm kidding. It it clears out the junk in my head. It is it has saved me millions of dollars in therapy. Not that therapy is not a good thing. I'm just telling you the mental health euphoria, the optimism I feel, the spirituality, I'm in touch. Mm -hmm. I'm in touch with another being when that happens. I'm in touch with a creator or whatever you want to, whatever you want to believe in. Mm -hmm. I am closer to my wife. I'm closer to my kids. I'm more in touch with my job. I feel like I'm a better friend to you. Mm -hmm. Everything, that feeling, it's the greatest drug in the world. And when I finished the half marathon, which was so horrible because I didn't really want to do it, I probably undertrained for three days. You could have told me anything bad about the world and I was not going to believe it. I was so happy. I'm just telling you, it is, it's, it's the reason they say. You so never how, how did you, how did you get to that? Cause uh, I think to achieve what you have, you have to have a certain, a uh, certain degree of commitment. It probably yeah. didn't, it probably didn't come overnight. It probably is something that you worked your way into. How did you get started on that trajectory? I, I, nothing made me feel the way it feels. You know, they say you never regret a workout after a workout. There's a reason for that. You know, you might regret going to a workout, but they say you don't regret afterward. It's, it's those opiate, natural opiates. It's that euphoria that you feel. Mm -hmm. How did I get that way? I started, I was, I did three sports. I played college basketball. It was such an integral part of keeping me lucid and just keeping me happy. And I'm, I'm a happy guy. I like so to have fun. I like to joke, but the reason the the ninety percent or a huge part of the reason behind that is not my just my personality. It's because my activity level keeps me there. It, it keeps me jovial. It keeps me optimistic. It keeps me believing in the best. It keeps me wanting to be happy. I mean, I I did a workout right before this uh, event. I always work out before our interviews, and I've never been happier to see you in my life. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not a created, it's, it's a fact. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's what physical activity does for you. I believe you're a better doctor because of how physically active you are. I inherently believe that because I've known you. Oh, I yeah, no, no doubt about it. I, I yeah, and your patients everything. are, and your patients are better for it. There is no way a man of your age, and you're not that old, could be who you are in this world in prostate have you not, have, had you not been so nauseatingly, if that's a word, active? I mean, you're a very active person. Yeah. But what they see is they see a fit man, a healthy guy. And what they don't realize is I see behind the scenes, you're constantly on the move. You love tennis. You love to be active. I, so I have the same addiction way. drives me that drives you. Yeah. Yeah. It's not an addiction for me. It's a survival instinct. And I, uh, it started for me about 15 years ago when my, uh, partner, Dr. Steven Strum retired and I acquired his half of the practice. 
I was there at nine o'clock one evening with charts stacked to the ceiling. Maybe it was 20 years ago because we weren't on electronic charts. And uh, I said, boy, I've got to get stronger or this job is going to take me down. And I hired a trainer. And uh, fortunately, I got a, a wonderful woman who understood exactly what she was doing. And I would go over to the gym for an hour, two or three times a week. And she put me through my paces and I learned the whole lore of weight training and whatnot. Yeah. And I do. I still cling to that. Sounds like you do, too, because I know that all the things that I'm trying to do in life would start to collapse in on me if I didn't sustain that, if I didn't stay ahead of it. So it's, a, it's all for me. It's, it's not so much enjoyment. It's more of a survival instinct. It is. It's it's all of that. It, it, but there but there is an addictive component. I'd rather be addicted to that than a substance. I you know and people always said because I I traveled more than any doctor I've ever met because of all the teaching and all the countries. And people say, "What well, are you telling me that you always worked out when you traveled to Australia for a month, for example, or South Africa?" And I would always call ahead because honestly, if you saw me give a talk on the few days that I miss working out and on a day where I actually worked out, you would say. Who is this bozo? This is the worst talk I've ever heard on the days that I didn't work out. It was literally that dramatic when I got in touch with it at an early age, mm -hmm. because when I was in my 30s, my early 30s, when I got really busy with medical school and everything, and I started to back off, I just I didn't feel good about my career. I didn't feel good about my job. I didn't feel good about studying. And I just began to put two and two together that no substance does this for me. The alcohol, there was no illegal drug that could do this for me. Not that I've tried many. It's just, I, I have to get up in the morning. So tomorrow, uh, when I get up tomorrow, if I'm not feeling spry, I will get up and jump on a machine or go for a run. And then, but what's been dramatic for me, which probably is for you, is what's really changed in my midlife as I'm going to hit 60, is that I finally started to practice what I preach, not aerobically, but resistance-wise. So I invested a bunch of money into a home weightlifting gym. So I don't have to ever go to a club again. So I'm doing upper body, lower body. Yep. And I'm telling you, Mark, it is so dramatic in reducing pain from injury, bursitis, you name it. And I, I just, it's, it's incredible how just incorporating that, but I want to just, before we leave, I want to go back to the patients hmm. because what really bothers me though, is this anti- drug movement on the weight loss. Like you need to step up your game and diet. Uh, you need to do more exercise. People don't remember, people don't realize that when you exercise, it stimulates appetite. It doesn't suppress appetite where some type of exercises do it for a little bit, but, and people don't realize is that as you get older, metabolism slows. That's why your caloric requirements each decade go down anywhere from hundred to 200 calories. It's stacked against you the longer you live. So what I'm saying is to, to make patients feel guilty, like you haven't tried diet and exercise. Look, we're dealing with the most physically active generation in human history for many reasons. And part of the reason is because our jobs require us to be on things like this, the computer. Our kids are being encouraged to be physically inactive because the employment requires it. And then you're dealing with the most addictive foods and the most calorically dense foods in human history. It is a difficult game. So I, I just get tired of these, these exercise and food gurus getting on and going, they don't need this drug, just keep doing diet and exercise. And I always found it interesting that the doctors that seemed the skinniest to me in the old days that did diet and exercise were either working part-time, were retired, or had a bunch of money to hire trainers and chefs. <laughs> you can't do that. Everybody's too busy. So I, I'm, I'm glad you take this back because I think a lot of people qualify for these medications if they continue to be safe. And I wish we'd get away from the idea that diet and exercise is the only solution. But just to keep in mind, diet and exercise with these medications have worked better than just taking the medication by themselves. And even the drug companies will admit that. So what I wrote in my paper that I just submitted was, listen, these drugs aren't making diet and exercise going away. They're emphasizing them more than ever, just with a different type of flair. You just got how you look at it. And how encouraging it is for the first time, many of us have wrestled with these weight problems for 20, 30, 40 years to all of a sudden make genuine headway. I mean, yeah. that's, that's uh, the, my patients are so excited about their, their results. And I've had patients lose 50 and 60 pounds uh, over the course of uh, six to 12 months. So I'm glad we had a chance to, to yeah. bring that up. We covered so much. And thank you once again, uh, Dr. Moyad, for your, thank your, you. your just uh, all-encompassing you know, 
perspective on men's health in general and for introducing us to some of these spectacular speakers that are um, not only articulate, but top of their uh, game, full of integrity and clear thinking. And uh, we've been just so, so blessed with this. And uh, I know we are going to be doing a prostate cancer conference upcoming soon. I don't, yeah. uh, that is, uh, I guess we'll leave that to Alex to tell us the details. We'll leave that to Alex. I bet, you know, this has been, this was a tough run with the men's health conference. We had great speakers. Alex was great. Peter was great. The staff was incredible. My dog, who's going to be toward the end of this, I filmed him. It was absolutely amazing. Um, but this was a tough one because we had to put this together in a short period of time. And these are very different speakers, right? And, you know, we're, we're also going into an area that we have good knowledge, but it's so fast paced that we got to keep up with it. And I, I just thought everybody, I mean, today, again, I always love doing Q&A with you, the, the staff. This was, a, this was a great men's health conference. I'm sorry to be self-advertised, but I just, I loved it. I just loved doing it. Yeah, and the exciting thing is that this, we're on a roll. The, the, the pace roll. of new discovery is accelerating every year. And the need for people that are thinking about this the, at the top of their game to interpret what the heck's going on out there is going to become more important every year. So, so I, I hope we can continue doing this with the same level of excitement and the same uh, uh, joy that we're bringing with all these new treatments that are coming along and uh, trying to get them in perspective for, for the patients that are uh, availing themselves of this service. So thank no, you so I, much for all that you did. And it was, I you think too. I, I, thanks for, it's always toward the end. It always makes me sad that we do this at the end because that means, but this is not as sad because I'm going to see you in a month. I'll be in, I'll, I'll be in LA to see you. And then that'll be an intense conference with, with prostate cancer. And Alex is going to talk about it. So I'll see you pretty soon, my friend. And I really appreciate the time as always. All right. Thank you, Mark. Don't get mad the conference is over. There'll be another conference in about a month or month and a half. What's the big deal? We get to hang out. We don't have to work so much now. I don't have to do this moderation stuff anymore and ask questions. I get a little bit of a break. So Grazie and Daddy get to hang out. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Moyad, and thank you, Dr. Scholz. We so appreciate that information. I would also like to thank you as a viewer. We appreciate that you trust us and that you have subscribed to our YouTube channel or you've come to us to learn more about your health. It is an honor that we're able to do this with you. If you would like more information, you can visit our website, pcri.org. Again, if you would like to join our cause and donate, you could also do that there at pcri.org forward slash donate. But I'd like to say a huge thanks to Janssen, Pfizer, and my event for sponsoring this conference and allowing us to give it out for free to people all over the world. I would also like to thank Dr. Dow, Dr. Goldenberg, and Dr. Nickel. It's because of them that we were able to present these talks and give a lot of education out there to many men who need it. And again, if you need help, please visit our website, pcri.org forward slash helpline. They can talk to you about your particular case. Thank you for trusting us, allowing us to be here with you. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. And remember, you are not alone. Prostate Cancer Research Institute is an educational organization for prostate cancer patients, their caregivers, and their families. We put patients first and are an unbiased source of information and support. For over 20 years, our goal has been to meet the educational needs of prostate cancer patients at every stage of their journey. Medical technology is advancing rapidly and new treatments are becoming available. Patients have to make complex choices which have lasting implications. They face unexpected industry biases and doctors who may not be up to date on the latest research. Your donation helps men receive the latest, most up-to-date information, which empowers them to make informed decisions.
Our website, PCRI.org, is a wealth of information and resources. Our conferences and webinars are a way to get patients' questions answered by leading physicians and researchers. And we have a helpline for men to call with questions about their diagnosis, treatment choices, and side effects associated with these treatments. Each week we produce multiple videos covering concepts and every patient question that we can think of about the disease in a straightforward and easy to understand format. This was a brief overview of what we do at PCRI, and to learn more, you can visit our website. Your donation directly funds our educational programs, which give life-changing information to men during a very vulnerable time in their life, and we thank you for your consideration. You can visit PCRI.org to learn more.